good morning. All right. Good morning. Welcome to our first side event, or at least for me, of the Transforming Education Summit. Um, we are in a side event here on reimagining education through digital transformation. My name is Chris Fabian. I lead GIGA, an initiative that's a partnership between UNICEF and ITU for universal school connectivity. And unlucky for our uh, colleagues today who are speaking, I am your moderator for the day. Um, I am delighted to walk you through a rich panel, several rich panels of speakers and discussants who are going to talk about the future of digital transformation and how it can help us solve some of the most pressing questions in the learning crisis that we're facing today. I'm not going to take very long to talk, but I will give just two orders of business at the beginning. The minister has asked me, so I'm blaming him for this, uh, has given me leeway to be very informal, as I am used to being. So I will be informal, which means I'm not going to read everybody's biographies. You have an amazing group of speakers here. You can find their bios in the speaker packs, but we'll try to go quickly through it. The other thing is that we have a limited amount of time today. So I, in the spirit of the upcoming World Cup, have a yellow card. And in the spirit of the UN, I have a red card that's a blue card for speakers. So the yellow card will come up when they have about a minute left. And the blue card will come up when they're finished with time. And I will do this in the way that a good referee will. I may throw the card on the floor if it gets. But that's just to keep us moving so we can get through this whole wonderful agenda. There's no whistle. And there's uh, probably no penalties, but we'll see. With that. I'm excited to introduce Minister Ank Amgelen and his team who are going to open this event and tell us uh, a little bit about why it's so important that Mongolia is setting the context for digital transformation today. Minister, it's a pleasure to see you again after several years. Yeah, thank you, moderator. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear moderator, panelists and guests, it is my great honor to participate in this summit convened by Higher Excellency Antonio Guterres UN Secretary General, and to share Mongolian experiences to commitment on transforming education for future of you. I, once again, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all people who have worked hard and made this site event possible. Thus, our partners from UNICEF, UNESCO, UNRC, all advisors and consultants, all UN team. I deeply appreciate all of you, distinguished panelists and guests, for accepting my invitation, coming forward to share valuable experiences, as well as innovative practices, and enabling us to be engaged global discussion on digital transformation in education and learn from each other. As you know, we have been considering the devastating effects of COVID-19 on younger generation, with special attention being paid to the prospects of reaching SDG in 2030 on time. This is time to rethink how we rebuild future youths at the moment to transform education. As such fact that we are holding these policy consultations within framework of today's solution days, not coincidence. I'm also very pleased to announce that we are working on creation on Digital Transformation International Center and platform for exchange of experiences of other countries and as well as ed tech companies. During the pandemic, we have experienced how digital transformation can be beneficial for reaching all children in youth, regardless of their different needs, how essential it is to resolve issues related to digital divide, equity gaps, and children's safety in online, lack of digital skill, and how effective it is tool to recover from learning loss children experienced. It is also a most efficient way to push ahead achievement of SDG, which have been handled by COVID-19 pandemic. We need to act together, hand to hand, for enabling digital transformation and achieve inclusive, equal, and quality education outcomes. In today's event, we will share some experiences on how we enabled our children and youth to recover from pandemic caused learning loss and learn from your insights and bench uh, benchmarks. I hope we will enjoy fruitful discussion and will certainly serve as valuable contribution for advancing development of digital transformation in education. Thank you very much. Wish all the best. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, we now have opening remarks from Rob Jenkins and Sabhi Tawil from both UNICEF and UNESCO. Rob, 
Over to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, um, His Excellency and I met in Paris a couple months ago, and that's when I uh, became even more familiar with the situation in Mongolia. It's really a great pleasure to be here, seeing you again, and look forward to the continued discussion. Also, always great to be joined with uh, dear friends, colleagues, Obi and Jaime and others on the panel. I see Rick, the Vice President from Microsoft, a dear partner, our Deputy Executive Director, Fayez, from UNICEF, many others. It's great to be with just so many friends, and um, I think... Uh, what I can add to His Excellency's uh, very um, seasoned re and useful remarks is to give a sense of urgency and alarm at the situation of um, the world in learning. I think maybe some of you saw when you walked in to the building a display that said two-thirds of children at 10 years old cannot read a simple text globally. That goes up to close to 90% in the poorest countries. It's just one indicator of many that is a very alarming situation in the levels of learning in the world. We are um, at UNICEF and with other partners, and I know they'll speak to that, but we are, and, and His Excellency is, is an amazing example of completely committed to reaching, leveraging technology to reach the most marginalized children. Let's just be super clear. The advantaged children, like the children of many of ours, if we're fortunate enough, they're already connected or they will be connected. They don't really need us in this room to be discussing how they will benefit from technology. But marginalized children, children that have been further left behind during this last two years due to the pandemic, but they were already behind before. We are in a very unequal sector, education and learning, are now further behind. So the whole point of this conversation, and frankly, I think the whole point of this consortium and this movement is to let um, marginalized children benefit from the technology and the transformation that's taking place in learning right now. We believe it is the great equalizer or has the potential to be the great equalizer by being proactively engaging with the most marginalized children so that they can realize their full potential. That is no easy task. The default will be greater disparities. Let's not kid ourselves. That's the status quo will be that will grow. So let's work together, recognize the crisis we are currently in. Let's continue to work together to reach and provide opportunities of this digital transformation for the most marginalized. On Monday, what they call the Leaders Day, there will be a, an announcement of a consortium of partners that will launch a movement that will build on exactly this conversation but the, um, to indeed just realize exactly this, this vision, which is marginalized children, which are currently being left behind to benefit from the digital transformation. But thanks, uh, Your Excellency, again, you're showing the way and we greatly appreciate this partnership. Back to you, Chris. Thanks so much, Rob. Sobhi. Assistant Director General uh, for Education, uh, Stefania Giannini, she couldn't, um, uh, had an, unfortunately a commitment uh, that came up this morning. But pleased to partner with uh, Mongolia, pleased to partner with UNICEF uh, on this event and further and, 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 and with others around the room. Uh, first, because uh, with Mongolia, there's been a long engagement uh, of UNESCO um, in supporting the development of the, of the education sector master plan. Um, and a comprehensive uh, uh, a plan comprising all the, all the subsectors and, and, and a lifelong learning perspective. And pleased that we've been able to uh, contribute to that, supporting different pieces, the, the, the TVED policy review, uh, the development of the ICT uh, uh, master plan, um, the policy review from, from several uh, years back. Um, and pleased to see the commitment um, in Mongolia to innovation, to pedagogical innovation, to digital innovation, and understanding that that requires uh, a transformation of pedagogy, of the way we teach uh, and learn. Um, and we will have uh, very soon uh, the launch of the Mongolian version of the Futures of Education report, which is a, a reflection of, of that commitment. But secondly, very pleased to, um, uh, to, to, to see the strengthened partnership, I would say, between UNESCO and UNICEF in particular, 
but also the World Bank, since uh, strengthened since the outbreak of uh, uh, COVID-19, um, initially in monitoring and trying to better understand the responses to educational disruption uh, with our three organizations and later even with the OECD. Um, but also with UNICEF in particular on the TESS uh, digital action track um, and uh, with partners leading the work around the discussion paper. The first principle of that discussion paper, as, as, as uh, Rob was referring to, is this uh, principle actually from the Global Rewired uh, Declaration on Connectivity to focus on the most marginalized. Um, that work around the digital track led to the call to action, which will be presented on Monday, a set of six commitments around the dimensions of connectivity, of capacity and competencies, and finally, uh, of content, uh, platforms and content. And it's this last dimension uh, that Rob was referring to in terms of an initiative, uh, 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 a coalition, a partnership, that will be announced on Monday at the Spotlight event on digital learning, um, global gateways, um, uh, gateways to uh, public digital learning, a focus on public digital learning platforms and content as a piece that has been overlooked with uh, our efforts to address the digital divide, uh, to address uh, the, the, the skills gaps. So looking forward to continuing uh, our cooperation and strengthening um, and bringing in uh, increase, uh, uh, partners as part of this uh, initiative that will be announced on, on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sabi. Um, colleagues, as we are now already five minutes behind, I am failing at my duty in a moderator to yellow card anybody, but it begins now with the minister. Minister, we've heard uh, from all of our opening speakers, and I heard yesterday from Everest, our representative, about the great strides Mongolia is making in these three areas that Sabi mentioned, from connectivity itself to the software and learning tools uh, to, of course, the, the human infrastructure, the digital community leaders and, and the people who will be driving this change. We're, we're honored to have you present uh, the, the vision for Mongolia in the slide deck now. I'll give you a yellow card at two minutes before the end and then the blue card when we're at time. I mean, I don't have you on there. Yeah. Do, you have it, do you have opening remarks? All right. We've got a player that's coming in from the side. Jaime, if you, if you want to do, you want to do three minutes of opening remarks? We'll take it out of the minister's time. So, and then go again? I've got you on for later. Okay. So, so let me, so. I'll give, you, I'll give you your time now and then I'll take away from you later. Okay, so. okay. So we are starting over time the other way around here. So, um, so just let me, only th then emphasize a couple of points. Um, and I think Rob and I keep on now saying the same things because I mean, we've been, in, as, uh, as it was mentioned, I mean, we, uh, UNESCO, UNICEF and the, and the World Bank have been working together very closely the last, uh, the last few years. And I think that's a great example of, I mean, trying to build synergies to support the work that countries have to do. At the end of the day, all this transformation has to happen at the country level. So I, I would just emphasize two things that Rob said. One is, and, and we cannot repeat it uh, enough, is the magnitude of the problem that we have. And it's great that in this um, test event, we have not only the education specialists, that many of them are in this room, but we, are, we have more people from the broader policy community. And why that is critical, because it's, that is where I think it's absolutely essential that there is an understanding that we have an acceptable results on education. Right? So I, we don't have a problem. We have a big and deep problem. Right? The, uh, it, it is immoral at this stage that given the wealth that exists in countries and globally, that, that you have, as, as Rob was saying, 70% of children not be able, being able to read. Uh, that's literally immoral. And if they cannot read, then it's much more difficult than to say and to talk about all the other skills, right, that we worry about, right? The, the digital skills, right, the creativity, the, the uh, knowing, understanding the challenges of climate change, etc., etc. So we are failing children regarding the foundational blocks that they, uh, learning, uh, learning, uh, learning that they need. The, the building blocks are just not there. And the second point going to this, um, to this session is that, 
I just want to complete the, what, what uh, Rob was saying. Uh, technology can be a great equalizer, yes. We can reach faster to teachers, just to start to teachers, but teachers, we can reach them faster and at scale with technology, yes. We can reach children, yes, faster, and schools. Unfortunately, this pandemic has shown that at the same time that technology could be a great equalizer, as of today, is a great unequalizer. That's the role of technology today, is making things worse. Having the, and the, the terrible thing is having the potential to be the greatest instrument to make things much better and to give more opportunities to poorer, and, and to, to poorer uh, children and children that are being left behind. Let me stop there now uh, and I'll make Perfect. other remarks later. Thank thanks, you. thanks, Jaime. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about how, that, how we can tilt the, the lever a little bit towards being an equalizer rather than a disequalizer. Minister, over to you for your, the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madreto. Okay, so then please uh, allow to us to, uh, before they make my presentation and I would like to present a very short video presentation. New voyage of nomads. Mongol nomads have started a new voyage in the field of education. Greatest aspiration of young children in coming years is to have opportunities to learn and grow. In order to realize their ambition, education system should offer diverse opportunities. This year, we made a first very big step towards universal kindergarten. Electronic registration system allows parents engage with their kids' education to boost both academically and socially rather than to worry about enrollment into the kindergarten. Another big step made in school system. First, we are creating a big data on students' engagement, learning progress, educational resources and teaching methods, assessment banks, which inform real-time information about teaching and learning. Moreover, we are starting to provide an equal opportunity for all, ensuring that all children are treated fairly, irrespective of their age, ethnic origin, gender, place, living standards due to the digital learning solutions. Next big step concerns higher education. Since education has become more democratized, diversified, higher education institutions need to preserve reputation trust in certification and proof of learning. Using emerging technology, we make record keeping of degrees, diplomas and educational certificates in higher education digital and keep them under the control, which can avoid all kind of fraud and hacking, ensures security immutability. We are transforming our education system in a way that starting two years old little, all citizens have an opportunity to receive a quality education during his or her lifetime. Okay, so thank you. Now it's a very short presentation I'm going to present. Okay, so please. The book. For the screen. Okay, so the, my presentation is uh, the digital transformation, the new voyage of nomads. Okay, so now you got uh, the, the better understanding who we are, Mongols who are nomads. Okay, so then at the moment uh, uh, we have 90-90 percent of uh, literacy rate. Okay, so we have free and compulsory K-12 education and the universal kindergarten. Kindergarten and full, uh, full coverage of school connectivity. Okay, so then I would like to emphasize on this universal kindergarten initiatives, which is uh, our government has very strong political commitment and political will in order to make more investment in SED, early child development issue. Okay, so in this regard, and then the, before this academic year, we're going to implement it, this universal kindergarten initiatives, which is going to offer all the access, uh, the, the, the full access of the kids. Uh, we call this uh, kindergarten age, age uh, from age two and age five. Okay, so this, uh, before this academic year, we're going to handle all these uh, universal kindergarten initiatives. 
Okay, so then even through the COVID, and then we launched uh, the school lunch program. This school lunch program is free school lunch. Uh, the program from primary school from grade one to grade fifth. Okay, so it was big challenge, but uh, now it's been implementing this uh, school free lunch program. Next year we're going to uh, the, the expand uh, from. Uh, uh, from uh, grade six and uh, grade twelve, and then for secondary school. Okay, so the digital transformation and the, the new voyage of nomads. Okay, so what's meaning? Okay, so it means uh, we are nomad people. Okay, so then uh, uh, this is uh, how to say our this national identity is uh, being nomads. Okay, so then it's quite of this uh, that the nation has knowledge of their survival. Okay, so this is already tested in during the COVID, and then that's why, and then we are, this is more very f philosophical, more, cons cons uh, cons more deeper concepts, and then we need more time, and then maybe during the lunch, and then we will have more time on then how we uh, the define this kind of the concepts and the f philosophical shipment uh, of this uh, new voyage of nomads. Okay, so then uh, in this regard, uh, uh, we uh, we have this uh, six uh, frameworks and uh, the reimagining learning, and then this uh, uh, we this uh, we have six frameworks. The first one is public goods. Second one is school. The number three is teachers. Number four is students. Number four is curriculum, and the number six is innovative. Financing. Okay, so now is uh, uh, what's reimagining the schools. Then a school is in place where educator and curriculum and the students should meet. Okay, so then uh, in age of digital technology, kids are already learning the metaverse and online, and, but pandemic lessons taught us human interaction and physical space is more important. Okay, therefore, the future of the school is in a hybrid place. Okay, let me explain that we, during the COVID, we implemented the strategy called the 5 by 9. Is, this is actually the blended learning strategy that enables the students to study with the, with the pairs for five days in classroom and nine days in online learning. This strategy was very effective to manage the spread of the COVID among the children without interrupting their learning because it effectively accounts in incubation and infection period of the COVID. Okay, second one is uh, reimagining teachers. Okay, teachers are not traditional anymore. Teachers are coaches. Okay, so competency-based teaching should be embarrassed for 21st century development. Teaching in hybrid space is new reality now. Okay, so the in context, Mongolia implemented a number of policies, the extensive training to existing, existing teachers through the practical training, and update curriculum of teaching universities. In uh, 2020, we have done nationwide teacher assessment. Uh, okay, so then, in order to support teaching through value, uh, availability of, of public database assessment and teaching materials. Okay, so our best practice in terms of reimagining teachers, the midle.mn and national learning platform provides opportunities uh, to learn from peers. And this is the uh, main concept is we uh, did integrated uh, best lessons by best teachers uh, then this integration integrated in open platform for uh, all enables to all access to kids and the students regardless where they live where they study okay so now is next is uh, reimagining student so then current and future challenges are requires students to be lifelong self learners and self directed learners and the skilled already school and digital native and resilient. Okay, this kind of the skill we must require them in this uh, uh, in terms of the reimagining students. 
Okay, so in the current progress, what we have, okay, revision, we did a revision of national curriculum and pedagogy to implement uh, flipped uh, learning practices, and digital literacy should be mandated equally as a language literacy. And we have done the PISA assessment in 2022 to understand where we are now. Okay, so the best practice we have done is the adoption of the private sector of edtech solutions to public schools. And for instance, this surat.mn, the personalized learning made possible by introduction by artificial intelligence powered digital learning platforms. Okay, so learning loss did not happen after COVID-19. Rather, it had been before, even before COVID, we consider it a completed loss of learning. Thus, learning has to be personalized dependent upon level of children's skills, phase of learning using differentiated tasks. Okay, so now let's move to next reimagining curriculum. Okay, so curriculum needs to be updated in demand of 21st century skill and knowledge. Interdisciplinary learning is must. Uh, we did some uh, this uh, curriculum integration based on the all levels of education system. Okay, transform pedagogy to make learning more practical and effective. The revisit literacy, both language and digital literacy should be mandated equally. Okay, so then last one, let's move to innovative financing. Okay, so then focus more how to spend instead of, the, uh, instead of the what to spend in order to achieve more impact and efficiency of the limited resources. The adapt private sector edtech solutions through the partnership. Then uh, now the currently and we spending 4.5% of total GDP uh, spent on education uh, during COVID pandemic, and then we we do have no budget cutting, and uh, also this uh, the, the cost of launching Midle.mn, the national digital learning platform was less costly than single physical school building. The innovative financing methods such as performance based and pick up the finances introduced. Okay, so the, the, the uh, most important thing is, and uh, during the COVID, we worked for, for a, uh, very closely with the, the uh, private sectors. Then now we more consider PPP models, private public partnership. Okay, so best practice, and uh, at the moment we uh, working closely with the private ethic companies in, in order to introduce this uh, the best solutions for the, the digital transformation and public-private investment in digital infrastructure and content, especially uh, learning platforms development, encouraging innovative solutions to be adopted from private sectors. Okay, so last one, this call to action. The government of Mongolia is committed to increase allocation of the public funds on digital public goods in public internet infrastructure. The established category to original center for digital transformation of support of UNESCO, the digital transformation and national campaign eradicating digital divide, treat connectivity as basic human need and human right, and build digital platforms, infrastructure, and digital public goods. And uh, last one is uh, we will make very strong commitment on track for recommendations, policy recommendations and actions. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much for that comprehensive and really exciting overview of what's happening and, and what's been done so far. Um, we at GIGA are very pleased to be a partner with Mongolia on the connectivity side, and I know that our colleagues in education and elsewhere are similarly excited to see all the work that you're doing, help share it, and also learn from it at the same time. We're now going to enter the um, conversational portion of our, of our, of our panel, um, and I'm going to ask our panelists to basically change, change what they were doing a little bit. We're gonna just do one set of remarks. We don't have a lot of time left in this session. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to do a five minute maximum set of remarks. Um, I'll give you the card at, at four minutes and then I'll do one at a time. Um, so if, you, if we can do that, we all stick to time and we get over to Frank, who's gonna be moderating the second session um, within the allotted hour and allotted time. Uh, with that being said, 
uh, I think we're going first to Mr. Munk Orgil, who was the uh, former foreign minister, correct, of Mongolia, and also is in charge of putting together the whole education law package, as I understand. Um, and we, I think we really wanted to hear from you, following the minister's presentation, what sort of what excites you about this? What do you what are your expectations for Mongolia in this digital transformation, and where do you see uh, where do you see that ambition going for you and for the country? Thank you. Uh, very quick two remarks uh, before I answer your question. First, um, I'm a politician, not uh, a teacher. And uh, I, uh, like my colleagues, we all draw political uh, conclusions. And the first one is that uh, despite all the talk about the importance of education and GDP allocated and budget and everything, in real life, um, it doesn't translate into actual actions because, uh, I was just talking to my colleague um, here, very often, very often, uh, we do lack political leadership at the ministerial level. What happens is that the senior politicians who have the most weight in the parliament or in the government, they opt for more quote-unquote prestigious positions like finance, foreign affairs, defense, and at least in my country's experience, um, portfolios like uh, education, welfare, and health were left out. Uh, they were left with less, let me put it, less senior politicians. And what happens is that uh, in the political uh, struggle for finance, in the political struggle for influence, more senior politicians dominate. Luckily, this changed in my country a few years ago when uh, we have uh, the foresight to nominate Mr. Ngamgalan uh, as our education minister. He's a very senior politician, and that really helps. That really helps. That's the point I want to make, because uh, these reforms do require a lot of political will and a lot of political clout. Uh, they require a lot of political capital. Even when you have one dominant political party in the cabinet, it's still turf war. Who gets what? Who gets which priorities? It, it helps. And also, we got lucky in the sense that we have established Ministry of Digital uh, Transformation uh, about a year and a half ago. And until the very recent government shuffle, uh, we have uh, asked Mr. Minister Nkhamgalan to work concurrently as a Minister of Education and a Minister for Digital Transformation. And he made the best use of it, as you could see from his um, introduction. He literally made the entire Ministry of Digital Transformation work as a second Ministry of Education. So that's very helpful. Um, in terms of uh, what we want to get out of it is that uh, um, we want, uh, like, every parent, we want our children to be happy and healthy and uh, do uh, prosper in their lives. And uh, of course, education is the priority number one. Uh, a lot of what minister said uh, and uh, presented uh, just now is uh, what we have just started doing. We will be in a position to come back in a few years and report back to our partners what we have done and what we have failed to do and how it happened and where we failed. But I can now say for uh, sure that, uh, in my opinion, we are on the right path uh, because uh, we see that uh, it's not just about digitalization per se. Uh, in our experience, uh, what, what helped with this digital uh, leap is that uh, we have also started larger digitalization uh, campaign involving other parts of the economy, other parts of uh, government service. For example, uh, we have, uh, a few years ago, we have started a huge campaign to digitalize government registration systems, births, deaths, marriages, addresses, salaries, and so on and so forth. Without that database, database that we have developed over the last few years, uh, digital transformation in the education system wouldn't have happened because it's not enough to digitalize just the education system. It takes much more than that. And here, the last point I want to make is that uh, it takes a village to raise the children. 
to raise a child, right? And the most important part of uh, the village is, uh, in our collective opinion at the government uh, level, is uh, private sector. Private sector. Uh, uh, Microsoft is doing a tremendous job of uh, providing the digital content. Uh, Mongolian companies are doing that, international companies. But I think we also need to conceptualize uh, in a larger framework where this private uh, and public partnership connects, who is responsible for what, and how to value the private contribution. Um, just to give you an example, uh, now we are working on a complete overhaul, overhaul of our education uh, legislation. And the big question is, what do we do with the private institutions, private uh, secondary schools, uh, private uh, higher education establishments? Because on one hand, a lot of people see that as a continuation of inequality that is generated by inequality in education. On the other hand, we cannot drop them all together because they do provide an essential service to the public. So how do we reconcile that? That's another very important conceptual point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think these, the points that you raise about this, the, the need for that strong, the, the strong leadership and the connection between education and digital are very important. And we see this in many countries that are making huge leaps. Um, so th thank you for that. And, and I think we'll, we'll come back to that in the rest of this discussion. And, and I think our other panelists will also be excited to keep the same conversational flow going. Um, our second speaker is Minister of Education in Indonesia. And uh, Nadim did say at the beginning that one of the other panelists was a mentor and a visionary, mentor of his and a visionary. So I won't, I'll let him point the finger at who that might be and leave the surprise for a minute. Um, but Nadim, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and also sort of where you see uh, the, both the lessons that came out of the COVID response and also the, the possibilities for the future of digitalization. And I'll again give you the, the same cards as, uh, as we did before. Thank you. Hello, yes. Thank you so much for having me. Um, just to put you out of your misery, it's actually Jaime, who is my mentor and advisor. So thank you, Jaime, for teaching me about education. I am uh, not an academic, an expert in education, nor am I a politician. I am a tech entrepreneur. Uh, so this is one of the grandest experiments. What happens when you put a tech entrepreneur as the minister of education of the fourth largest education system of the world? <laughs> And uh, so I'm here to speak about what we believe the potential of technology will be as a great equalizer and a great enabler. First of all, I think it's important to note we have no option. In a country of 300,000 schools, of 60 million students, of 3 million teachers, there is no option but to use technology to do anything that we want to do. So we use technology to weaponize our policies, to weaponize great equalizers across the largest archipelago in Indonesia. So we did it out of necessity, not out of choice. Um, I thought I had 10 minutes, so instead, uh, if we could skip right to the last page. Since we have five minutes, I'm gonna just cut to the chase. So here's what we did. And, and in policy, sometimes what's even more important is what you don't do, okay? What we didn't do was go jump on the bandwagon of providing direct to student applications and content. We completely ignored what was happening in the private sector. We worked together with them, we partnered with a lot of the private sector, but we thought that market dynamics, a lot of that would help uh, students independently. What we did instead was we looked at what happened during the pandemic, which was devastating for learning loss. But there was only one positive thing that actually came out of the pandemic, which governments in many countries couldn't do. If I was tasked to train three million teachers how to use digital apps, technology, Google Classroom, WhatsApp, YouTube as a media for teaching, I it would probably take, what, 10, 15 years for me to be able to complete that task? Because of the pandemic, because everyone was forced to use technology, it created this opportunity in which the biggest mass adoption by teachers everywhere around the world happened. So we jumped on that bandwagon. We did not decide to compete with private sector companies. We purely built tools, 
free public goods to be used by the adults in the room, to be used by teachers, by principals, and administrators on how to digitize the entire digital education platform. So the first thing that we did, and the worst mistake that we've seen uh, in, in our ministry and in other ministry in other countries, is this use of vendors. The natural instinct to every government is to use vendors. Immediately, you go, you try to find people, you create a tender process, and you find a vendor. We found that this simply does not work. It creates simply very inconsistent quality. It creates all types of moral hazard in terms of different commercial contracts with different vendors. So what do we do? Well, I did the only thing that I know how to do. I built an entire technology company that wasn't a company, but it was purely under the ministry. So what we did, right now we have 400 product managers, software engineers, data scientists that have created a shadow organization attached to our ministry. This organization, this 400 person team, is not a vendor to the ministry. Every product manager and leader is attached as a semi-equal to the director general, some of which are behind me over here. So they are seen as a thought partner and a product designer. Each designs the product. So the ministry brief, like the head of teachers would give a brief to them and the product team will say, no, wait a minute, let me check first. Do the teachers and the surveys that we say actually validate that this is done? A whole new paradigm got created about user-centric design. This we learned in the tech sector before. So user-centric design is far less important about what the government actually wants to do versus what do the teachers need? What do the principals need? And changing that philosophy was our biggest breakthrough. So guess what we made? So can we just go back to uh, the page with all the products? So here's a, a few samples of what we made. We created an e-commerce site for all schools to go shopping. Now imagine, the school in the remotest region can now buy the same stuff at the same affordable price as a school in the biggest cities. They have access to the same books, they have access to the same toys, uh, and educational uh, items that they would need to teach. Uh, not this one, just the overall one, please. Yes. Um, so, uh, so let's go next. We'll go very, very quickly here. We created a super app for teachers, okay? Super app for teachers. Now we have one million monthly active teachers using this. How did we do this? We did not create a policy forcing them to do this. We just created a better product in which they could access the new curriculum that we designed, and adoption happened automatically. You create a better product. We didn't have to force the transition to the new curriculum. We showed it to them through this app. They downloaded, got curious, and now 140,000 schools voluntarily opted for the new curriculum. Last time, they tried to change in 2013. It took three years and massive amounts of resentment and trauma in teachers when you tried to change the curriculum. That's the power of technology. The best part about the teacher super app is the ability to learn at your own pace. They're self-learning modules. It's a MOOC. And even cooler than that, over 50,000 modules have been uploaded by the teachers themselves. This is one of the things that Jaime taught me. The best learning for teachers is peer learning and having teachers be able to brag about their own skills and the pride of that teacher somewhere in some village that another teacher in their village got their product uploaded and people commit. This is a powerful, powerful tool. So let's, there's a few other things. We have an e-commerce for schools. We have various uh, uh, personalized reports on our national assessment. It's all on the cloud, all cool stuff. But anyway, let's skip to the end. So what do we learn? I'm sorry, I could spend two days talking about all our amazing products. It's the, it's the worst job of it. But it's, this, the, it's the hardest job for a moderator when you really don't want to cut people off because it's so exciting. This blue and red car uh, thing is, is so, very effective. Well so, done. Um, but so this is amazing, and I think I think what we're hearing from I'll come back to you in one yeah. second. But I think what we're hearing is sort of some of the secrets of government that you don't often hear. So this is this is very powerful, I think, for people in the room. I mean, I'm wondering if you, will you cede one minute of your time to somebody who considers you a mentor? Okay, well, there you go. So Thanks you've got a, you've got another you got one of Jaime's minutes. Thank but you. But then the blue card's coming back with force. If that's this is right. the last page. Yeah. I, I promise. So first of all, we decided for someone in technology background, it was very hard for me to admit that the limits of technology when the pandemic hit. It was really hard to admit, okay, offline learning is so much better. This is not gonna happen. Suddenly all AI is not gonna take over and a bunch of kids are all gonna study without the use of teachers, which by the way, would solve a huge amount of problems, but it's simply not possible. 
offline learning is the most superior form of learning, so we need to make the teachers and principals just better at it. So deciding to focus on what has no commercial incentive in the private sector and providing free public goods is the first decision we make. We'll see in the future whether that's the right or wrong decision, but that's what we've decided right now, what not to do. Secondly, this will not work without hardware. We are overseeing the largest distribution of laptops, in this case Chromebooks, I believe we're now the third or fourth largest Chromebook procurer in the world, to distribute to the most remote regions of Indonesia. Connectivity is not under us, but we work together with the other ministry to make sure that happens. If you don't have the laptops and the Wi-Fi routers, this doesn't work. So please remember that, that it comes with a significant amount of budget for hardware as well. And Nadim, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take you off the field now. Okay. If that's sorry, all right. Sorry. Uh, I apologize. Three but more points. Uh, it's not on a stretcher. I'm just going to do it very kindly. <laughs> <laughs> and because we get... this, is, this is super important, though, because everyone's embarking on this product. Yeah. Everyone here is thinking about, can I just fix my existing systems and optimize? Most often, the answer is no. Rebuilding is much easier than fixing an existing system. Please remember this. This is one thing I really wanted to share with everyone. Rebuilding is sometimes much, much easier. Finally, you have to hire the best quality talent. Very often, guys that are getting paid three, four times as much as even the minister or the one downs from the minister. So if you cannot find a way of paying people market salary to find the best top talent, many of which engineers are super idealists, this will also not work as well. You cannot have that uh, user-centric approach. And that's it. Technology is not an afterthought. They're not vendors. They're an equal partner enmeshed within your organization. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really amazing, as somebody who also comes from the tech product background, to see, to see these lessons captured so clearly and so well. And I think that if you are supporting other governments, or if you're working in other governments in public service design, those eight, seven or eight lessons uh, should be a guiding star. I mean, it's, it's, it's so clear, and I think you've got an example to look through here, that. Uh, is also at scale. It's not a small. We know this. We, I'm not going to point fingers at small countries in the Baltics that have done a lot of this stuff. But it's a very different story to do this for a country of two million people and to do it for one of the largest countries in the world by population. So big, big congratulations. I also heard somebody else giving up a minute of their time to you. So you've actually had two panelists cede their time. Um, I mean, I think I'd, I'd love to hear your your responses and reactions to that. I know you have some um, some planned remarks, but I think you probably have a a rich set of learnings that, that dovetail with this. So the question I have for you is about you know, what, what sort of your take is on the digital transformation that's, that's happening now and how can it address the learning crisis. But if you can come in after on these remarks, that would be wonderful that, too. That, that's fine. But you already took 30 seconds, so I, that's on your time. I, I get to keep, I stay on the field after everybody's gone home, so that's, you know. So, uh, no, so thank you very much. And um, I, I'm glad that I don't have a presentation because going after an IDM with a sleek presentation, that will be, that will be too tough. I mean, uh, do a PowerPoint after an, an, an ed tech ex expert. So what I'll do, I think, is just rephrase some of the things that Nadim has, has said uh, at this stage. First, that what you said. I mean, technology is not a choice. Um, it's not a choice in terms of being a critical tool in order to do many of the, many of the critical public policies at scale uh, and, and relatively fast, because, if, because we're not reaching the SDG4. Right, at the rate of progress in which we are. We're very far. So the knowledge is critical and it's there. So it's also it's not a choice for, for children, right? Children, they have to be digital citizens. There is no choice on that. Second point is the, uh, the pandemic, I would put it in a different way from what Diem was saying, the pandemic is kind of a Trojan horse, right? That could allow countries to do things that they should have done in any case but that they now are forced to do faster, right? And, and, and they have to do it faster because we're in a much worse situation than what we were three years ago, right? We had a learning crisis in 2019. Now it's much, much worse in all countries. So actually, I mean, you're in, a, in the middle of a war, right? So now you need to do extraordinary things. Third point I wanted to say is that even when we're talking about technology, it's about people. Right? Technology at the end, of the, uh, at the, end of, the, of the way is about people on many fronts. It's about the people that you need to implement. And the point that you that Nadiem made uh, uh, at the end is like, you need to have the right, the right people in order to design and implement. If you don't have that, that is going to be impossible. And second, you need to implement the solutions thinking about the user, thinking about how does the teacher feel what he's going to have in his hands or in her hands. So 
people so the 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 so two 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 thoughts there one is that when we talk about technologies that we really need to to talk about the individuals and second that progress in the coming years is that balance between technology and the human factor right on one hand the pandemic has shown us that technology is about human inter i'm sorry that education is about human interaction at the same time it has told us that there's a gigantic digital divide right we need to work on both fronts so the art of the near future is that balance between human and technology now technology for what my first point has been to solve the issue of how to prepare teachers better that was the first point right many countries say okay let's get let's give a tablet to all students uh, i mean my first point of I mean, the, my first front in this war right is how to, how can we use technology in order to have teachers having the tools and i remember nadim talking to me about this idea of having this app in which you have at this marketplace like three years ago or four years ago maybe, maybe at this stage. Well, now, now that's, that, that's happening. But it's in, with that spirit of giving the, the teachers that tools for that new role that they have and giving the coaches of teachers the tools that they need in order to coach teachers. I mean, these, I mean when we talk now about teacher professional development, it's not anymore or should not be about teachers training is about should be about teachers coaching and accompanying an adult that has to learn, right? And I always say we know a lot about pedagogy, we know much less about andragogy, right? And teachers support is about andragogy, is about uh, uh, how to support the work of, um, uh, uh, of, of adults. Second point on technology, my second front on the, on the use of technology is on these management systems that will allow us to see if things are happening or not. Right? And, and to see if the processes are working on, on working and working or not. And those, and those in the same time of giving tools to, to teachers and coaches to giving tools to schools right? to, to, manage their, to manage their processes better. And my third front will be the tools regarding blended learning and individu indi individualized and adaptive learning. So those are three critical uh, uh, fronts of the use of technology. Now, why is that not happening? So we know that those are critical fronts. But we, that's what, what the minister has, has shown us that is already happening in Mongolia. It's just not happening in many countries, in many, many, many of the majority of the countries. So we're not there yet. And the question is why, right? One is because of the lack of political leadership, right? You say, well, gonna, I'm going to put all this thing in the cloud. I'm going to put the apps in there. You're not cutting any red ribbon. So it's much more difficult for, for politicians to see that, OK, is this is this progress, right? Uh, it's in the cloud. Mm. Okay, I'm not, I, I, it's, it might not be, it might not be uh, visible. Second is this issue of, and you, you, uh, Indonesia has solved it, creating many of the products, but that's difficult because many governments, I mean public systems, would not have that, that capacity. So what's happening now is that you try to buy stuff, right? But procuring these type of solutions is extremely difficult, right? Our procurement systems in our ministries of education are used to procure textbooks. And even that is very difficult, right? But then procuring, procuring cloud solutions, talk to the lawyers. I mean, uh, it's going to be very, very complicated. One way around is trying to produce some of those tools but that's going to be tough, so we, we will need to still crack that nut of having that right public partnership solutions, because not all governments will have the capacity. And my final point in terms of why the, this, the, the difficulty, this is the final one, I'm in the stretcher already, uh, is the capacity of the bureaucracy. So the former minister of Mongolia was saying, uh, I, I think you were hit, take, taking a hit on the, on the minister. Fortunately, you said later that he's a senior minister, but you have several ministers here, and you were, oh, I'm a former minister, you were saying, well, they're not really that important in the cabinet, right? Uh, but it's true. But it's true. You go to many, to many countries, and you see where are the best bureaucracies. And those best bureaucracies are not in the Ministry of Education, despite the fact that the countries are saying education is the most important thing for the growth and the future of our countries. Well, the best bureaucracies are not in the education system. And it's very difficult. And in the education system, in the, in the ministry, you don't need teachers and pedagogues only. You need people from all the disciplines. And people from all those disciplines come from different labor markets. 
and coming from different labor markets have different opportunity costs, and you, need, and you need to pay them that opportunity cost. And if you don't do that, then you cannot bring the right quality, the, the right bureaucracy, right? So that is where many of our systems are failing, right? And one, and I close with one thought. When I was talking with, with the president of Peru, before being minister, when I was at the, I was at the World Bank at the time, and he's a, he's a military man, so he was very like, okay, so, you are the World Bank, I mean, you think you know everything, so what should, what should I do, right? Um, so one thing that I said at that time, before I, I was at the bank, I said, look, the most important, it was a meeting with the Minister of Finance, and I said, the most important job that you have in your government, after the Minister of Finance, I have to say that because he was there, is the Minister of Education. If you solve that one, you solve the development and growth problem of the country. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Fantastic. Thank you. I wanted to uh, just take a moment to recognize Johanna Simorovi, um, State Secretary of the Ministry of Education of Finland, who will be speaking in the second session. Welcome to our panel. Uh, and colleagues, we are really we're way, well behind time, so I'm, I'm failing at my job and will probably never be asked to referee this particular sport again. But in the last, we have two speakers left and we're minus three minutes. Um, I think we wanted to just hear a little bit about the future. I, I think this, those three last remarks and, and how we understand the government and the bureaucracy as an important function, this is vital and it could be a, a day in itself. And these, uh, nobody better than the experts that we've just heard. So you were gonna talk a little bit about the future, about what, um, what you see as what's coming. And so I'll, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thanks, thanks Chris. And uh, yeah, it is um, an opportunity to look maybe a bit longer term. It doesn't mean that it doesn't connect to the present, but I'd like to start with what we said at the outset, that, um, that you know, the current crisis in foundational learning is the immediate concern. If, if, if we're not looking at, you know, if we're not tackling that now, um, discussions about, I mean, it's the main, it, it's the basic instruments to learn, to learn how, uh, to learn and, 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 and to build. But looking uh, further, I would say two things about uh, looking at the future of learning and technology. One, that um, uh, learning with technology, I think, will become more public than it currently is. Um, and, and, and digital, and the second point, I think, is that digital learning content uh, will be greatly uh, improved over time. On the first point, the, 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 the kind of public nature of education, um, I mean, we, saw it with, uh, we saw it with COVID and, and the educational disruption. We know that um, in, in responding to the school closures, um, the, the, the main modality of uh, delivering distance learning was uh, through digital learning. But we, all, we know it represented a lifeline for many, but we also know that many were excluded. Actually, globally, two-thirds did not have access to any type of uh, digital learning if, if, if we look at a gross uh, um, um, average. Um, we also know that it highlighted the uneven distribution to connectivity, the digital divide, exposed it, it highlighted the digital uh, skill gaps among teachers. But one aspect that is largely overlooked in that experience uh, is, the, is that in the rush to deploy uh, uh, distance digital uh, learning during the, uh, the COVID period is that it pushed education into privately controlled and commercial spaces in many instances. Um, platforms, applications, and, and, uh, and introducing uh, in, or, or normalizing uh, the idea that students and families are consumers and that teachers are service uh, providers. And it, just that creeping in of that logic. So it is surprising also that if we say in 30 years of digital transformation, there are very few countries that have robust quality public digital learning systems, even countries that are quite well advanced technologically, it, it is quite rare. And that is, and we heard it earlier this morning with, uh, with Rob uh, Jenkins from, from UNICEF, 
that is the logic behind this gateways to public digital learning, this initiative, this multi-partner initiative that we'll be launching on Monday at the Spotlight um, session on, um, on, on digital learning and transformation. And the idea is really to create a movement, support an international movement to ensure that every learner, every teacher, every family uh, can easily access, find, use high quality curriculum aligned uh, digital content to, to, to advance their learning. So it's not necessarily about advanced technologies, but it is about ensuring that a student in any grade can find world-class learning resources uh, to complement, supplement, and enrich their, their education. For families, it's about having a, a, a front door. And we saw the struggle uh, uh, during the COVID period, a front door to getting ideas of how they can support uh, the learning of their children. For teachers, and we saw the experience of Mongolia, it's giving a clear, uh, hub, uh, uh, teachers a clear hub to share resources uh, to get good quality lesson plans and other instruct instructional um, uh, resources. The second point in the last minute is to say that the future of tech learning with technology will be more public, but it will also be, um, uh, uh, the, the quality of digital learning will be greatly enhanced. Um, we often think that um, uh, digitizing education, and we congratulate ourselves that it's, um, uh, in many cases, it's like offering uh, 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 PDFs of, 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 of poorly scanned textbooks, uh, sites that are uh, not very user-friendly, uh, poorly designed. Uh, but good digital education material can really make education exciting. And we see some of that happening in other areas. Uh, I think of digital journalism. I think of, 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 of how we can approach art and architecture today, archaeology, through the digital and the experiences. Um, um, to end on that, just to say that it won't happen overnight, but I think, and this is also the sense I'm getting from the efforts in, in Mongolia, is to realize that the, the digital transformation of education implies and is an excellent opportunity for innovation pedagogically uh, in terms of teaching uh, and learning. So yes, we've heard, and I'll end on that, we heard during COVID, we must accelerate the digital transformation of education. I think the key, and we heard experiences from, from Indonesia and elsewhere, it's we need to steer the digital transformation of education uh, in the immediate, but to take us to those futures uh, that we want. Thank you, Sophie, for that comprehensive kind of look at what, we, what is coming. And I think we turn to the last panelist um, to tell us a little bit about what we might need to overcome to get there. So Rick, uh, maybe you can give us your, your sense from Microsoft in the closing four, four or five minutes um, of, of where all of this stuff we've heard about, open source and the ability to the need to develop things centrally and in, internally as, as digital public goods. How does that align with, with, sort of, with Microsoft? And in your perspective, how do we ensure that this digital transformation is reaching the most marginalized and rural populations. Thanks. Um, so my name is Rick Herman, um, the Vice President for Microsoft for Industry Solutions. Um, I actually started my own journey uh, in the technology industry focused on digital equity and digital access. And I come at, come at the problem like you very much as a, very much as a technologist. And I think it's interesting if you go back Two decades, when uh, two decades ago, and so what we were doing in transformation, right? We were shipping maybe six million units a year. It was the first wave of the idea of one to one. And what happened in the pandemic? There were Eighty million devices shipped, right? So you think about that 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 journey now that we have been on for uh, for many years. And one of the things that I will observe is the idea of the digital divide and of uh, digital transformation is a journey that never ends. It never ends because technology is always moving forward. Technology is always changing. And the idea of digital divide, it's not just a physical divide. It's also a skills divide today, right? Which is, which is, which is, critically, which is critically important. Um, I, I think over the, over the last few decades, what we've learned about getting to scale, there's always islands of, islands of excellence and pockets of excellence in terms of how, how technology is being used. 
But to get to scale requires the kind of vision for scale that Mongolia has presented, that Indonesia has, has, pre has presented. And I think of the elements and ingredients that countries and global funding organizations and private industries need to think about when you think about transformation at scale. And I think there's five pieces in that. The first part is the partnership frameworks and how important collaboration is across all of the stakeholders, across private sectors, across funding organizations, across the, the, the school systems and leaders. Um, a lot of that has to be codified in you know, agreements and investment. Uh, the second thing is really the policy instruments and the political will to do these things. The things that we have seen that have been very successful over the last number of years is having the policy instruments and that political will and the vision about what transformation ultimate, ultimately looks like. And I think a programmatic approach and a programmatic mindset, right? That, that, that national vision of what does transformation, I think to my colleague's point, it's not just about education. Education may be the lead vehicle, but it is really national transformation. It's economic development, it's digital transformation across the board, the linkages between education and healthcare and infrastructure. They all play off of one, one another. I love the fact that you talk about the platforms and about purpose built. So one of the things that we've learned in very large scale transformation initiative is this idea of purpose built and locally built and the, and the ability to actually use some of these transformation efforts also as an economic tool, economic development. You said 400, 500 data scientists, programmers. Those are the skills of the future. You're actually building the skill sets of uh, the skill sets of uh, of the future, and then lastly, the idea of platform. So, cloud, right? Hybrid cloud, you know, public cloud. It's really about platforms that scale. So when we think about scale, we think of massive scale. We think of hosting 300 million students, consuming services and using uh, using services. We think of massive scale like Minecraft, where you're teaching kids computational thinking, right? Um, and, and being able to reach and inspire the next, gen the next generation, the next generation of, of, of learners. I think throughout the pandemic, what we've learned is just how essential technology is for everybody. How are we doing on time, Chris? Yeah, 30 seconds. All right. So maybe in, maybe in 30 seconds, what does is, what is transformation look like from our perspective? Empowers leaders, teachers, and learners. Teachers at the front of all that and absolutely critical. Three decades of doing one-to-one, -one, what do we know about transformation? It hinges on the teachers. It hinges on the capacity and the ability of the teachers to transform pedagogy, right? To transform their teaching practices. Equitable access for all that want it, right? That takes a lot of innovation. Right? You know that as well as, as, well, as, well as, any, as anyone. And learning that's not limited. Learning that's not limited by physical space or time. And all that learning ultimately connecting skills to, to, to future career paths. So those are some of the things and some of the observations. I'm delighted to be here. Delighted to hear your story. Delighted to hear Indonesia's story. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rick. Yeah. Minister, thank you for allowing me to moderate this first session. Uh, audience, thank you for listening, and most of all, panelists, thank you for your really incredible perspectives and views. It's rare that we get to hear so much depth and, and technical honesty from governments in one place. Not that it's rare to hear that, but it's rare to have it all collected together, and this ability to share is really, really important. So thank you for your time this morning, and uh, thank you all for listening to me. I'm going to turn it over to the moderator for the second half of the session, Frank, who's at the other end of the table. Frank, over to you global lead for UNICEF for Digital Learning. And I'll just quickly introduce this uh, next panel. I know we're running over time. We have six speakers coming up. To very quickly introduce, as Sobi was, was, was mentioning, we are launching a, um, uh, a Gateways to Digital Learning initiative. And what's really so key 
to making digital learning a public good that's accessible and free for all is the role of partners, the role of the private sector, as we've heard, and the role also of champion countries. And we've had fantastic examples from Mongolia about transforming learning and education and schools and teachers and the grand experiment of Indonesia. Um, in this session, we'll be diving a bit deeper into this partnerships angle as well as the implementation through teachers. And it's my pleasure to introduce the, the first uh, panelist, Mr. Badark Dendev, who is advisor to the Minister of Education in Mongolia. Um, could you please tell us about the strategy that Mongolia is pursuing when it comes to digital transformation and education, and also how you engage the private sector and develop models, uh, partnership models with the private sector? And over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Excellencies. The first of all, I would like to thank the His Excellency, Honorable Minister of Indonesia, State Secretary of Finland, distinguished panelists, and all participants for this session for your interest and support. I also thank uh, UNESCO and UNICEF for assisting us setting up and running this, uh, this event. I think you, you understand from our minister's presentation that uh, our ministry is now of analyzing the strategic plan for transforming education. So this is the, we call the new journey of NAMATS. So as the uh, Indonesian minister mentioned that we also putting the, our learners at the heart of this strategy. So today, teaching and learning shaped by three different key elements, the namely pedagogy, data, and neuroscience. Interaction of these three elements defines digital transformation, mindset shift, and culture change. We need neuroscience-informed digital pedagogy, which can empower students, teachers, and enhance teaching and learning practices and strategies. I just would like to mention three issues. We need to pay special attention to fully accomplish this strategic plan. The first, next slide. First, uh, the creating basic uh, technical infrastructure. As I mentioned, the Minister of Indonesia, they put a lot of uh, investment in the financing for the establishing basic infrastructure. In the Mongolian case, we have established the basic uh, uh, structure, but we need to they invest more in order to accomplish a digital uh, transformation plan. The second issue is the professional development of teacher. That is very important. And uh, this cannot be simply solved by financing, not only financing, but it requires significant amounts of confidence, leadership, and passion. Uh, this should be guided by relevant uh, uh, frameworks, standards, guidelines, data, and incorporated into the education and training process. Uh, I am very happy to learn from rich experiences of Finland and Singapore and other partners in this area during this panel discussion. So the last and the most challenging issue is the mindset shift. That is the very challenging uh, issue. If we are able to change mental model of the individuals, there will be the exponential leap towards digital transformation. Digital transformation plan depends on creating culture of continuous learning. It requires that everyone develop digital mindset. The learning new technological skill is essential for digital transformation, but it is not enough. Digital mindset is set of attitude and behavior that enable to see how data algorithms, digital pedagogies, open up new possibilities and to chart path for successful learning trajectory. This is the ultimate challenge, depend on active involvement of everyone to de determine 
success of digital transformation. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to hand over to Ms. Johanna um, Sumuvori, who's the State Secretary to the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Finland. And Finland is, of course, known globally as a champion of education, a champion of teacher professional development in particular. So it would be great if you can tell us about um, how Finland is pursuing digital transformation of education, especially through teachers. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here be here today and I would also like to thank you the government of Mongolia and also UNICEF and UNESCO uh, for organizing this this uh, event. Um, Finland is considered as quite a te technology oriented country. I was carrying my first uh, Nokia NMT mobile phone in 1995 and it also applies to the education sector. Uh, we have a lots of uh, education technology enterprises and startups uh, as we speak and I think we continue to be known also as a country of engineers so it's my pleasure to be here even though I'm a social scientist myself um, uh, so thank you and uh, I think uh, we need to work together on this I have I, I heard excellent uh, speeches and, and approaches just now and, and digital technologies have a great potential uh, to transform uh, learning and education in, in so many ways they can improve access to education um, and, and enable new methods such, uh, such as personalization of teaching and learning with a view to improving learning outcomes. I, I heard that it was mentioned that sometimes uh, pupils are talked as customers. It was also um, something I learned when I was quite young when I entered the board, education board of Helsinki. And uh, I think we have to keep in mind that even though we are talking about technology, customers, and, and using this language, we are talking about human connections as well. And I think that was also clearly stated here. So, so we have to find a way to combine technology and human connections in a way that benefits students and pupils in the best possible way, and also teachers. So connecting schools, and also as, as the GIGA uh, initiative does, is a joint effort for governments and the private sector. And it's, uh, it will ensure that learners and schools get online. And, and uh, this also provides them access to global public goods, such as open educational resources. Access is very, very important if we talk about social justice point of view as well. And we consider it very important in, in Finland. It is important to recognize that access is not only about online connection, who gets online connection. Uh, now, um, new technologies need to be used in a pedagogically meaningful way too. And this requires competent and supported teachers uh, and a solid system of, of their continuous professional development. Teachers have been mentioned here today as well. Um, in, in Finland, uh, our primary school and, and secondary school teachers have a master's degree. It's required to have a higher, educational, higher education degree when you're a teacher. Um, and uh, also, um, we consider it, we have continuous discussions as to how to develop an education also on uh, early, early education uh, level. And teachers play a crucial role in how we adapt technology to teaching and learning. So therefore, we're talking about education, technology, and partnerships. We must recognize the key role of teachers. And in Finland, digital, digitalization is one of our focus areas in our new revised national strategy uh, on teacher education. It was actually launched recent, just recently, and it was prepared in a broad collaboration with universities, teachers, uh, trade unions, uh, and uh, also other stakeholders. So dear, dear friends and colleagues, uh, working together in broad collaboration, uh, that's the way forward also internationally. And I will provide now three very tangible examples uh, uh, from Finland. First, uh, in Finland, our national library is a uh, uh, our National Library of Open Educational Resources seeks to provide individual teachers and learners uh, the opportunities to share, use, and adapt learning materials. We hope that the, hope this library and other similar solutions in other countries will start a growing, will start growing a global movement uh, on open education, and we will see that, uh, these public goods helping improve access and learning outcomes globally. I wish to use this opportunity to thank UNESCO. Um, yeah, and UNESCO's work in this field. UNESCO's recommendation on open educational resources was an inspiration to our national work too. And I hope that it inspires uh, other countries as well. Secondly, I wish to mention UNICEF's Global Learning Innovation Hub. 
which is launching this work uh, in Helsinki. Uh, it, pro it provides an exciting opportunity to innovate and explore solutions uh, for access to uh, quality digital learning content, especially in low- and middle-income countries. This hub will also become a platform for collaborations and sharing experiences and expertise, so keep, keep this in mind if you are looking at, at Helsinki and, and, and this topic. Uh, finally, uh, a massive open online course, Elements of AI, uh, is a good example of public-private partnerships. So I don't know if you have heard about this uh, elements, elements of Artificial Intelligence course. Uh, the University of Helsinki uh, and a private software company called Reactor uh, and the Finnish government, uh, with several other partners, including the cities of Helsinki, London and Amsterdam, have worked together to provide a growing family uh, of courses on AI, which are accessible for everyone anywhere. Uh, the core course has attracted more than seven, uh, 750,000 users from 170 countries already. So we are, talking, uh, we are taking small steps towards an equi equitable digitalization through a large member of projects and initiatives some tiny and local, uh, some massive and global. But we will get uh, to our destination if we are on a joint pathway together. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk here. In the pre-summit, Finland is truly a champion uh, of innovation, a champion of open educational res uh, resources, and looking not just nationally, but also globally about how we can have an impact, and that's fantastic. Um, I move now uh, to uh, Mr. Xu Hong Wong next to me, who has been the Singapore representative uh, and co-lead of the Digital Learning Action Track throughout the Transforming Education Summit. Um, Mr. Xu Hong Wong is a champion um, throughout the summit on teachers, and it's my pleasure to ask a question about how you see the role of professional uh, development of teachers in transforming education systems, in particular in Singapore. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good morning, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Singapore is very happy to uh, take part in this uh, event uh, as co-lead of uh, Action Track 4. Uh, and I would like to make uh, two, two uh, quick remarks as a preamble and then to talk a little bit about the role. The first uh, remark I'd like to make is that uh, digital transformation of learning and teaching is almost an in inevitable development. Technology has arrived in all parts of our life and particularly in education, in the classroom and in teaching and learning. COVID-19 has shown us the potential and the imperative. The second part I'd like to make is that uh, well, digitalization of the teaching and learning is a very, very complex exercise. There are many parts to this. We've spoken about infrastructure, the hardware, the software, the platform, the learning management system. By the end of the day, all of us uh, in education knows that uh, what happens, ultimately education happens when the students interact with their teachers. That's the point when the students learn. And for that, therefore, teachers play an incredibly critical role in this transformational effort uh, in teaching and learning with respect to how we can become more digital. So to talk about the roles of teachers in transforming TNL, uh, I think uh, there are three quick points I'll to make. Firstly, the teachers must believe in that digital literacy skills is part of 21st century competencies that our students will need. And the teachers must believe that it is their role and their responsibility to help our students acquire those skills. The skills of uh, lifelong learning, the skills of independent learning through technology, the love for learning, the digital literacy skills, life skills, the data skills, and very importantly, the values that must come with the usage of uh, digital literacy and the usage of uh, digital technology because it is the values that must undergird the development of our people in the use of uh, technology. Secondly, to do that, well, ultimately, it is about pedagogy, 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 the professional book of the teachers because it is not just pushing the content to the student. It is very much about the curation of content to make sure that the content is relevant, it's appropriate, developmentally appropriate, that it is relevant for the students' learning because it is the teachers who will know what the students will require on a day-to-day -day basis, month-to-month -month basis, on the learning trajectory of the students. And it is that teachers' 
intervention, the teacher's facilitation, the teacher's mediation of the technology available, that will be the most powerful aspect of how technology can e ultimately impact and influence the, the learning of our students. And to do that, um, it is, as I said, about pedagogy, about designing the approach for learning through the digital means. It is no longer you know, about the knowledge transfer. It's just about how we use the digital tools available to our teachers to make teaching much more powerful, to make learning much more powerful, to make teaching much more engaging because the students are different in this 21st century and we need to make sure that the students understand how they can become more effective learners through technology. And to do that, my final point, and I think this is a point that uh, a lot of speakers, particularly uh, making reference to uh, Your Excellency, the Minister for Indonesia, uh, about professional development of our teachers. We have got to change teachers' belief in technology that they cannot do the same old, same old. It is a very different world that they have inherited and the students have inherited. They must change the practice, the pedagogical practice in the classroom. No longer the same old, same old traditional direct instruction, talking in front of the classroom, but a lot about how the students become really engaged in the process, in the ownership of their learning that is really, really powerful. So it is about teachers, about teachers. The technology is here to support our teachers, but the technology can never replace our teachers. So my proposition to all of us in this whole transformation effort is do invest in our teachers because teachers' PD is very, very important. And once our teachers believe in it, the teachers have the skills to do that mediation for learning through technology. I think that transformation can happen. Thank you. The tech, uh, implementation of technology, I don't think that's accurate. It should be learning-centered and user-centered, and users include not just the students and the learners, but also the teachers and the parents and the caregivers. So um, with that said, let me move uh, to the next panelist, who is uh, Ms. Marta McAllister, Head of Strategic Programs at Google Education. I'm a huge fan of the Google Read Along app, as is my youngest daughter, um, but I'd love to hear more also about uh, Google's broader work around digital transformation and also how you um, build the capacity of teachers. Thank you. to be here not just as a technologist but also as a former teacher. The last time I spent this much time in New York City, I was a sixth grade special education and math teacher just seven miles north of here at IS339. So I'm very humbled to be here both to talk about topics I feel really passionate about but also to learn from all of you. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm really excited that as a company, Google overall focuses on not just learning for school, which is what my team focuses on, but also learning for life and learning for work. I'll talk less about those since it's not my expertise, but I, I'd be remiss to not mention that we do have some of the most globally ubiquitous tools used for learning outside of schools with search and YouTube as well. Um, but on my team, particularly for Learning for School, we've made pretty significant contributions to the space, but definitely not alone. It has been in partnership with everywhere from device manufacturers, content providers, professional development trainers, uh, you name it. We've worked with a number of education system leaders Leaders, I'd be remiss to say that as well. Um, and it has been amazing how much we've been accomplished, have been able to accomplish in a relatively short period of time. Um, on the learning for school side, I wanted to start a little bit about the tech, which we've designed, and then I'll talk more about the programs, particularly on teacher capacity, which I feel very strongly about as well. Um, but our tech aims to empower teachers and student potential. It's kind of remarkable to think of the difference between how I taught my students and how I'm developing technology that allows people to teach in a very different way. Um, the feedback loop between me and my students could take days, if not weeks, to get that feedback and implementation of what we saw them learning in the classroom in one day to what we'd be able to teach them a couple of days later. And that real-time communication and reduction in feedback loop is pretty remarkable when we think about it in the, in the scan, span of time. Um, I'd also say that we've focused a lot in the early days of Google for Education product development on saving time around the instruction to save more time for what teachers are uniquely best at, which is the instruction. Um, so, so much of our product development has, has really focused on taking the tech out of teaching, frankly, uh, by using tech smartly. Um, and some of the more recent tools that my direct product team has been working on, you may have uh, heard of Practice Sets, which is one of our new AI-based tools. Um, I'm extremely excited about this because uh, when I was a teacher, I had to script 
many spreadsheets to do what this tool is now trying to do, which is quickly giving teachers insight on where students are struggling on a particular concept, how many times it may have taken that student to get that problem right, and on the student side, it's providing real-time remediation and encouragement to scale that tutoring aspect of the teacher when they can't reach them directly. Um, so that's just one of the things that I'm very excited about. You mentioned Read Along, also one of my favorite tools that, that Google produces. Also leverages AI in a really smart way to be able to actually offer early childhood literacy completely offline. Um, and AI is used not just for the shock and wow of being cool technology, but to address a core problem, which is that many students are not able to get access to that kind of technology if they don't have that connectivity in place. So using that na natural language models to be able to predict uh, what, what sentence is coming next or how to coach a person through reading something is pretty powerful. Um, and then uh, practically speaking, we also offer quite affordable devices. Um, so Indonesia mentioned, you, yes, you are one of the biggest Chromebook <laughs> deployers. I'll get into that, deployments that we have and I'll get into that in a second. Um, but we are, we're obviously committed to that because it's one thing to have access to the great tools. It's another to be able to have a device to be able to actually use that and to access the, not just the, the apps and the software, but the great content that many of the people in this room provide. Um, and I would also say that we're most importantly committed to providing these products that also meet core security and privacy standards as well. Um, and met many of the people on this uh, prior panel and current panel have talked about the importance of at scale. We felt that quite dramatically during COVID. Um, you know, um, tons of students moved and teachers moved to digital literally overnight. I remember troubleshooting in my pajamas, many um, <laughs> different time zones across the world working with leaders. And it was, it's kind of remarkable that we've seen so much happen at such a massive scale. And I, I resonated with some of the points made earlier, which is the amount of professional development and leaps in uh, access and also deployment of technology was really fast-tracked in a pretty remarkable way. Um, and we're talking about scale, uh, just to showcase a couple of examples. In Japan, for example, they, they went to one-to-one -one deployment where, you know, overnight we were able to deploy, and I, I, I'm uh, exaggerating a little bit, it wasn't exactly overnight, uh, but 12 million workspace accounts to get, you know, that digital identity into the hands of their learners and students. For Indonesia, we were able to deploy 36 million, so three times that amount uh, accounts. And not only that, but we were able to support the development of an in-country Chromebook manufacturing industry that now has deployed over 550,000 devices. Um, so it's pretty powerful what scale we've been able to you know, implement uh, our solutions at. On the program side and on the more capacity building side, we, uh, we've always provided a lot of online training and I think there was an astute point, I think it may have been from the World Bank, that it's not just about training, uh, but also this community and peer coaching aspect, which I couldn't agree with more. In fact, I think we actually learned from our teachers before we came up with this idea. I really consider them an extension of our product team. Many of our product team are former teachers, but uh, so much of the community training is core to our professional development solutions. So yes, we have an online training platform, the Teacher Center, um, but we also have Google Educator Groups, which were really grassroots-led uh, communities where they can share best practices. In fact, they've gotten so popular that they created their own global guardian group for parents during the pandemic, um, not even sanctioned or organized by Google, but they find so much value in connecting with one another that we just provide that platform for them to do so and share their best practices. Um, I'd also say that specifically during COVID, because people were going from that zero to one adoption, we launched in partnership with UNESCO uh, the Teach From Anywhere platform, which, allowed, which was specifically catered to teaching uh, teachers and school leaders how to make that digital transformation coming from nothing, in some cases, to a very pretty stark transition overnight. Um, and so we're, we're really passionate about all of that. Um, I, will, I will end just to say that, you know, on the life learn, lifelong learning side, we know how important it is to provide not just the tools for people to be successful in school, but also to be successful in life. And so there are lots of programs I'm happy to talk to folks about offline on our Grow with Google efforts with career certificates, um, as well as some of our, you know, search and YouTube efforts for learners outside of school. Um, but I'll, I'll yield it back to the other speakers. Thank you so much. Esther, I'm so excited to, you know, to, to watch and see what uh, Google will do to push the boundaries of AI. And this is another conversation, but I think AI has so much potential as well when it comes to reaching the most marginalized. But um, 
Um, the, the next uh, sp uh, panelist is Ms. Verna Labahari uh, from the EdTech Hub, the Executive Director of EdTech Hub. We've been working closely at uh, UNICEF and EdTech Hub over the last years on evidence generation and really appreciate how you've al always been championing evidence. Um, how do you think that tech supports teachers to be s the central cogs in addressing the learning crisis? And what would be some critical recommendations for policymakers um, that we should be aware of in relation to how tech can support teacher professional development and also uh, student learning? Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Frank. And good morning, everyone. Um, uh, an honor to be here today. Um, and I'm going to help you out, Frank, and I'm going to keep my points really brief um, because I recognize that we're almost at time and have one more speaker to go. So um, just definitely want to flag that uh, we are a global research partnership. So our focus is really to make sure that um, leaders across the world have the evidence that they need to make the right and the sound decisions around technology and education. We recognize that there's a lot of spend going towards ed tech, and we want to make sure that that spend is actually going towards wise causes. Um, so if there's anything the pandemic has taught us, and I think we've heard um, across the room about that vital role that the teacher, the classroom teacher plays, so uh, definitely less about the technology, but leading with the important role of the teacher. Uh, but more importantly, maintaining the momentum and the focus on the important role of the teacher um, as we move beyond the pandemic. Um, I had three recommendations, uh, but I think a lot of them have already been touched on uh, being the second to last speaker. So I'm going to um, focus on um, and underscore a few points. Uh, we, we definitely address the fact that um, you know teachers are central and nothing will replace the art of good teaching and learning um, and pedagogy being critical. The other piece that I think is um, as important is cultural and contextual fit, making sure that we provide teachers with the resources um, that they need that are relevant to their local climate, that are relevant to their local policies, that align with their local curriculum. Um, so there are lots of ed tech providers out there, but making sure there's that contextual fit um, is really critical as we move forward. The second piece I would um, underscore is, uh, and we spoke a lot about teacher professional development, absolutely important. I know that's um, you know, a lot, uh, uh, the focus of our, area, uh, of our work, but I want to go back a little bit and think about that pipeline of teachers and really thinking about pre-service um, educators and how do we make sure that our teacher prep programs also have the, the resources, the skills, and the leaders that know how to teach with technology. So digital competencies across that spectrum or that pipeline of teacher education is really, really critical. Um, okay, I'll jump to my last point, which um, um, Rob had actually um, referenced um, emphatically in his opening, which is really about focusing on equity and supporting the most marginalized um, populations, especially uh, classroom teachers and, and learners, um, and really thinking about uh, how we cater to the diverse learner needs. And I want to call that, I want to you know, call out a few populations, women and girls, refugees, those working in emergency situations, um, you know, learners and teachers with disabilities, uh, very important to make sure that we're not perpetuating inequities, especially for marginalized populations. Um, def I want to flag one data point, but well, maybe I'll have two, but um, we, you know, there was a T4 survey um, of global um, educators ac across, the, across the world, and 37% of teachers wanted governments to prioritize digital support to marginalized learners. So our educators are seeing it as well as a priority. Um, and finally, um, as a leader of an of a evidence-based um, group, uh, finally, <laughs> I, I would say that you know, it's really important that we think about how we create that evidence-driven future um, for ed tech um, and really systematically monitoring and evaluating how the, the resources that we've all uh, heard about today are actually moving the needle um, on student learning and learning outcomes. At the end of the day, that, that's what we care about, you know, t uh, kids at the center. So changing um, and improving learning outcomes are really important, um, and that's what's going to help us uh, chip away at that global learning crisis. Thank you so much. Closing in five minutes, we have two more speakers. Um, Mr. Thomas Davin, the Global Innovation Director for UNICEF. Would you like to go first, because you might have to leave in a few minutes, or you can, okay, so. 
So the next speaker is um, Lady Maya uh, Jam, who's the founder of I Am The Code. It's my pleasure to hand over to you. It's very inspiring, this global movement that you've been starting on coding and design for girls. So my question is, um, how, what, what is the role of mentors and mentoring? We've been speaking about teachers before. What is the role of mentors and mentoring in your organization in uh, reaching the most marginalized and uh, girls in particular? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm not going to take too, too long, but I just want to say my name is Lady Mariam Jam. I'm originally from Senegal. That's where I was born, uh, but I live now in the United Kingdom. So I want you to remember one thing before you leave the room today. One million women and girls coders by the year 2030. So I will come back in 2030 to show you one million women and, women and girls have taught how to code. And that's very important number, data, because... Um, you know, when I was young, I didn't have the chance to learn. I didn't go to school. So it's fascinating that I'm sitting here at the United Nations talking about transformation of education. And so the reason why mentoring is important, uh, I want to thank the, the, the United Nations and the Deputy Secretary General Office. Uh, they've been mentoring me, actually, in doing the right thing and talking about transformation rather than impact. And... Um, the reason why the mentoring is important, because right now I've got 34,000 girls globally in 75 countries. When I started in 2016, I wanted to teach them how to code. And during COVID-19, what happened is many young women and girls were left behind, just like I was when I was young in Senegal. And today, my 34,000 girls are full stack developers. They are coders. And they are in refugee camps, in favelas of Brazil, all across the world. And this is the first African-led organization called I Am The Code, teaching young women and girls all across the world how to code. And what you will remember, the second thing you will remember is I built during COVID-19 the first digital platform like Coursera that every single young girl, wherever you are in the world, from Mongolia to uh, Kas uh, Kisumu, you can learn how to code four coding languages absolutely for free, from Java, Python, Ruby, CSS, any coding language you want, you can learn for free. And the reason why the mentoring is important, Frank, is because when you hold the hand of a young girl and say to her, go, you can do it, you can dare to code, the young woman will go and learn how to code just like I am today. I'm the testimony of that when you invest into a young woman and girl, you invest in her, you give her the tools they need and free content, innovation, content, infrastructure, and connectivity, she will go and make it, and she will end up at the United Nations like me. Thank you. That really inspirational story of the movement that you're starting. Um, let me just hand over for, uh, to Mr. Thomas Davin for the concluding remarks of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. So, um, just as a disclaimer, I was coughing earlier. This is not becoming a hot spot for COVID. I'm just mildly allergic to uh, aircon, so just to reassure all of you. Um, the, the, I think the closing is being done for us because the door keeps on, on opening, and I, I, I'm going to really come back to, uh, to, the, to the basics. First, immense thanks to all of you who lended us your insights, your learnings, um, and, and also, to my mind, a sense of hope. Right? Because we are, we are here today together in a place of crisis for hundreds of millions of children. And what I heard today was many of the leaders around the table are creating hope for these children to have a chance for that equalizer to become a reality. Um, and that is so very important. Maybe another point that I um, took from, from today is is really we must become obsessed with whether those, strat those strategies that are being used, are they impacting on learning outcomes? Are we getting what we need when we talk about this human-centered design for teachers, for children? Is it working? We have to become obsessive about that question. Is this working? If not, we keep iterating and we have to change. The, the third that I would put to you is, <clears throat> how do we aggregate the learnings? We've heard so many different strategies and, and countries looking at this in a very different way. How do we enable maybe shared learnings so that a, a minister in Taiwan or in Guatemala can ask another and say what has worked so that they, can, they don't have to reinvent this. They can go faster to that arrival line. They can make decisions on what financing opportunity is there, what compact with private sector has worked, what global social goods is actually important how do we put teachers at the centers, etc.? All of these 
need to become a common knowledge for all of us so that we don't have to reinvent that wheel every day. And maybe a, a challenge to the minister and a thanks, and I'll conclude here. First, thank you, minister, for bringing us all together today in this room. Thank you for enabling us to learn together. And maybe a challenge to you is when, when Mongolia has made that decision to have that senior leader at that table, how do we get that to happen in every country of the world so that all of the ministries of education in 10 years will actually be the senior most politician in the cabinet room and will change the game for children in ways that we need to make a reality. Okay, so the moderator and panelists and guests, and thank you again. And uh, we had very successful and very productive discussion. And uh, unfortunately, due to very limited time, and then we have very few speakers. And then, uh, and then, of course, and then there is I'm very much appreciated, very impressive for this uh, very active participation from from the different uh, uh, guests from different countries. And we have lunch. Okay, so then I would like to invite you all lunch. For this, uh, our, uh, for the side event, and then please during the lunch, and then we have definitely have more time to discuss. Okay, thank you for all, and then let's uh, let's make some concrete actions together based on very strong partnership. Thank you again. Yeah.
Hello everyone. Hi. We're going to start the session on Ukraine. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and presence. We're about to start the session on Ukrainian education in crisis. Perspectives from Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. I invite the speakers to join me here to the left of me. I'm Timothy Milovanov and I will be hosting, moderating this session today. Thank you and welcome. Yeah, go ahead, join us. I think everyone. I will take them out in 30 seconds or something. So we're about to start. My name is Timothy Milovanov. I'm the president of the Kyiv School of Economics Ukraine, and I'm going to chair and moderate the session on transforming educational systems in crisis, perspectives from Ukraine. I'm going to start in, you know, in 90 seconds, I hope. So a little bit behind the time, so I'm going to uh, be short on the intro. Thank you very much for yeah, closing the door. I'm going to be short on the, the intro. The, the point of the session is, talk, is to talk about how education uh, works during the war. You know, we, do not, we want Ukraine to win, but we do not want to, uh, Ukraine to lose the human capital. And of course, during the war, the first priority is not always the education. The first priority is military, defense, weapons, security of people, saving lives. That's the first priority. Because if we don't save life, we will have no one to educate. But we at the same time have to develop education. We have to evacuate our universities and schools. We have to provide and build bomb shelters for every school. We have to bring kids to the schools. We have to change the curriculum. We have to uh, s find the way to work with teachers and university professors. These are challenges which every nation in war faces. And so today we're going to talk about it. I'm going to start with Mr. Andrei Vitrenko, who is Deputy Minister of Education and Science uh, in Ukraine and he will talk about the challenges and the solutions and the amazing resilience that Ukrainian education system demonstrates during the war. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Dear friends, thank you all of us for joining us today. I know how action packed this day and I'm truly thankful for sharing your time with us. I would like to express deep gratitude to my Polish colleague for your readiness to support us in this journey to New York, to let us outreach global community today. I also would like to thank UNESCO, one of the, our closest partners for your efforts. It would be not possible without you. This is truly unexpected support. Dear colleagues, under any other conditions, contributing within the walls 
of the United Nations, I would probably start my speech with emphasizing progress made in achieving sustainable development, sustainable development goals to strengthen the education system in Ukraine. But today is the right time and place to tell about the truth we have been living in since February 21st. Before this day, like many other nations, we were considered with the future of education. We were rethinking its every meaning. We were busy working on the creation of our digital education ecosystem and the second phase on implementation of the new Ukrainian school, the most successful reform in Ukraine. On February 23rd, we were drafting important legal documents, elaborating strategies and visions to innovation approaches in education. We have plans and goals, and even dreams. After February 21st, our plans changed. You know, I would like to show you one scene. Every Ukrainian man or woman has a new application. It calls a missile alert. And uh, last day, yesterday, we heard the missile alert in Kiev seven times per day. Seven times per day, we stop our educational process in our schools. And that is awful. Nobody deserved this. But since the 21st of February, it was no even a minute that we thought we had to stop our work. We knew that we had to ensure a continuity of education, leave no one behind, and do everything that lies in our power. It's hard to imagine how just yesterday you're taking your child to school, and the next day you see him or her doing homework in shelters while the air radars are on. No child, no parents should ever experience it. During the last seven months, we succeed in implementing several important projects to ensure continuity of education. In order to maintain functionality of education, we approached our partners to help us create digital content that will fit to the demand of our school programs. We gain support from global tech leaders like Google, to donate laptops for Ukrainian teachers, Zoom and Microsoft to provide access to free licenses. We worked with partners on the ground to build safety environments for our children. But there are many critical needs that are not covered at this moment, and I would like to take this opportunity to appeal to the global community which is here today to ask for your support. Together with school teachers, Ukrainian learning community, and partners, we identified a set of priority tasks for the nearest six months that will ensure functionality of education. The next slide. First, it's the digital devices. According to the National Education Survey carried out in May and June this year, lack of the devices was identified as the main problem for teachers and children to continue studying. It specially touches rural areas and marginalized groups. The overall need at this moment reaches 135,000 laptops for teachers and 200,000 tablets for children. Next slide, please. School buses. Absence of school buses for... At this moment, thousand shelters. In order to prepare for the new year, 
we focused on infrastructure. Our plan is to start repair schools, continue to build, to build and equip shelters to ensure safe learning environments. There is a need to start revitalization of destroyed facilities and make basic repairs of classrooms. And another priority is to conduct winterization of schools. Textbooks. It is cruel to provide students with the new textbooks whose content corresponds to the new state standards and the key reforms of the education sector of Ukraine, new Ukrainian school. Because of the military aggression of Russian Federation, the funds provided for publishing, tech, for publishing textbooks were transferred to the needs of the armed forces of Ukraine. The absence of new textbooks significantly complicates students' access to quality education and makes it impossible to ensure continuity in the implementation of the competence-based approach in the transition from primary to basic secondary education. And I would like to uh, tell you one thing. In temporary occupied territory of uh, Kherson region, of Zaporizhzhia region, of Donetsk region, in Mariupol, Russian soldiers burned all our books. They burned books in Ukrainian language, they burned books about Ukrainian history, they would like to erase all Ukrainians from the map of the world. Alone and losers remains a significant problem. In order to address it, we are going to launch a national digital diagnostic tool to estimate learning gaps in core subjects and introduce proper education catch-up programs. These programs will be related to catch-up and tutoring activities that are well tailored and focused on the needs of the most vulnerable and excluded children. We are also seek support in provision of psychological care and social and emotional learning for children. At this moment, there are not enough experts on the ground. There are children with different levels of trauma experience that need different types of care intensity. In order to better adapt to a new environment, it is critical to create an inclusive envi environment for everyone. For those countries which are hosting Ukrainian children, at this moment to give them the opportunity to keep learning Ukrainian language, Ukrainian literature and history to make sure they maintain close connection with Ukraine and will be able to reintegrate themselves once the war is over. Dear friends, from our end, we are ready to help on the ground. We are ready to support the governments in actions they take to help our children and teachers as much as it lies in our power. Educational Front in Ukraine is as motivated as never before. I would like to rephrase a statement made a few decades ago and say that the future and destiny of Ukraine is now being shaped in her classrooms. The future of these classrooms in its turn is now being shaped by us. We appeal to you to help us to shape the future of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to proceed with the speakers, and then in the end we'll have Q&A, OK? Um, so it's my pleasure. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's my pleasure to, to give the floor to Ms. Arlovska, um, your prime Minister's hype representative for government technology in Poland. And Poland has been a true friend of Ukraine in all possible ways. And uh, it's hard to imagine for us Ukrainians a better friend than Poland. Uh, or, you know, we have a lot of friends and you are all the best friends of Ukraine. But so is Poland. And uh, we thank you for your support during this extremely challenging times for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, His Excellency, uh, Deputy Minister Andrei, my friend, <laughs> and uh, all of you. Uh, so, for us, the word, key word is solidarity. Okay, solidarity on the streets when we are smiling to each other, when we can smile to each other and we have things that make us smile, of course. Uh, the solidarity between public sector and private se sector. And the, the last but not least, the solidarity between nations.
On the onset of the war in Ukraine, this February 24th, everybody in Poland remember this uh, date very, very well. Uh, and on the onset of that, from that third point of uh, time, m more than 6.4 million of Ukrainians crossed the border with Poland. What is this number? This number is 20% of the population of Poland. So from uh, this time, from the day one, we know that we need to do everything to make sure that uh, our Ukrainian friends feel uh, in, at, in Poland like home. And uh, you can see that uh, you probably cannot see the, uh, the pictures of uh, refugee camps in Poland because there is a none, not a single one. All of the people are uh, welcomed in our houses. Uh, Polish people, uh, we uh, we are uh, open. We were open from the very beginning. The same thing with schools. Our Polish schools no there is no special schools for refugees. The Ukrainian children are at Polish schools, and from the very beginning they were able to enter Polish schools. And uh, this, uh, this thing is very important because uh, when you see the statistics, most of the people crossing the border are ladies with children. So, and those ladies, of course, we share the same rights with uh, Ukrainian friends as Polish citizens have. So, for, uh, they can take up job. They can have, uh, they are have access, uh, total, they have free access, free access to healthcare, to social care, uh, anything the uh, citizens need. And that is why it, is so, it was so crucial to have uh, open schools for uh, our Ukrainian children in order to make sure that ladies can, or, and other people who can, from Ukraine can take up a job straight away. And uh, what is uh, very important, uh, it's uh, like uh, with uh, international organizations, Andrei mentioned, uh, they are not only supporting Ukrainian in Ukraine, but also in Poland. And I am very uh, great thanks to all those international organizations, NGOs, and uh, big tech companies, either from Poland or from around the world, because, uh, and American companies, of course. Uh, they, we started uh, delivering our laptops together with uh, these companies uh, to uh, students that were in need to continue remote learning because it was uh, the uh, ask from a minister uh, of education, Minister Scarlett, from the very beginning to our Polish minister, okay, support us in efforts to continue remote learning because in order, you know, not to stop uh, the, the, the phases of education for any uh, students. So uh, that was our goal too, of course. And, uh, but at the same time, anyone who wanted to join Polish education system, of course, like I said, it was, uh, it was possible and it is still possible. We are talking about 200,000 uh, students in Polish schools, uh, Ukrainian students. And uh, what we are doing uh, more, of course, we are also supporting remote uh, learning in, uh, uh, I, told, I said about laptops, but it is also about uh, digital tools. For example, with UNICEF, we have uh, delivered materials from Learning Passport, delivered on our Polish educational platform, and any, they are held in English or and, uh, in Ukraine, Ukrainian. Uh, my friends, it is uh, my great privilege to be here and to say great thanks to all of you that you support our, our, our friends, best friends. I said, okay, you are all uh, like, you said, all of you are our best friends, but our greatest friends, Ukrainian friends, uh, that you are supporting us, but it's not, it's not the end. Still, the war is, uh, is happening, yeah, and uh, Russian aggression uh, is still there. So we do need to be uh, united and stronger, always stronger, stronger together. So we are open to further cooperation with all of you. Don't hesitate to contact us, either to support in Ukraine, of course, but also uh, in, in Poland, uh, where there are Ukrainian friends um, in our, uh, in our uh, country. Uh, and uh, I am talking about that. Why? Because also you need to, uh, uh, you need to make aware that 
we also they were, were forced to redirect it, our funds in order to military, to uh, in more money to healthcare, education, etc. But at the same time, uh, we we need money, you know, to uh, we need to have some supports to even more even more money because for sure this military is the most important. But uh, education for us, we know that maybe. Uh, you, uh, uh, it's it's still like the crucial thing because uh, what is the most important? People. After uh, the end of war, people are like the fundamentals of everything. So we cannot forget about education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm from Ukraine, like everyone else, and I'm supposed to chair, but I'm gonna try to add a bit of sense the opposite of dryness. So like two weeks ago, an ambassador of Canada to Ukraine talked to me at a, at a lunch, at, a, at some conference, said, you guys are missing the bomb shelters in schools. We're not missing them. We just have, you know, 12, 15,000 schools. And each of them now needs to have a bomb shelter, like a real bomb shelter against a cruise missile. And it cannot be done over a day or over a month. So we have thousands of schools equipped, but we have thousands of schools not equipped. And so the ambassador, she just traveled, her name is Larissa, she just traveled uh, to a village, Shepetivka, small village, and then they have, they have an old, you know, almost Soviet Union time shelter it's a basement, but it has not been touched or renovated. And they need as little, and I didn't know about it, they need as little as several hundred dollars to just put bio toilets there, uh, put a new door, you know, in, in, and a little uh, improve the ventilation system. And then, you know, the director of the school, she was talking to me, said, you know, we have all these kids, we have a bus, you know, several villages around us, we are happy, we are ready to, you know, kids are here, we are ready to, to study offline, in person. We just, we just need $150 or $250 for buy a toilets and for something. And of course, we provided that. And we, we are fixing it now like as, as a private initiative. The problem is that we have thousands of schools like that. And we're talking about millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And so we need to have new models. And you know, one thing we learned from the war, for us in Ukraine, the war has been abstract too until it started. And what we learned in Ukraine is that war is evil. Everyone knows that. But it's a disease. It's a human disease. It's a social disease. And it takes humani humanity to stop this disease. Not an individual, not a government, not a country. But it takes all of us together to stop this disease through education too. And so, you know, I, you know in this very fancy introduction, I want to, to ask uh, Mr. Chakrun to talk about uh, new models for international cooperation to cope with educational crisis in Ukraine and in other countries too. And uh, you, are the division, uh, you are from the Division of Policies and Life Learn Learning Systems in UNESCO. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, the, for, for your presence and your input. eloquently than the deputy minister that uh, I had the pleasure to meet in, in Kiev already uh, uh, before uh, the, the, the situations uh, start uh, to dramatize, dramatizing. I think the point about the, um, this new model of co cooperation and what works in all the problems that you are mentioning and the situation, uh, there are three ingredients that I would like to mention. The first of them is the leadership and uh, the capacities of, uh, of the ministry also to make asks and clearly state about what, what are the needs, what are the strategy, and uh, ensure that uh, whatever support is coming is not coming in, in, a, in a chaotic manner, but it is driving toward an objective. And that objective is the continuity of learning and ensuring the right to education through the all Ukrainian uh, online platform. I think that was a very important message and uh, I know Dimitri is here and other teams, other members of the team. I think that capacity, that leadership, and that capacity to uh, express the needs was very important. The second, uh, and uh, Deputy Minister, you, you presented those uh, partners that have been mobilized. Uh, so most of them were mobilized through the Global Education Coalition. Is that multi-stakeholder collaboration that helps 
addressing the challenge. Moving from content providers to uh, connectivity providers to uh, teacher training providers or actors, I think mobilizing the Global Education Coalition was an important aspect. And uh, we had, when we had the meeting with you and, and we convened the Global Education Coalition members, there were a lot of support, but the question was how to coordinate the support, how to ensure that it meets the needs that you have. And I, I would like to mention, for example, the work that uh, Coursera, for example, has been doing, offering um, for free and open uh, learning opportunities. Uh, YouTube offering, uh, putting all the uh, online material and, and putting them in one channel. Of course, uh, you mentioned Google and, and all the support related to devices. So this combination of multi-stakeholders from uh, content to uh, provide to, uh, to devices provider, to teacher training, that's what makes that collaborative uh, framework uh, innovative. The third aspect is the agility. The situation is evolving, and the figures, uh, Deputy Minister, you are mentioning, are changing. When we had the first meeting, it was uh, uh, around 60,000 teachers who were lacking devices, uh, some uh, learners who were uh, outside of the learning, but the situation has been evolving. That agility, that capacity of this multi-stakeholder partnership to respond and to adjust to the situation is very critical, and that's part of this uh, collaborative model. So I just want to, to finish with the saying that uh, I believe that today uh, we usually were thinking that it's only international organization that can do the job. Of course, international organizations have to be there. But mobilizing private sector, mobilizing civil society, mobilizing research network is very critical. And that's what we are trying to do also, looking at what are the um, uh, program and resources that are offered in the neighboring countries and how we can learn what Poland can learn from uh, other countries and, and, and vice versa. That knowledge sharing is also critical in this context. It's not only about devices or about infrastructure, also what do we learn and how we can make that learning uh, uh, accessible and shareable. And we look forward to continue working with, the, with you to ensure the right to education, the right to, to lifelong learning for all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're now going to move to the discussion of the future of education from a different angle. At tech, that's an opportunity. Bringing technology in the classrooms during the war, however tragic it is, it's actually a growth opportunity. And a lot of constraints are removed. And often it's just the way to save the situation to the extent possible. So I'm going to uh, go back uh, to... Uh, Ms. Orlovska, and um, perhaps you can talk, and, and after that, Dmitry Zavorodny, about how we, can, how we can learn from the case of Poland and Ukraine about the future of attack, specifically in this unusual, dramatic, I'm an economist, so, you know, high shock, sorry for the jargon, high level of shock and volatility circumstances. Thank you. So I was talking about solidarity and uh, what is uh, needed to address uh, straightforward to the shock you mentioned. And uh, it is so crucial and that is why it is very important uh, to, um, uh, to talk about uh, what we can learn from each other. I totally agree. And uh, to, in order to share the knowledge because uh, uh, it is important to fast, to, uh, fast learning. But we need to think about uh, that this is temporarily what is important that in, uh, we believe that in a, sh in a short time the, the war will be come to the end. So we need to think about what's next, but we can start today, of course. And so what we are doing uh, in order to make sure that children from uh, Ukraine and, uh, we, and Poland are united uh, at our Polish schools, because our languages are similar, but it's not easy to speak our own languages and to communicate easily. It can be confusing. So uh, at the beginning, it is very important to do something to integrate all those uh, children without words. And what we, have, what we are doing, before uh, the, bro the, on the onset of war, we have managed to uh, have the program which is called uh, labor, la, la, Future Labs and I have some uh, parts with me, sorry for this bag, not, not nice one, but I want to show you something. Literally in every Polish school now 
We have 3D printers, microcontrollers, video studios, music studios, all those things in order to facilitate learning uh, teach, uh, and teach um, uh, future skills. And also, of course, uh, of inspire to uh, have uh, to go into STEAM direction. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, like uh, it's our program, uh, Future Labs. It was also, of course, printed in uh, 3D on our printers in every school. And also, from the very beginning, we are thinking that it should be, uh, it should be. Uh, universal so every literally every school in Poland has such tools uh, small villages in Poland uh, remote uh, in, and uh, uh, also big cities every uh, has the same rights to high-tech education and now it turned out that this tool is so great uh, to support integration of Polish and Ukrainian children. They are, you know, working together, printing together all those things and not only printing because we have music studios, video studios, so they can develop their talents in Polish schools and uh, it is open for refugees in Poland, for any, for those united uh, children with each other. Uh, the other things uh, in uh, we are focusing on in education, it's a redirecting from knowledge-based education to the skills-based education. And we are uh, developing and we are introducing new subjects that are basically, that are uh, graded with uh, teamwork. So not only we are assessing the, per the person uh, by their uh, knowledge or something, but we are assessing Teamwork, so it is the great for all the project, yeah, for the project, and we are so we are implementing such grading. So because we know that uh, PISA um, uh, the grading is not enough, it's based on tests, and we all know that nowadays skills are so crucial. And even because knowledge, okay, we we need to have knowledge, but we need, but what is more important nowadays, we need to know how to use this knowledge creatively, creatively. Because if we are not going to be creative then hackers, uh, disinformation people will have this creativity and we will be manipulated if we are not going to be creative and we, if we don't have enough skills, the, and so, so we call it future skills, those about teamwork, interdisciplinary, and also about, I cannot uh, forget about that, it's about values. Values which are of course uh, shared uh, the same, the bravery, solidarity, and uh, Justice. There are there are common, and our all joint values that we need to teach at schools. And for us, it's priority. And uh, once more, uh, I am so happy that we can now present that high technologies can be very uh, can be very uh, supported for uh, integration of uh, between nations. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to give the floor to Dmitry Zavgorodny, who is uh, representing um, the Department of Digital Transformation. And everything good which is happening in Ukraine with digital and education and science. Well, you know, I'm exaggerating, but uh, Ukraine is innovating and implementing d digital products during the war in all areas, including in education and science. And so Dmitry is a representative of this culture. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Timofey, and thank you, Justina, for your words. So, um, when I started to work in the Ministry of Education in the field of digital transformation, I came with uh, an ideas, like many of my colleagues, about artificial intelligence, big data, 3D printing, and other things, like to introduce the technology um, to, uh, to an educational sector. And it took really great efforts to persuade my colleagues that these technologies should be in our agenda. But after the pandemic, the digital education became a focus of attention in Ukraine, out of Ukraine, all over the world. So during the last years, we have done a lot. And these things that we have prepared for these two years are very helpful right now. So we have launched uh, All Ukrainian Online School, which is a platform for, um, for the secondary school with all the learning materials for teachers and learners. Now we have translated teacher materials for at least six different languages because it is now used commonly all over the world. Um, we have done a lot of teacher trainings for digital upskilling and also procured thousands of laptops. 
And in that time, it seemed to be, like Justina mentioned, uh, something as a temporary solution for the lockdowns. So we just need to, to make it happen for a month or uh, then to use it afterwards uh, as an extension for an education. But it has changed uh, 200 days ago uh, after the attack on Ukraine from Russia. And as millions of people had to leave their hometowns right now as an internally displaced people or as refugees all over the world, uh, the situation is dramatically different. But with the help of technology, education is persevered. Out of our four million Ukrainian school children, more than one and a half million are now learning online, unfortunately. Dozens of thousands of children are using our digital solutions, products, uh, services in, inside the country and all over the world. And they continue to study Ukrainian language, Ukrainian history and other subjects, preserve their cultural identity and stay connected, which is very important, stay connected to their teachers, their classmates, their school, their heritage, other things. So, whether they are in the bomb shelter, on occupied territory, or in the hosting country, technologies are like the window to, to an education. So the, um, the lesson that I have learned during, during this last period of time, that innovation is the best and the most effective response for building back better or for fighting anything. The innovation is our um, best tool. And the government is obviously not, not the most innovative place and often is resistant uh, to many innovation. But we see how vital it is to innovation appear in educational system, in schools, in universities, uh, also in the absence of the budget and resources and during the pandemic or the war. So just several days ago, former Google CEO Eric Schmidt was in Ukraine. And he said on, on the panel that if innovation doesn't occur, you should fire regulators. And I, as a regulator, I, I completely agree with him. And innovation occur where there is a proper environment. The capable universities, talented entrepreneurs, educators, students, when they have the needs and, and the tools uh, they need and the motivation. So I believe that our task as a state is to create the necessary conditions uh, for these creative minds to produce new modern solutions. Uh, for instance, the gadgets, high-quality internet, teacher trainings, and other things that we are asking is something that we think of as an ecosystem for, for our innovators, for teachers, to bring new solutions for, uh, for our digital environment, and not only digital, and to bring this innovation to an educational process. So to, to end up, I would like to say that... Um, in the beginning of September, uh, the new year, uh, the new school year has started. We thought of ourselves in the Ministry of Education as a humanitarian organization, providing necessary services for those children which could not attend schools because of the lack of shelter or, or other safety, safety issues. But we have faced an unpleasant reality as our services, like all Ukrainian school online, keep on being attacked by Russian hackers. So this is so something which was new for me as an experience in, in the field of education. And the Russian messages of uh, intimidation uh, appeared in school chats and online lesson. Still, if there is the other thing, the one thing that I understood during the war, is that we are not on our own. As uh, Borhin mentioned, we are a fraction of huge educational and technological community. And the one who asks could always get some help. And we've got a lot. Uh, all around the globe, from huge corporations to an individual educators, there are people who are open to talk with us, to help. Because we all became educators one day to help other people, to achieve their dreams, other things. And we believe that education is extremely important. And it could empower, inspire, it could bring people to uh, higher things and help our country to sustain and then to build back better. So now I'm sure that innovation and technologies are the best tools for our dreams uh, to win against this ignorance. And I'm so also sure that in the end, light was, will always defeat darkness. And if we haven't seen it yet, it's definitely still not the end. Thank you.
thank you so much. We are about to move to Q&A, but of course we should have an um, unexpected, fantastic mystery guest speaker, the Minister of Education of Romania, um, Sorin Kimpeanu. Thank you. Dear colleagues, first of all, please allow me to congratulate the Ukrainian Ministry of Education and Science and the Polish Ministry of Education for organizing this event. In Romania, from the very first moment of the crisis, our priority was to ensure that Ukrainian children and their families feel welcome in Romania. Thus, all Ukrainian minors have access to education in the Romanian schools under the same condition as Romanian children. Moreover, with the support of the local authorities and the various uh, NGOs, we have set up educational hubs in uh, several schools across Romania. In this way, Ukrainian children have the possibility to benefit from educational activities in Ukrainian language by using the platform provided by the Ukrainian Ministry of Education. There are different extracurricular activities in various fields such as robotics, IT and artificial intelligence organized for them with the support of Romanian schools and higher education institutions and teachers. I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate the Romanian support for Ukraine and uh, for its proud nation. Thank you very much. I'm here uh, as representative of the Romanian government, but uh, we are a team with the presidential administration, with my colleague Ligia Deca, the educational advisor of the President Johannes. Thank you once again. Thank you for your support. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah. Still within time. Um, no, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah, <laughs> we're good. Um, I would just like to underline that Romania has indeed welcomed um, Ukrainian citizens, ladies, their children, everyone that needed to cross the border was welcomed. And we realized after some time that we need to move from emergency response to medium and longer term support. We have recently organized, the Romanian government has recently organized a large scale um, forum with all EU states, UN agencies, European Commission, um, in order to figure out how we do that in a joint fashion so that we learn from each other and that we figure out together with uh, um, the Ukrainian government how to best support kids. And in this respect, I would perhaps like to raise a couple of issues that we are currently facing. For example, the Ukrainian educational platform has been wonderful in, in keeping kids from having educational um, setbacks due to the war. But um, unfortunately, um, it also means that many of the Ukrainian kids who are in Romania do not go to Romanian schools, even if these schools offer education in uh, Ukrainian language, because it's much easier sometimes to just sit and just look at your tablet or, or a smartphone. But that prevents them from immersing in, in a social environment with their other kids, and that prevents us from being able to figure out what their needs are, psychological care, um, you know, even other types of help that we would be able to identify if they would be enrolled in the system. So that's a challenge. And sometimes it's a trust issue. There are a lot of rumors and disinformation going around in social media and in, and in their groups. So this is why the Romanian government is trying to find this common approach in order to overcome um, these challenges and also trying to figure out how to, uh, because Romanian uh, language is not so close um, to Ukrainian. So we need to, to deal with a, a language barrier as well, perhaps even a bit more than our Polish colleagues who you know, are a wonderful example. Um, so we, in that respect, we would like to, to be able to use more of the Ukrainian teachers who are also refugees on the Romanian territory. We could offer the space and the, the resources for them to be able to continue their mission, their teaching mission, with the refugee children that we have on our soil. We just want to be able to help uh, more, and we're willing to exchange and learn about that. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Um, we open the floor for any questions, remarks, and intervention. Please, we start in geometrical order, <laughs> if I may. Everyone, my name is Claire McGuire. I'm speaking from the International Federation of Library Associations. We've been working very closely with libraries, the Ukrainian Library Association, and national institutions to safeguard the precious heritage collections um, and digitize them. And um, we will need to explore, we are working with UNESCO and the ULA, but we'll need to explore further partnerships with the private sector, with other member states. And I wondered in your experience, especially in a war where identity is so critical, um, do you see there being value in encouraging a greater linkage with the cultural element in these innovative frameworks for digital transformation, such as with stronger collaboration with memory institutions like libraries, museums, archives? Thank you. Thank you. Which is the Global Union Federation for Employees in the Education Sector. We also represent educators in Ukraine. I would like to st start very briefly by giving in the full support to Ukraine, and we have condemned the invasion of Ukraine globally from Biak by teachers from across the world. I would like to thank the Deputy Minister for uh, describing needs. If I may, with all due respect, challenge you on what do you think are the major needs for your teachers to be able to deliver long-term education in a crisis situation, whether they are now doing it online or in person because the, the long-term plight of doing this in a crisis situation is going to strain them. We are in contact with the teachers in Ukraine, and we are supporting them, and we will continue to support them. But having the focus on, is it devices for them to keep contact? Is it professional development to be able to deal with traumatic children and their own traumas? Is it to further develop professional development online? I know that Ukraine has developed very good systems. I'm also connected with the European Vergelen Center in Oslo, Norway, that supports professional development and has supported Ukraine in doing this. But what would you say? What do our teachers need in addition to what our students need? Yes, please. Andre, would you like to answer? Yeah. Thank you very much for your questions. I think, firstly, they need uh, a support from the state, and we have already made it. We supported all our teachers. Our teachers are heroes. They made unbelievable things. They started the educational pro pro uh, process from the 1st of September. They started it all online, all in personal, but they have already started, and they are heroes. Some of the teachers, uh, they are on the front line and fight with Russian troops. And even there, online, they, do, they don't stop the educational process. They make, made, they make the lectures through the computers from the front line of war. So this, the next thing is a psychological support of our teachers because they have a lot of problems with students, with pupils. They have a lot of their own problems. And the third thing is digital devices because it's very important to improve the quality of learning through digital instruments all over Ukraine. Thank you very much. Ah, and Dmitry would like to. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, what I would like to add it is important to understand that in terms of uh, territory, Ukraine is really huge. So uh, we have more than 400,000 teachers uh, only in schools in Ukraine. There are also teachers in vocational education, in universities, preschool education. So there are hundreds of thousands of teachers. And they are in different types of the territory right now, in different circumstances. So the needs are different in the circumstances. And as they are territories where only online learning could 
proceed further. In these territories, it is crucial to deliver devices for the teachers to work because there is no other way. Certainly in other regions, uh, there are different needs and we understand that they are different and we could not prioritize which teachers are the most important. They are all important for us. They have just different circumstances. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I'm going to mention too that we also have teachers in uh, occupied territories. And this is really is a very complex and difficult situation. Because as you might have seen from the news, the Russia is bringing their own teachers and they issue Russian certificates and that amounts to symptoms and elements of genocide through erasing the Ukrainian culture from even temporarily occupied territories. They also put pressure on teachers, including torture. There is evidence, well, you know, I, 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 I'm like an economist, so I know what happens with nuclear power plant staffers in uh, Zaporizhia. But I also have heard how much pressure the teachers come in under to switch sides, and many of them don't. And if they do, they can be prosecuted. So it's, it's really a very complex. It would take another five hours, a separate discussion. But that's something which is very challenging, requires new approaches, and requires careful thinking. So essentially, there are three groups, front lines or pre-front lines, areas in which things are disrupted but more or less normal, and then occupied territories. And then we can talk about students and pupils and kids in the occupied territories and their parents. And this is, again, this is a, this is a week long discussion, but that is a real serious issue. That's where culture appropriation is happening, culture erasure is happening, and even torture on educational, you know, incentive stuff. Just torture. I don't know what kind of people are doing that, but, you know. If you don't believe, come visit Ukraine. We'll bring you to the front lines. You can talk. So we are, um, we are out of time. It, we got disrupted, and I didn't do my job very well. So there is an intervention there. There is an intervention here. There is one more intervention. We're going to take these three interventions. If someone wants to make another intervention, raise your hand. I ask you to be one minute long. So I'll take five more total interventions. One, two, three, four, five. That's it. Unfortunately, we're happy to talk afterwards, and then we need to talk about the sign in the document, and it will be closing remarks. We did start late, so I'm going to take another five, seven minutes of the schedule to finish, but we want to have this discussion. We don't want it just to be. So, please. Thank you. Very strong remarks and touching discussion. My name is Tapi Lakso. I'm head of advocacy for Finn Church Aid. We have a multi-year commitment to support uh, Ukrainian education system in coming years. Uh, in this crisis situation, the focus is very easily with primary and secondary education. So I would like to ask, how do you see the situation with technical vocational education and tra training? Because there is need to have workforce with updated skills and, and capacities because we see it, of course, that the, the rebuilding needs really need the educated workforce. And, and for example, with TVET students, they have not been able to participate so many remote learning uh, sessions than, than with primary, it has been better situation. So how do you see that TVET situation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the way, with the questions, we're going to collect them all. We're taking a note and answer in one session real quick. So in the interest of time. Uh, I promised you and then, okay, it was geometric. So uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Excellencies, Latvia stands firmly in support of Ukraine in the fight against the aggressor, Russia. Within a week from the start of the war, the law on the support of civilians of Ukraine was adopted in Latvia. And as of today, more than 4,000 Ukrainian students have been enrolled in education institutions from pre-primary to secondary level across Latvia. For each child admitted in the educational system in Latvia, an individual curriculum is being developed, as well as the necessary support measures are identified. And learning remotely is also made possible, providing online learning materials and pedagogical support. 
And we are also uh, maximizing the involvement of Ukrainians in non-formal education. Uh, for, for example, by the end of August, more than 300 summer camps for Ukrainian children uh, were organized. Let me stress that Latvia's support for Ukraine is unwavering also as reflected in the bilateral assistance we have provided, which amounts to 0.8% of GDP. This includes humanitarian aid and our continued development assistance, including in the area of education. For instance, we are currently supporting Ukraine's effort, efforts to improve its digital learning environment and capacity of, for providing quality continuous distance learning. And in, in addition, we are providing methodological support to Ukraine's teachers who are working with children in regions affected by war. And we are also pleased to announce that recently the Latvian government has made a decision to contribute to the reconstruction of Chernihiv Oblast, where some 202 education institutions have been damaged or destroyed. And while we are still identifying the specific measures we can undertake, we are determined to get to work immediately, especially in view of the coming winter. So we look forward to working with our Ukrainian partners and friends, as well as the private sector and also other donors, to rebuild a strong and prosperous Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Manuel Wancha, I'm the president of the U.S. Institute of Diplomacy and Human Rights here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I want just to um, let you know we, we, we help Ukraine. Uh, we were in uh, Romania in March, and we um, uh, do trainings for refugees and human trafficking preventions. You know, it's another aspect of the war uh, because uh, that it's um, uh, people, they are not aware uh, what is human trafficking. And what we did, we in Romania, we um, uh, teach and also we... Um, with our team, we translate in the, in the language, and also we have an uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian language this training, and we want to disseminate this training in all the countries which they have these situations. We uh, U.S. Institute of Diplomacy and Human Rights it's a think tank, and we are focusing on um, uh, teaching human rights uh, per Universal Declaration, also human trafficking preventions. And we are preparing uh, consult certified consultants in uh, those areas. And uh, again, you guys, you have our support. And um, we work also, you know, with, uh, with, with any country, you know, which is uh, involved in this work. And we want to um, uh, give you our support and also scholarship and whatever is needed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think uh, there, there's last intervention, please. And then we wrap up in the last minute. Hi guys, uh, my name is Karin. I was living and studying in Ukraine um, up until the start of the war at Dnipro Medical Institute. So um, hearing these stories is very personal to my heart because I saw what the effects of the war has on education firsthand. Um, my main question that I have is regarding um, support in order to obtain our transcripts. Since leaving the war, um, since leaving Ukraine, we've been trying to continue our education because um, our home governments have said that they cannot help us to carry on with our education until we're able to continue offline learning. And as supportive as our um, professors have been, it's hard to do a degree for five years and it be null and void because of the effects that war has on, you know, trying to obtain a medical education. So I was just wondering, um, what, guy, what are you guys doing in order to support maybe the digitalization of transcripts and also to support students to obtain their transcripts. And I'd also um, like to give my gratitude to Romania for the hospitality that you guys showed us when we fled the war. So thank you. Thank you very much. We will give the answers in the closing remarks. We also have to sign the super most important document between Poland and Ukraine ever. And so Andre and Justina, I think, please. So we're signing the Memorandum of Understanding between Polish and Ukrainian Ministers of Education and Science in support of education and science in Ukraine. Thank you so much.
Thank you and Fantastic. 30 seconds closing remarks, perhaps. <laughs> Andre, you go first. And maybe answer if yes. you want. But 30 seconds, so we have to move Thank on. Thank you, everybody, for our fruitful discussion. We hope to see you soon in Ukraine, in free Ukraine, without war. And we are in invited everybody to visit our beautiful country. But we, what education, uh, we removed a lot of what educational institution to the safe territory for the students, they can make an additional knowledge by making some things with hands because it's not possible to teach somebody online in VAT education. And about uh, electronic, yeah. electronic transcripts. transcripts. Yeah. Dmitro is now preparing the things to make all uh, documents about education in our state government uh, application dear. And we, Dmitro will do his best to finish the uh, things as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll get it done. Please. The last 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, last sentence. I just want to, of course, uh, uh, I am repeating after uh, Andrei that uh, uh, we need to go to Ukraine for visit, sightseeing, uh, and very shortly, and uh, it's very important. But till this day, we need to focus on supporting everybody uh, in uh, their own uh, uh, possibilities. Yeah? So don't forget about that. Let's uh, do stronger together and free Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the session is closed. Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraini. I should have said that. But maybe for us it's easier. Thank you. Okay, so this one will be for, for Andrei because it's like, you know, machine.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد الصادق الأمين أصحاب المعالي والسعادة ضيوفنا الكرام مرحبا بكم في هذه الفعالية الموازية لقمة تحويل التعليم 2022 في جلسة مبادرة التضامن الرقمي من أجل أجهزة حاسوب متصلة بالإنترنت للتعليم والتعلم للجميع هذه الجلسة من تنظيم المنظمة العربية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم أليكسو ومؤسسة الألفية للتربية المستدامة ميلينيوم منظمة اليونسكو المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية المملكة المغربية الجمهورية التونسية والجمهورية الإسلامية الموريتانية هناك ترجمة إلية للعربية والإنجليزية So you can uh, have the translation in English and Arabic and I think in French also uh, إذا uh, كان بيود معالي المدير العام الأستاذ الدكتور محمد ولد أعمر مدير عام المنظمة العربية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم أليكسو أن يكون معنا ولكن ظروف طارئة منعته من الحضور والمشاركة وهو يتمنى لأشغال هذه الجلسة كل النجاح والتوفيق إذا سنستهل هذه الجلسة بكلمة معالي الأستاذ الدكتور محمد ولد أعمر المدير العام للمنظمة العربية التربية والثقافة والعلوم الأليكسو ثم سنعطي المجال للصديق المهندس ماريو فرانكو رئيس مؤسسة الألفية للتربية المستدامة ثم نعطي الكلمة لشركائنا في تنظيم هذه الجلسة بعد تقديم مباشرة بعد أن نقدم المبادرة وهناك عرض بايربوينت لنقدم فيه المبادرة إذا يتحدث بعد تقديم المبادرة الشركاء في التنظيم أي ممثل المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية وأرحب بسعادة الأستاذة ابتسام عقاب الأمينة العامة للجنة الوطنية الأردنية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم ممثل المملكة المغربية ممثل الجمهورية التونسية سعادة الأستاذ نزار تيرزي مدير مكتب معالي الوزير التونسي ثم ممثل الجمهورية الإسلامية الموريتانية يعني كلمات الشركاء في تنظيم هذه الجلسة ثم نفتح بعد ذلك مباشرة المجال للتدخلات ونستهل التدخل الأول بمعالي الوزير الفلسطيني محمد مروان عورتاني الوزير الفلسطيني نأمل أن يلتحق بنا معالي الوزير دولة الإمارات الذي أكد حضوره ثم تتوالى الكلمات تباعا إذا نستهل على بركة الله هذه الجلسة بكلمة معالي المدير العام الأستاذ الدكتور محمد ولد أعمر أصحاب المعالي أصحاب السعادة السيدات والسادة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين المنظمة العربية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم هي وكالة جامعة الدول العربية المكلفة بتنسيق وتعزيز وتطوير العمل العربي المشترك في مجالات التربية والثقافة والعلوم وقد أنجزت منذ تأسيسها عام 1970 عملا جبارا من مكوناته وضع الخطط والمناهج الإرشادية والأدلة المرجعية وذلك من خلال الاجتماعات الوزارية العربية الدورية التي تنظمها 
وهي ثلاث مؤتمرات تضم وزراء التربية والتعليم ووزراء التعليم العالي والبحث العلمي والوزراء المسؤولين عن التعليم الفني والتقني لذلك واكبت المنظمة مسار أعدادي ووضعي ومتابعة تنفيذ أهداف التنمية المستدامة وخاصة الهدف الرابع المتعلق بضمان التعليم الجيد المنصف والشامل للجميع وتعزيز فرص التعلم مدى الحياة للجميع وسعت مع الدول العربية إلى تحقيق غاياته وبذل الجهود ليكون ذلك في الموعد 2030 ثم جاءت جائحة كوفيد-19 وما سببته من انقطاع التعليم الحضوري فتبين أننا لم نكن مستعدين لتوفير بديل رقمي جاهز نكون قد أعددنا منصاته وخبرنا محتوى برامجه ودربنا عليه المعلمين فكان لابد من استنفار ما لدينا من خبرة لتقديم حلول عاجلة لتنظيم التعليم عن بعد فاستطعنا في ظرف وجيز أن نوفر منصات للتعليم الإلكتروني ونقدمها للدول التي تحتاج إليها علما بأن دولا عربية عديدة طورت منصات خاصة بها كما قمنا بتقديم برنامج تدريبي متكامل للمدرسين والفنيين في تلك الدول لإدارة هذه المنصات وأهدينا آلاف الحواسيب إلى بعض الدول العربية بفضل الشراكة مع مؤسسة الألفية للتربية المستدامة ومؤسسة إنتال ومؤسسة جي بي للتربية الملهمة فلها نؤكد جزيل شكرنا أصحاب السعادة والمعالي لقد بينت الجائحة أن التكنولوجيا أصبحت تلعب دورا محوريا وضروريا في العملية التعليمية والتعلمية ولذلك انخرطت الأليكسو في مشاريع طموحة من أجل استخدام الذكاء الاصطناعي في التعليم في الوطن العربي وتطوير المناهج التربوية لمسيارة التحولات الرقمية وتأهيل الشباب العربي لمهن المستقبل وصناعة الذكاء وفي هذا الإطار يتنزل مشروع الأسبوع العربي للبرمجة الذي يهدف إلى توفير بيئة تعليمية بأسلوب ممتع ويسير يساعد في تعليم أساسيات البرمجة للناشئين ويفتح أمامهم آفاقا نحو تخصصات جديدة عبر إشراكهم في مسابقات البرمجيات الشيقة والممتعة كالتعلم الآلي والذكاء الاصطناعي وقد كان محور الأسبوع العربي لهذه السنة الذكاء الاصطناعي وحماية البيئة وشارك فيه أكثر من مليوني طفل من كل الدول العربية وفي إطار هذا الاهتمام بفئة الشباب ولمزيد تمكينهم من التمرس على التكنولوجيا الرقمية في بيئة محمية ستطلق المنظمة في الأيام القادمة مشروع منصة الأليكسو للميتافيرس والNFT أصحاب السعادة السيدات والسادة تقوم منظمة الأليكسو من خلال مرصدها بجمع البيانات والمؤشرات المتعلقة بأوضاع التربية والثقافة والعلوم في الدول العربية ومعالجتها وتحليلها وقد أصدر المرصد نشرة إحصائية خاصة بمناسبة هذا المؤتمر تضمنت المؤشرات ذات الصلة وتحليلا لواقع التعليم الرقمي في الدول العربية انطلاقا من تلك, من تلك المؤشرات ويبين التقرير أهمية الجهود العربية في مجال ربط الأفراد والمدارس بالإنترنت وتوفر الحواسيب للأغراض التعليمية ووجود النور الكهربائي في المدارس وعلى سبيل المثال تطورت نسبة الأفراد الذين يستخدمون الإنترنت في الوطن العربي من 38.2% عام 2015 إلى 69% في نهاية 2020 ولكن التقرير يبين بوضوح مثل التقارير الأخرى التفاوت الحاصلة بين الفئات الاجتماعية والجهات في الحصول على متطلبات التعليم عن بعد وهو وضع يقتضي معالجة عاجلة حتى لا, يكون حتى لا يكون مآل جهودنا على عكس مقاصدنا وبما أننا آلينا على أنفسنا في ميثاق الأمم المتحدة بأن ندفع بالرقي الاجتماعي قودما 
وأن نرفع مستوى الحياة في جو من الحرية أفسح كما اعترفنا في المادة 26 من الإعلان العالمي لحقوق الإنسان بأن لكل شخص الحق في التعليم وأكدنا في المادة الثانية منه على أن لكل إنسان حق التمتع بجميع الحقوق والحريات المذكورة في هذا الإعلان دون ما تمييز من أي نوع بما في ذلك التمييز بسبب الأصل الاجتماعي أو الثروة واعتبارا لتكوين التعليم لكون التعليم كما تؤكده اليونسكو هو الذي يغير مسار الحياة وبه يتم استأصال الفقر وتحقق العدالة بين الناس فإني أدعو من هذا المنبر إلى إطلاق مبادرة مبادرة من أجل التضامن الرقمي العالمي للحد من الفجوة الرقمية بين التلاميذ ولمساعدة الدول الفقيرة على, على مواكبة التحولات الرقمية والثورة التكنولوجية وأحث جميع أعضاء المجتمع الدولي حكومات ومنظمات ومجتمعا مدنيا وأفرادا على الإسهام فيها بأموالهم وخبرتهم واستخدام العبقريات الفردية والجماعية لإيجاد الحلول الذكية لمشاكل الربط الكهربائي والاتصال لسكان الأرياف والقرى وكل من لا تتوفر له هذه الوسائل فلا نترك فلا نترك أحدا يتخلف عن الركب ونحقق العدل بين الناس الذي هو أهم مقاصد الميثاق والذي هو أساس العمران كما يقول ابن خلدون وفقنا الله لما فيه خير الإنسانية جمعاء والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وبهذه تنتهي كلمة معالي الأستاذ الدكتور محمد الأعمر المدير العام للمنظمة العربية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم أليكسو ويسعدني أن أحيل الكلمة مباشرة إلى الصديق والشريك الأستاذ المهندس ماريو فرانكو رئيس مؤسسة الألفية للتعليم المستدام فليتفضل مشكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أصحاب المغالي والسهادة الضيوف الكريم السيدات والسهادة والسلام عليكم يسعدني ويشرفني أن أندما إلى هذه الجلسة المتميزة في سياق كما تحويل التعليم وأن أكون شاركا للمنظمة العربية للتربية والتكفاء والهلوم على إكسو لتغزيز شراكة والتزام خصوب عربية إديو مستدام إنا علاوية إديو إت الألفية تغليم مستدام إيا تنفيذ الالتزامات أسيطة بالتحاون مع الألكسو ودول الخربية الملتزمة بدمان أصول كل طالب وكل مغالم إلى جهاز غصوب متصل بالإنترنت للتغليم والتغلوم نحن ندرك أن ذلك تغذيا كبيرا لكل الحكومات لكننا نعلم بأن تلك فرصة كبيرة لتطوير القدرة التكنولوجية للبلاد وفي سياق مبادرة أتدنم الحكمي أجهزة خصوب متصلة بالإنترنت للتخليم والتخلوم للجميع نحن ملتزمون بالتحاون مع الأليكسو ودول الخربية لدم النظام الإيكولوجي التكنولوجي محلي اسمحوا لي بكلمة إضافية لتسليط الدواء حال الالتزامات السيطة التي نماثل رؤية شاملة تتضمن التحاون لتطوير أجهزة خصوب مساء ماما 
التعليم والتعلم وتعزيز الخدمات لدعم الأجهزة والبنية التحتية التكنولوجية للتعليم جنبا إلى جنب مع تطوير النظام الإيكولوجي التكنولوجي للبلاد وبالتوفير على الالتزام خاصوب خرابي إديو إت مستدام نغنو مستغيدون للتخاون وتطوير مشريخ جديدة شكرا جزيلا على خسن الإن إسخاء والسلام عليكم وخاخبات الله شكرا جزيلا شكرا شكرا جزيلا الاستاذ ماريو فرانكو على هذه الكلمه القيمه وشكرا جزيلا على استعمال اللغه العربيه برتغالي انترنت وبرتغالي الجنسيه ولكن يدرس عن بعد عن طريق استاذ في اليمن يدرس اللغه العربيه لمده خمس سنوات وبعد خمس سنوات سيقول الشعر ان شاء الله هو يعني حقيقة منخرط جدا مع المجتمع العربي وشريك منذ سنوات فكل الشكر لأستاذ ماريو فرانكو إذا في الحقيقة هناك بعض المتدخلين بما أن هناك العديد من الجلسات المتوازية فنحن ننتظر قدوم في كل لحظة يعني سعادة الأستاذ الدكتور عبد الرحمن بن محمد العاصمي مدير عام مكتب التربية لدول الخليج وكذلك سعادة الأستاذ الدكتور توفيق جلاسي المدير العام المساعد لمنظمة اليونسكو بما أنهم عندهم التزامات في جلسات أخرى إذا مثل ما أشرت في البداية قبل أن نعطي الكلمة لشركائنا في تنظيم هذه الجلسة سنعرض المبادرة في عرض يعني وجيز ثم نتبع البرنامج المسطر إذا مبادرة التضامن الرقمي أجهزة حاسوب متصلة بالإنترنت للتعلم والتعليم للجميع نسأل أولا لماذا هذه المبادرة للتضامن الرقمي تعرفون جميعا أن المجتمع الأممي سنة 2015 حدد 17 هدفا من أجل تحقيقها قبل نهاية 2030 ومن ضمن هذا الهدف نخص بالذكر الهدف الرابع المتعلق بتحقيق تعليم جيد ومنصف وشامل والتعلم مدى الحياة للجميع لكننا اليوم في ظل التحولات الرقمية الكبيرة الذي يعيشها العالم والانتشار الواسع لتكنولوجيا المعلومات والاتصال التي شملت مختلف جوانب الحياة لا نستطيع الحديث عن تعليم جيد ومنصف وشامل بدون استعمال التكنولوجيا فاستخدام الحواسيب والتكنولوجيا للتعليم أصبح أمرا ضروريا وتمكين التلاميذ في كل أنحاء العالم من هذه الوسائل يعتبر من أهم الشروط لتحقيق الهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة لذلك فإن الأليكسو تطلق رفقة شركائها هذه المبادرة للتضامن الرقمي في هذا المنتظم الأممي أين تلتقي أمم وشعوب الأرض لتعالج مسائل مصيرية مشتركة ونحن نعتقد في الأليكسو أن التعليم هو من أهم المسائل المصيرية التي تهم البشر البشرية جمعاء فبالتعليم الجيد نصنع جيلا يحافظ على هذه الأرض ويجعل من كوكبنا مكانا يستحق فيه الحياة ولا خيار لنا اليوم وحتى لا يتخلف أحدا عن ركب فلا بد من التضامن الرقمي إذا هذه المبادرة هي بالخصوص يعني تستهدف خاصة الهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة وبالخصوص تحقيق الهدف الغاية 4A من أهداف التنمية المستدامة وهي التي تنص على بناء ورفع مستوى المرافق التعليمية ذات البيئة التعليمية الشاملة الفعالة للجميع والائتلاف 4A1 الذي يشمل أولا الكهرباء الأنترنت والحواسيب إذا هذا التقديم هذا العرض سنقدم الإطار العام الالتزامات ثم التوصيات 
إذا الإطار العام قلنا تحدثنا فيه في الكلمات الافتتاحية وهو ما نعيشه من تحولات رقمية كبرى جعلت مسألة التضامن الرقمي اليوم ضرورة حتى نساعد الدول الفقيرة من مواكبة هذه التحولات وخاصة مساعدتها في الحصول على البنى التحتية اللازمة وعلى الوسائل التكنولوجية وعلى الحواسيب و كذلك هذا هو الهدف الرابع كذلك الغاية أربعة واحد بناء المرافق التعليمية التي تراعي الفروق بين الجنسين والإعاقة والأطفال ورفع مستوى المرافق التعليمية القائمة وتهيئة بيئة تعليمية فعالة ومأمونة وخالية من العنف للجميع المؤشر أربعة واحد يخص نسبة المدارس التي تقدم الخدمات الأساسية بحسب نوع الخدمة وخصوصا آ كهرباء ب الانترنت للأغراض البيداغوجية التعليمية وج حواسيب للأغراض التعليمية البيداغوجية إذا نستعرض هنا الوضع العام في العالم حسب أحصائيات اليونسكو فتشاهدون على اليسار نسبة المدارس التي تصلها الكهرباء حسب المستوى التعليمي في الوسط نسبة المدارس التي لديها إمكانيات إمكانية الوصول إلى الإنترنت لأغراض تربوية حسب المستوى التعليمي وعلى اليمين نسبة المدارس التي لديها أجهزة كمبيوتر لأغراض تربوية حسب المستوى التعليمي ومثل ما أشرت هذه الأحصائيات هي حسب اليونسكو معهد أحصاء اليونسكو في في الصادرة في مارس 2022 وكذلك بين يديكم أظن هناك النشرة الأحصائية التي أعدتها الأليكسو والتي تحتوي على إحصائيات في الوطن العربي وفيها يعني إحصائيات دقيقة وزملائي سيوزعون عليكم هذه النشرة الأحصائية وهي موجودة باللغة العربية والإنجليزية الدكتور رامي وإيزابيل سيقومان بذلك الوضع في الدول العربية مثل ما تشاهدون نسبة المدارس التي تصلها الكهرباء يعني متفاوتة ويعني في تصل في بعض الدول إلى مئة بالمئة ولكن المعدل العام في حدود الثمانين في المئة بالنسبة لنسبة المدارس التي لديها إمكانية الوصول إلى الإنترنت لأغراض التربوية فمثل ما تشاهدون يعني النسب ضعيفة في 2020 يعني حسب المستوى بالنسبة للمدارس الابتدائية 68% بالنسبة للتعليم الثانوي 90% وبالنسبة للتعليم العالي 81% بالنسبة للمدارس التي لديها أجهزة كمبيوتر لأغراض تربوية فمثل ما تشاهدون تتفاوت النسبة يعني من 2015 إلى 2020 فوصلت إلى حدود 80% و92% و95% وهذا المعدل العام ولكن تشاهد عندكم يعني في النشرية تبع الأليكسو هناك أحصائيات دقيقة حسب البلدان وهناك تفاوت كبير في هذه النسب لدى البلدان هذا الوضع العام كذلك في كل العالم وحتى نعمل يعني مقارنة بين الدول العربية وبقية دول العالم هناك يعني باللون الأزرق النسبة بين 75 100% اللون الأخضر الغامق بين 50 و 75% والدول العربية تتراوح بين هاتين المجموعتين كذلك نود أن نشير إلى أحصائية هامة للاتحاد الدولي للاتصالات والتي أصدرت تقريرا في 2020 والذي يقول أنه أكثر من 2 مليار طفل أي بالأكثر من 2.2 مليار طفل وشاب تبلغ أعمارهم 25 عام أو أقل ثلثاء الأطفال والشباب في جميع أنحاء العالم ليس لديهم اتصال بالإنترنت في المنزل وأن الافتقار إلى الاتصال بين السكان الأكثر تهميشا يضعهم في وضع غير مؤات للغاية ويقضي على أي فرصة قد تكون لديهم للمشاركة في الاقتصاد الحديث إذا مبادئ تحويل التعليم طبعا مثل ما تعرفون يعني في إعلان شينداو 2015 وهو الذي يعني 
أسس للهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة ينص على ضمان انتفاع جميع الفتيات والفتيان بالأجهزة الرقمية الموصولة بشبكة إنترنت وبيئة تعليمية رقمية ملائمة لاحتياجاتهم وسريعة للاستجابة لها بحلول عام 2030 كذلك موجز سياسة الأمم المتحدة والأمين العام للأمم المتحدة الذي نص على وضع خطة عمل مصممة لتسريع تنفيذ الاتفاقيات القائمة بما في ذلك أهداف التنمية المستدامة ونخص بالذكر هنا الهدف الرابع ثم نمر الآن إلى الالتزامات التي نقترحها في هذه المبادرة وفي الحقيقة هذه المبادرة يعني تنص على ست التزامات بما أننا نتكلم عن تضامن رقمي وعلى تمكين الجميع من أجهزة حاسوب فلا بد أولا من التعاون لتطوير تصميم مرجعي لأجهزة الكمبيوتر المتصلة والخاصة بالتعليم والتعلم فأجهزة الحواسيب للتعليم مختلفة عن أجهزة الحواسيب التي تستعمل في المؤسسات الاقتصادية الالتزام الثاني هو تشجيع وتطوير الخدمات لتيسير إدارة واستخدام أجهزة الحاسوب المتصلة وهنا يعني نؤكد على جانب الخدمات يعني ليس مجرد شراء الحواسيب بل الأهم هو الخدمات خدمات الصيانة وخدمات المساعدة لاستغلال واستعمال هذه الأجهزة على أحسن وجه ثم الالتزام الثالث دعم الإنتاج المحلي لأجهزة الكمبيوتر المتصلة بالتعلم والتعليم وقيمتها المضافة في الاقتصاد والمجتمع وتعزيز خلق فرص العمل في نفس الوقت ماريو هل تود أن تفسر شكرا uh, just a small uh, comment to uh, highlight the commitment uh, three because we uh, to be very direct uh, on the topic we think all the governments want to provide uh, computer and internet access for all students and all teachers and we think it's not sustainable to buy from outside of the country uh, every year computers for all students then the the model we propose is to integrate the assembling of the computers the development of the devices in the economy of the country creating jobs and generating income uh, special uh, one concerns the price of the device is not only the price of the device, but the price of owner the device, the TCO, which uh, we made some uh, studies, and we see it is cheaper. It's more affordable for a country if part of the cost is integrated in the local economy, and then the country benefit with this production. And that is the model we are working on. Thank you. أولا على إنشاء صناعة وطنية لصناعة الحواسيب وخاصة تركيب الحواسيب وهذا يمكن من الضغط على التكلفة فالدراسات تشير إلى أقل يعني أقل شيء 30% من يعني من تكلفة الحاسوب نستطيع أن نوفرها بالإضافة إلى خلق مواطن شغل وطنية. رابعا إنشاء مبادرة لإتاحة أجهزة الكمبيوتر المتصلة والمدعومة لجميع الطلاب والمعلمين للتعليم والتعلم. خامسا تعزيز تحسين القياس والابلاغ من خلال القياس الكمي لبعض مكونات الهدف الرابع وهذا في الحقيقه يعني من اهم هذه التوصيات والالتزامات لانه الهدف الرابع في اعتقادنا وفي هذه المبادره يجب ان نطور القياس الكمي وكذلك يجب ان ندقق في بعض المؤشرات وبعض الارقام وبعض الاحصائيات وسنرجع اليها بعد في 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 التوصيات الالتزام السادس هو تعزيز نهج متكامل للمبادرات والإجراءات المتعلقة بالتحول الرقمي من خلال تطوير أدوات ملائمة لتخطيط تكنولوجيا المعلومات والاتصال أستاذ توفيق تفضل تفضل إذا نرحب بالأستاذ سعادة أستاذ الدكتور توفيق جلاسي المدير العام المساعد لمنظمة اليونسكو اليونسكو والمسؤول عن الاتصالات والمعلومات تفضل أستاذ إذا هذه الالتزامات بصفة عامة سيد توفيق يعني وصلت في الوقت المناسب هذا يعني لب المبادرة مبادرة التضامن الرقمي التي تنص على هذه الالتزامات الست والآن التوصيات وأعطي المجال لزميلي ماريو لتقديم 
هذه التوصيات تفضل مريم يس اي ثانك يو اي جو تو بي فيري شورت اند ذا تو اكسبلين ذيس فيرست وي ذا ريكومنديشنز وي انكلود ان ذيس كوميتمنت از تو اسبيكتس فيرست اسبيكت is the recommendation on quantifying the the muashir 4a1 which is related to technology uh, to electric power to internet connection and to uh, uh, computers for students and teachers then we uh, recommend to quantify what is the standard for every country and not to let it as a general idea The other thing is the refinement is related to the fact that we need a very clear and assertive statistics. And for now, there are very different approaches in different regions of the world. Uh, for example, in some countries, they consider one computer uh, connect to internet in one school as 100%. In other countries, is one computer for student. And when we look to the statistics, it's not clear, the United Nations statistics. Then what we are recommending is to be more detailed and more clear in the quantification and the refinements. That's the two ideas. The first uh, uh, topic, which is electric power, there are a number of things. We do, I don't go to, to talk about everything. And the, there are a number of things, which is the power av availability, because sometimes the, the schools have electric power, but it doesn't work during the school hours, or um, the electric consumption is not covered by the budget, then they cannot use it, or they have no ways to recharge the computers. Or then in that, this is very concrete things. That's on the electric power. On the internet, there are two things. Uh, now Giga is doing a, a job. What is meaningful connectivity? not only in the school, but at home, then there are two things which, uh, which need to be guaranteed. One is the band. It needs to be a, a wide band, which uh, the students can uh, follow a video or making a, some kind of work, and they cannot do it very lower band. It's not working. And special in the classroom, when the teachers are work, if the internet is not good work, the teacher feel very frustrated. The students are frustrated. They cannot use... Uh, internet and special in low income and middle income uh, places and the other point is the consumption because sometimes there is a tariff for internet not the band but the, the traffic and the traffic is very low they are starting to work and they have no capacity to finance the the traffic then it's necessary to focus in do these two points what is the meaning full connectivity in terms of band in terms of Uh, traffic and the statistics should tell the politicians, tell to the decision makers what they need to do and what is the situation. That's why we propose the refinements. The, the third and the last point is on the computers. What we recommend is two things. First, we need to know what is a reliable uh, situation for how many computers per student or one to one or Uh, one to how many <laughs> or to two? Okay, uh, we we think one to one is the only way, but we understand this is a process. But we recommend a clarification. What we cannot have is a situation where in one country, one computer in one school of 1,000 students is 100%, and the other that's not clarifying, and there is no standards. And the thing, the other, the last point is. The statistics must be clear. There are big differences in different countries. Then what we recommend here is very easy. Is to, we are not recommending one specific uh, figure, Rakam. <laughs> we are uh, uh, only recommend the definition of a meaningful connectivity, quantification, and a very accurate statistics. Sure. Thank you, thank you very much. Shukran Zazilan. Idan Mario Franco, الذي يعني أعطى أكثر تفاصيل حول التوصيات المتعلقة مثلما أشرت باقتراح أن نقدم يعني أكثر تحديد كمي وأكثر تدقيق بالنسبة للغاية أربعة 
واحد آ وخاصة المتعلقة بالحواسيب والكهرباء والإنترنت إذا شكرا جزيلا والآن نعطي الكلمة للشركاء ونستهل يعني الشريك الأول منظمة اليونسكو سعداء بوجود سعادة الأستاذ الدكتور توفيق جلاسي المدير العام لمنظمة اليونسكو والمسؤول عن قطاع الإعلام والمعلومات والاتصالات تفضل أستاذ الدكتور بروفيسور توفيق جلاسي تفضل شكرا جزيلا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته If you allow me, I will switch to English. Uh, this is my fourth intervention today, and my team did not prepare talking points for me, so I'm going to fully improvise. Uh, we were on other issues today, the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development, media and information literacy, open education resources, and here we talk about providing computers to schools and the digital connectivity. Of course, uh, we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us a major lesson and has served as a wake-up call for all of us. Are we ready to ensure continuous education, continuous learning to pupils, to students all over the world? What lessons have we learned? What lessons have we drawn from the pandemic as to prepare ourselves and be proactive for the future? God forbid there may be other pandemics there may be some natural disasters or other factors that put us in the same situation again. Those who are connected and those who are not connected. Those who are information poor and those who are information rich. But beyond information, those who are knowledge poor and those who are knowledge rich. So of course we talk about digital connectivity or digital divide, but we know also there is not only digital divide, there is a knowledge divide, which is central to our educational effort. So uh, when I was minister in Tunisia a few years ago of uh, higher education, research, and technology, there, is, there was one memorable moment in my whole mandate, a visit I made to a very tiny village. My Tunisian uh, fellows here know it, Burj Al Khadra. This tiny village of less than 200 people is at the extreme south of the country. The nearest town to it is several hundred kilometers away. It had one small school. That school had no internet connectivity. That village had no mobile telephony connectivity, etc., etc. And that visit I made was to connect that tiny village in the extreme south. This village is actually the borderline between Tunisia, Libya, and Algeria. You make few steps south, you are in Libya. A few steps west, you are in Algeria, while you are still in Tunisia. So it's a village to, 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 to mark the borderline, in fact. When I went to that school, and we connected on that day, that school to the internet, I can tell you, the teachers, the kids, were crying out of joy. They heard about the internet, but they have never seen the internet. And when they connected to Wikipedia, when they started doing Google search, for them, now we are citizens. We thought we were second-class citizens. Now we are full-fledged citizens. So education is also about global citizenship. And global citizenship is about digital inclusion and knowledge inclusion. And unfortunately, in my home country, there isn't only one village not connected. There are maybe dozens or hundreds. And in other Arab countries, called the internet. And here comes, thank you, sir. Thank you for your, thank you. Barakalofik, Barakalofik. And, 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 uh, and to, to just close, because I know we have a busy schedule. So just think he closes. No, I, I know you have a busy schedule, but uh, no problem, yeah. I, I thought to share with you, uh, again, some thoughts. So again, the point is that we know that there is no sustainable development without, of course, developing the human capital. And all countries worldwide who may not have natural resources, no oil, no gas, no minerals, but they do have the human resource. 
what type of quality education, what type of uh, uh, brain power can we have, what type of skill set, what type of competencies, because the more we develop them, the better our economy, our society will thrive. But a key point here, and I will close with this, I used to be for 30 plus years professor. And when I teach in some developing countries, I say, this is the textbook I want to use for my course. They tell me, I'm sorry, we are sorry, we cannot use your, this textbook, it costs $120 a copy. I say, okay, let's drop textbooks, let's use case studies. Sorry, we cannot, it, it costs $5 per copy of a case study, per student. So of course, there is another gap, economic gap, financial gap. We cannot afford buying the top quality, up-to-date educational resources. What are we going to do with that? And here comes again the internet connectivity because open educational resources, and this is the 2019 UNESCO recommendation, and all the material developed as the software industry has done it 40 years ago. We used either to pay to buy a software package or we went to open source software, which is license free, which we can use, share, disseminate, develop, Today, of course, open education resources is the open software, open source software of the 70s and the 80s. And then we can be on par with developed countries because that knowledge is up to date, is relevant, is of quality, is available to all. And let me stop here and thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. توفيق جلاسي المدير العام المساعد لمنظمة اليونسكو والوزير الأسبق في الجمهورية التونسية وزير التعليم العالي ووزير كذلك تكنولوجيا المعلومات والاتصال على هذه الكلمة القيمة شكرا جزيلا الآن يعني نواصل كلمة كلمات الشركاء في تنظيم هذه الجلسة ولكن نسمح لي أن أدعو معالي الوزير تفضل <تصفيق> يعني معالي الوزير الدكتور الوزير الدكتور مروان مسعود محمد عورتاني وزير التربية والتعليم وهو رئيس الدورة الحالية لمؤتمر وزراء التربية العرب أرجو معاليك تفضل تفضل في في المنصة في المنصة أوكي والآن يسعدني أن أعطي الكلمة ل ممثل الجمهورية التونسية ممثل معالي الدكتور فتحي أسلوتي وهو سعادة الأستاذ نزار التيرزي مدير مكتب معالي وزير التربية التونسية فليتفضل أستاذ نزار تفضل معالي السيد الدكتور مدير العام للمنظمة المنظمة العربية التربية والعلوم والثقافة ويمثله الدكتور زمينا الدكتور محمد جمني أصحاب المعالى أصحاب المعالي والسعادة رؤساء دول الحكومات السيدات والسادة ممثلي المنظمات والهيئات حضرات السيدات والسادة الحضور الكرام <تصفيق> أود في البداية أن أتوجه بالتحية ونيابة على المعالي الأستاذ الدكتور فتح السلاوي وزير التربية أن أتوجه بالتحية <تصفيق> إلى السيدات والسادة ممثلي الدول العربية بمناسبة مشاركتهم في هذه التظاهرة التي تنظم على هامش فعاليات قمة تحقيق التحول في التعليم المعاقدة في إطار الأسبوع رفيع المستوى للدولة 77 لمنظمة الأمم المتحدة <تصفيق> كما يسعدني أن أنتهز هذه الفرصة لأعبر عن مدى اعتزازي بالمشاركة في هذه التظاهرة التي تعتبر محطة جديدة لتأسيس رؤية مستقبلية لتطوير قطاع التربية والتعليم والتأكيد على الدور الذي على الدور الذي يجب أن تؤديه التربية في بناء المجتمعات الإنسانية وضمان استمرارها خاصة في ظل الوضع الجديد الذي فرضته الأزمة الصحية العالمية الأخيرة <تصفيق> فقد كشفت جائحة كورونا أن استدامة المجتمعات ومناعتها مرتهن بدرجة أولى بالصحة, بالصحة والتربية والأمن الغذائي وأنه لا خيار في عصر هذه التحولات سواء عطاء الأولوية لتطوير التربية في مختلف جوانبه حضرات السيدات وسادة الحضور الكرام لقد واجهت تونس كغيرها من الدول العربية هذا الوضع الاستثنائي هذا الوضع الاستثنائي الذي مرت به المنظومة المنظومات التربوية بقدرات استثنائية ساهمت في التقليل من من تأثيرات هذه الجائحة وتداعياتها على جودة التعليم حيث بينت مختلف مختلف تقارير المتابعة والتقييم التي أنجزها القائمون على الشأن التربوي 
أن هنالك أولويات متأكدة يجب العمل عليها واعتبارها توجهات استراتيجية وضمانات أساسية وجوهرية يجب أن تقوم عليها المنظومة التربوية التونسية لأحداث نقلة نوعية في مفهوم التعليم والأهداف والغايات والأليات ترتكز على أولا ضمان تعليم جيد ومنصف للجميع ثانيا ضمان بيئة تعليمية جاذبة وآمنة ثالثا ضمان التحول الرقمي الشامل للمنظومة التربوية رابعا ضمان تكريس مبادئ الحوكمة الرشيدة وانطلقنا في بلورة هذه التوجهات في شكل برامج عملية من خلال إدراج التعليم ضمن الاستراتيجيات الوطنية للتنمية في إطار رؤية شاملة تونس 2035 مراجعة محتويات البرامج المعتمدة وفق مقاربات جديدة تدعم مبادئ حقوق الإنسان وأهداف التنمية المستدامة تكريس التعليم الجيد والمنصف للجميع وتعزيز آليات مكافحة التسرب وتطوير آليات الإدماج تطوير الحياة المدرسية وجعلها رافدا أساسيا في تنمية مكتسبات التلاميذ وتطوير الأداء التربوي تطوير آليات مقاومة الظواهر المستجدة بالوسط المدرسي وترسيخ مفهوم التربية على تعزيز منظومة التعليم عن بعد وتوظيف التكنولوجيات الحديثة والوسائط التعليمية لإرساء بيئة تعليمية عصرية تكريس مبادئ الحوكمة الرشيدة وتعزيز نظم وتعزيز نظم مراقبة النظام التعليمي وتقييمه وتطوير أدوات التعاقد والبرمجة ابتكار طرق تمويل جديدة ومستحدثة وتنمية ثقافة ريادة الأعمال وتشجيع بعث مشاريع مدرسية مبتكرة حضرات السيدات وسادة الحضور الكرام إن رسالة التربية رسالة عظيمة لبناء الأفراد والمجتمعات وترسيخ القيم الإنسانية نبيلة وكلنا يعي المخاطر الأخرى التي ما زالت تهدد الدول والشعوب من عنف وإرهاب وتطرف وفقر وبطالة وهجرة غير شرعية إلى آخره والتي أفرزت صورا مشوهة لحضارتنا وثقافتنا وعقيدتنا وتاريخنا وهويتنا وكياننا وأحدثت شروخا في العلاقات الدولية بين كل الأطراف وجعلتنا أمام اختبارات صعبة وتحديات كثيرة ويحتاج عالمنا اليوم أكثر من أي وقت مضى إلى وضع استراتيجية محكمة لتطوير سياساتنا التربوية والثقافية والعلمية والاتصالية والمعلوماتية والانخراط بصفة فعالة وجدة في التوجهات العالمية بما يؤهلنا للمشاركة الإيجابية في الحضارة الإنسانية فأمانة التربية هي أمانة المستقبل وهي مسؤولية كبرى تجاه أجيال الناشئة ويجب أن نطلع بها بكل التزام في عالم سريع التحولات وعميق التغييرات أو التغيرات وشديد المنافسة مما يستدعي من جميع مضاعفة الجهود وتقويم العزم لكسب التحديات واستحكام ناصية المعرفة ونحن نعول على تجارب وخبرات الجامعة العربية وأجهزتها المتخصصة على رأسها المنظمة العربية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم أريكسو التي تعتبر بيت الخبرة العربي والإطار الأمثل لتعزيز العمل العربي المشترك بفضل ما قدمته الدول الأعضاء من إضافات نوعية لتطوير التربية والثقافة والعلوم وفي هذا الإطار أهيب بكل الوفود المشاركة وبالمنظمات العربية والإقليمية والدولية لتعزيز تنسيق الجهود ودعم التعاون المشترك بين الجميع لتطوير منظومة التربية والتعليم بكل مكوناتها وتوفير كل الدعم لأداء رسالتها على أكمل وجه حتى تكون النتائج في مستوى التطلعات حضرات السيدات وسادة الحضور الكرام أسعدني في ختام كلمتي أن أعرب لكم عن استعداد تونس لمد جسور التعاون المشترك بين الدول والمنظمات والجمعيات ودعمها المتواصل للعمل المشترك بين الجميع لإيماننا الراسخ بأن مثل هذه التظاهرات الإقليمية والدولية تظل الفضاء الأنسب لمناقشة القضايا المشتركة وإيجاد الحلول المناسبة كما لا يسعني في النهاية أو في نهاية هذه الكلمة أن أجدد لأن أجدد شكري لكم جميعا والقائمين على تنظيم هذا الاجتماع والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. شكرا شكرا جزيلا. سعادة الأستاذ نزار الترزي مدير مكتب معالي وزير التربية بالجمهورية التونسية شكرا جزيلا على هذه الكلمة القيمة وشكرا على دعم تونس لهذه المبادرة. اسمحوا لي أن أرحب بمعالي الأستاذ الدكتور مصطفى 
محمد محمود وزير التربية والتكوين من جمهورية جيبوتي وكذلك الذي التحق بنا الآن وكذلك سعادة السيد الدكتور عبد الرحمن بن محمد العاصمي مدير عام مكتب التربية لدول الخليج والذي كذلك التحق بنا الآن نظرا لمشاركتهما في جلسات أخرى موازية إذا نواصل تقديم الشركاء الذين ساهموا في أعداد هذه الجلسة ونمر إلى ممثل المملكة الهاشمية الأردنية وسعادة الأستاذة ابتسام عقاب أيوب أمينة اللجنة الوطنية الأردنية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم فلتتفضلي مشكورة شكرا أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الحضور الكريم يسرني أن ألتقي بكم اليوم في هذه الفعالية الموازية لقمة تحويل التعليم 2022 وأنقل لكم تحيات معالي وزير التربية والتعليم والتعليم العالي والبحث العلمي الأستاذ الدكتور وجيع عويس متمنين تحقيق أهدافها المرجوة والخروج بنتائج مثمرة لتطوير قطاع التعليم في العالم العربي والنهوض به فانطلاقا من أهدافنا الوطنية والتزامنا بضرورة مواءمة نظام التعليم الوطني بشقيه العام والعالي بما يتفق وأجندة التعليم لعام 2030 المستمدة من الهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة التعليم الجيد قامت المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية من خلال جميع الوزارات والمؤسسات المعنية بقطاع التعليم باتخاذ كافة الإجراءات العملية التي تكفل تنفيذ غايات الهدف الرابع وبشراكة موسعة مع جميع الشركاء وأصحاب المصلحة المعنيين على المستوى الوطني وكذلك المنظمات الدولية ذات العلاقة وحرصت المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية على المشاركة في كافة الفعاليات الإقليمية والدولية التي تعنى بالهدف الرابع وضعت المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية استراتيجية وطنية لتنمية الموارد البشرية للأعوام من 2016 ل 2025 تعنى بتطوير قطاع التعليم الأساسي والتعليم العالي والتدريب المهني والتقني ومتوافقة مع الغيات المنبثقة عن الهدف الرابع وبمؤشرات قابلة للقياس لبيان التقدم المحرز وفي بداية العام 2020 وأيضا تم مواءمة الخطة الاستراتيجية لوزارة التربية والتعليم مع غايات الهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة كما أصدرت اللجنة الوطنية الأردنية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم التقرير الوطني الأول لرصد التقدم المحرز في الهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة للأعوام من 2015 إلى 2019 وكذلك متابعة رصد مؤشرات الهدف الرابع ضمن مصفوفة دورية بدأت منذ العام 2015 ولغاية 2021 كما شكلت اللجنة الوطنية الأردنية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم لجانة دائمة لمتابعة مدى التقدم بالهدف الرابع فشكل الفريق الوطني للتعليم بحلول عام 2030 وتم تشكيل عدة لجان فرعية متخصصة أصحاب المعالي الحضور الكريم أدت جائحة كورونا إلى ظهور فجوة رقمية حالت دون مواكبة الطلبة للتعليم عن بعد بسبب عدم القدرة على الوصول إلى الإنترنت وضعف الإنترنت وانقطاعه وزيادة عدد الطلبة المتسربين من التعليم بسبب نقص الأدوات التكنولوجية والأجهزة المتاحة للطلبة للتعليم عن بعد كما ظهرت مشكلة الفاقد التعليمي وإدراكا من النظام التعليمي الأردني للآثار المترتبة على ظهور جائحة كورونا والتحديات المترتبة على تعذر استمرار التعليم في المدارس والجامعات وكليات المجتمع وجاهيا عملت وزارة التربية والتعليم والتعليم العالي على استمرار تعلم الطلبة في المدارس والجامعات عن بعد من خلال بناء منصات ففي وزارة التربية والتعليم تم إنشاء منصة درسك وتقديم الحصص التعليمية من خلال القنوات التلفزيونية وتدريب المعلمين على استخدام أدوات التعلم عن بعد وحرصا من وزارة التعليم العالي والبحث العلمي على استمرار التعليم في الجامعات وكليات المجتمع تم العمل على تفعيل منظومة التعليم عن بعد من خلال تقديم المحاضرات عبر المنصات التعليمية وإقرار نظام وتعليمات خاصة بإدماج التعليم الإلكتروني في مؤسسات التعليم العالي 
لوضعه ضمن إطار قانوني وتشريعي وخطة عمل تنفيذية للأعوام من 2021-2023 لإدماج ومأسسة التعليم الألكتروني المدمج ليصبح جزءا من المنظومة التعليمية التعلمية في المؤسسات التعليم العالي وضبطه وتنظيمه وفق نسق مشترك ودعم التعليم الإلكتروني بشكليه الكامل والمدمج أصحاب المعالي الحضور الكريم عملت وزارة التربية والتعليم بالتعاون مع الشركاء على توزيع أجهزة الحاسوب اللوحي التابلت على المدارس خلال جائحة كورونا وتحديث مختبرات الحاسوب وتنفيذ برامج الفاقد التعليمي بهدف تعزيز المفاهيم والنتاجات الأساسية لدى الطلبة وتنفيذ برامج جسور التعلم بالتعاون مع منظمة اليونيسف كبرنامج تعليم مدمج ومبتكر أسهم في مساعدة الطلبة على إنعاش تعلمهم وتسريعه بعد الظروف الاستثنائية المتعلقة بجائحة كورونا ومن أبرز التوصيات للمرحلة المقبلة الحاجة إلى تطوير إطار متكامل لمحطات التقويم تتماشى مع كافة المراحل التعليمية للنظام التعليمي وتحسين أداء الطلبة الأردنيين في الامتحانات الدولية وتوحيد الجهود المتعلقة بالتعليم المهني تحت مظلة واحدة ليحقق التعليم المهني الأهداف المنشودة المتمثلة برفض سوق العمل باحتياجاته من الأيدي العاملة للمساهمة بتعزيز الاقتصاد الوطني وتحقيق التنمية المستدامة هذا بالإضافة إلى العمل على تطوير نموذج شراكة مستدام ماليا وفنيا بين القطاع التعليمي والقطاع الخاص لزيادة نسبة الكفاءة المؤسسية ومهارات العاملين والمعلمين والمشاركة المجتمعية لضمان تطوير البنية التحتية لقطاع التعلم المبكر وتنمية الطفولة وتوفير فرص وصول لجميع الأطفال في الأردن لمستوى أساسي من الخدمات وكذلك عملت وزارة التربية والتعليم على مواءمة برامج تأهيل المعلمين من قبل الخدمة مع الحاجة للقوى البشرية التعليمية وملاءمة التخصصات المهنية بحسب المناطق الجغرافية وأيضا التوسع في تنفيذ برنامج التعليم غير النظامي لتوفير التعلم للأميين والمتسربين وتحسين البنية التحتية والتكنولوجية للجامعات وتطوير وتعزيز استخدام الموارد المفتوحة وتبني أفضل الممارسات الدولية وتعزيز الابتكار في التدريس والتعليم ودمج التكنولوجيا في عملية التدريس وضمان وصول الطلبة للتكنولوجيا وختاما أكرر شكري للأليكسو ولكم جميعا على اهتمامكم في سبيل تطوير التعليم والنهوض به في العالم العربي مؤكدين على دعمنا لمبادرة التضامن الرقمي أجهزة حاسوب متصلة بالإنترنت للتعليم والتعلم للجميع آملين أن يتم تعزيز هذه المبادرة من خلال إيجاد شركاء جدد بهدف تحقيقها والتوسع عند تطبيقها شكرا لكم شكرا شكرا جزيلا سعادة أستاذة ابتسام يعقوب على هذه الكلمة الجيدة والقيمة أستاذ الأستاذ دكتور توفيق جلاسي يعني يستأذن لأنه عنده التزام لجلسة أخرى شكرا سعادة البروفيسور وأطلب من معالي الأستاذ الدكتور مصطفى محمد محمود فليتفضل مع الوزير في المنصة بجانبنا تفضل مع الوزير ثم الآن إذا نواصل تقديم الشركاء قبل أن نعطي التدخلات ما زالت هل هناك يعني ممثل موريتانيا تفضل كلمة موجزة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أولا لم أقوم بتحضير أي كلمة نظرا لأن معالي وزير التعليم كان سيكون موجودا بيننا الآن ولكن نتيجة لظروف قاهرة لم يستطع في آخر لحظة تغيير برنامجه نتيجة لظروف قاهرة في آخر لحظة وبالتالي نيابة عن وزير التعليم أشكركم على تنظيم هذا اللقاء الذي لا شك سيكون لبنة في مجال التعليم وتحقيق الهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة كما أود أن أشكر المنظمة العربية بشكل خاص للتربية والثقافة والعلوم على العمل القيم الذي تقوم به في بلادنا وأذكر من بين الأنشطة التي قامت بها للحصر الدراسة القيم التي قامت بها في مجال العوامل المؤثرة 
على التعليم القاعدي والتي تبرز أهمية تقديم دروس تقوية في المواد التعليمية للتلاميذ في المرحلة الابتدائية وخاصة في مادة الرياضيات وكذلك ما قامت به أشكر ما قامت به منظمة الألفية للتعليم المستديم من تقديم حواسيب تعليمية طبعا بالتعاون مع الاسكو للتلاميذ في المرحلة الابتدائية وفي الأخير ودعاء نعبر عن مدى استعداد بلادنا واستعدادنا في موريتانيا مواصلة العمل المشترك مع المنظمة العربية والثقافة والعلوم والمنظمة التعليم الألفية للتعليم المستديم شكرا 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 جزيلا ممثل معالي الاستاذ الدكتور محمد اللامين ولد ابي ولد الشيخ الحضرمي وزير التربيه والتعليم والبحث العلمي بجمهوريه موريتانيا الاسلاميه شكرا جزيلا وفي الحقيقه يعني نشكر كافه المتدخلين الذين ساندوا هذه المبادره وهناك يعني لامضاء المشاركين والمساندين لهذه المبادرة فزميلي الدكتور رامي ومايك سيقومان بعرض يعني الوثيقة لأمضاء الوزارات والمؤسسات والمنظمات التي تساند هذه المنظمة إذا الآن هل هناك ممثل وزارة المغرب نظن تعذر عليهم القدوم لذلك نفتح الآن المجال للمداخلات يعني بعد المرحلة الأولى الفترة الأولى قدمنا الشركاء في تنظيم هذه الجلسة والآن يسعدني أن نستهل باب التدخلات بكلمة معالي الأستاذ الدكتور مروان مسعود محمد عورتاني وزير التربية والتعليم بفلسطين فليتفضل مشكورة ثم سنفتح المجال مباشرة أن نعرف كذلك معالي الأستاذ الدكتور العاصمي كذلك عنده التزام آخر ف مباشرة بعد معالي الوزير يتفضل معالي الاستاذ الدكتور العاصمي تفضل معالي الوزير شكرا دكتور مش متاكد احكي بالانجليزي ولا بالعربي شو رايك دكتور انت شو رايك ادفايس العربي انا تمام واقع الحال يعني عنوان شكرا على التنظيم هذه الندوه او اللقاء الموضوع محدد اللي هو موضوع الكونكتيفيتي والانترنت وال يعني الديفايسز وما بحكي عن عموم التعليم المدمج والتعليم الرقمي والموارد المفتوحه بحكي عن تكنولوجي بالذات هلا هذا مهم لفت نظري بكل بساطه انه فاهمين ما في انسان بيختلف انه بدنا لكل طالب آه لو يعني تمكننا ديفايس معينه بمواصفات مناسبه للغايه اللي هي التعلم وبدنا كونكتيفيتي مناسبه آه انترنت مناسب كهرباء مناسبه كل هذا الكلام باكج واضح يعني ما بزبط تكون عندي تابلت بدون انترنت آه انترنت بدون كهرباء يعني فاهمين خلينا نقول انه اللي عملناه بفلسطين احنا اوريدي ب اطار الكورونا 2020 في البدايه عملنا استجابه للحال مسح وطني لكل مدارس فلسطين فعملنا اوديت لكل مدرسه في الاغوار في وراء الجدار بالاستيطان كل الكلام هذا حصرنا بالضبط شو لسان الحال بالنسبه ل سبحان الله نفس البارامترز اللي حاطينها الكاباسيتي بيلدينغ والتشريع اللازم غيره، شيء تمام ثاني مختلف اللي بسميه انا اكسترناليتيز في فلسطين لسان الحال زي كل مظاهر ومساحات التعليم في فلسطين الاكسترناليتي الاثقل ظلا هي الاحتلال الاسرائيلي. السبب انه وين ما تروح شو ما تعمل قدامك في اي مسار في اي مبتغى هيو ماثل قدامك يعني جبل ما يهزك ريح على ما يبدو فبالتالي الانترنت صعب لانه بخلوا الامر هذا صعب 
اللاند لاين بالشركات الاتصالات اللي هي البزنس الكوربريتس كمان صعب موضوع اقتناء الديفايسز صعب فحتى موضوع الموبايل مثلا غزه لليوم 2G شو رح تعمل ب 2G؟ وفي الضفه الغربيه 3G شو رح تعمل ب 3G؟ لما تحكي عن ليرنينج uh, انفايرمنت هالقد فيها بتعرف يعني حيويه وضغط باتجاهات معينه وبالتالي في امبيدمنتس في في كوابح لتبني هاي المبادره او تطبيق هاي المبادره اللي هي اكسترنال تو ذا ناشونال بارامترز ولهيك موضوع تحويل التعليم في كل واحد من الخمس محاور ما ممكن يعطي عين مغمضه او تولند بلايند اي لسان الحال بانه طب كيف؟ طب كل انت بدك انت سيف اكسس ما فيش مدرسه سيف بكل فلسطين على الاطلاق ما ببالغ فيش كل مدرسه مستهدفه في اذا مش اليوم بكره أو يعني وبالتالي مهم انه ننزل للواقع ونخاطب الامور كما هي اذا بدك انت والله اكسس انكلوجن وممنوع تبني غرفة صفية بالأغوار بدك سنتين تأخذ ترخيص لغرفة روضة أطفال سنتين طب كيف عن إيش تحكي يعني و و و الأمر هذا بأخذ مجا يعني بمتد لكل المساحات وبالتالي حبيت بس أنا أحط ضوء معين على تحديات منه آخر مش مألوف للدول اللي بتعيش في وضع عادنا وعنا حتى الأمور المالية آخر نهار بدك انت تحط يعني مصاري تمويل مناسب بتقول لي طيب ما الفلسطيني عندهم مصاري وهيك فاين بس واقع الحال ايضا اسف انه الظل الاثقل والاطول هو الاحتلال مصادره اموالنا حصار مالي مستدام هل قد في تذبذب وخلخله للامن المالي والاقتصادي بفلسطين قيود على الاستيراد وعلى التصدير ومصادرات عدم ترخيص المقاصة اللي هي مالنا اه لا لا اه وبالتالي عندنا وضع هالقد دلكت وحرج خاصة في اطار سياسي دولي كما تعلمون في الكورونا وقبل ذلك فرض حصار مال على فلسطين ولا قرش دير بالكم يعني ما بدي احكي تفاصيل بس الكل سكر ها بعاز من جهة معروفة بالكون فسكروا المصاري عن فلسطين لا كل اللي بحكيه انه هذا بيعني إنه فلسطين عندها مستوى آخر من التحديات والتعقيدات نحن منضمون لهي المبادرة مية في المية سأوقع مية في المية ها؟ و... وفلسطين لن تدخر جهد أبدا يعني ربنا شاهد سنعمل كل ما يجب عمله ونعمل المستحيل as we always do لأنه عندنا إحنا منع وريزيليانس منقطع النظير بدعي لكن في اخر النهار حبيت اقول لكم انه مش كل شيء بين ايدينا، مش كل مش كل شيء قرار سيادي وطني. حب حب اشارككم بامر اذا بتسمح لي سعادتك ما زال عندنا 15 دقيقه والمتدخلين اكثر، دقيقه اكثر طيب. على كرمال طيب. كرمال معنا طيب. طيب ماشي آه فانا اللي بحكي اذا هيك ساختصر ما راح احكي عن اللي كنت بدي اشارككم فيه <تصفيق> بس اللي بقوله انا بتحداني نوعا ما فكريا البزنس موديل يا اخي الكلام هذا كلام كبير يعني بتفاهم علي كلام كبير للغايه تعمل تصنيع محلي تعمل فرص عمل البزنس موديل اللي مش واضح قلبته كذا مره كمات بروفيسور حتى مش كوزير مش راكب فانا بتحداكم تفرجوني هاو از فيزيبل مش عارف هاي شكرا شكرا معالي الوزير شكرا على هذه الكلمه القيمة والذي تعرض فيها للتحديات التحديات الرقمية والتحديات المضاعفة في فلسطين ورفع تحدي آخر البزنس موديل وسنشتغل عليه إن شاء الله إذا يسعدني الآن أن أعطي الكلمة إلى سعادة الأستاذ الدكتور عبد الرحمن بن محمد العاصمي مدير عام مكتب التربية لدول الخليج فلتتفضل معالي المدير العام في ثلاث دقائق لو سمحت لانه ما زال عندنا اقل من 15 دقيقه والمتحدثين كثار تفضل. خاتم النبيين اصحاب المعالي والسعاده ايها الحضور الكرام السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمه الله وبركاته. يسعدني اليوم ان امثل مكتب التربيه العربي لدول الخليج في هذه الجلسه التي تتحدث عن مبادره التضامن الرقمي 
التي ينظمها زملائنا وشركائنا في المنظمة العربية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم وأقول الحقيقة بكل ثقة نحن في مكتب التربية العربي ندعم بكل قوة هذه المبادرة مبادرة الأسكو التي تأتي أهم الحقيقة المبادرات في هذا الوقت وهي من المبادرات الداعمة لمؤشرات الهدف الرابع من أهداف التنمية المستدامة بل أن رؤية مكتب التربية العربي كذلك تؤكد الحقيقة على ما يعني تنتهي إليه هذه المبادرة من أهمية التوسع في المكتبات الرقمية وتطوير الخدمات وزيادة الإنتاج العربي والمحتوى العربي بالشبكة العنكبوتية عن طريق التاليف والترجمة ونحن يعني في مكتب التربية العربي نسعى لتحقيق هذا الهدف فلدينا الحقيقة خطة سنوية في ترجمة العديد من الكتب القيمة في مسارات مختلفة ومتنوعة في مجالات التعليم ونترجمها إلى اللغة العربية ويسعد الحقيقة مكتب التربية العربي بأن يكون الحقيقة تكون هذه المصادر متاحة أيضا عبر مكتبات المنظمة العربية منها المكتبات التقليدية أو كذلك المكتبات الرقمية بالتأكيد أنه هذه المبادرة يعني أتت في وقت مهم جدا وخاصة الجميع الحقيقة شاهد في أثناء جائحة كورونا يعني ماذا حدث و الحقيقة التحول بشكل سريع والاعتماد على هذه التقنية في إصال رسالة التعليم إلى كل طالب وطالبة وبالتأكيد ظهر هناك الحقيقة الكثير من المنصات والكثير من القنوات التلفزيونية التي أدت إلى هذا الغرض اليوم الحقيقة هذه المبادرة بلا شك يعني تدعم هذا التوجه وتسعى إلى توزيعه لكنني أقول نحن بحاجة إلى قنوات تقدم هذه الدروس التعليمية بطرق مهنية ليست بالطرق التقليدية التي تقدم داخل الحجرة الدراسية لكن هذه الدروس يجب بالفعل أن تكون مناسبة وملائمة أن تقدم الحقيقة عبر هذه المنصات بشكل مهني وبشكل احترافي بالتأكيد يعني أنا أدعو الحقيقة المنظمة إلى بلورة رؤية عربية مشتركة متكاملة للاستفادة من مبادرات والاستفادة من نجاحات التي تحققت لدى بعض الدول كذلك أدعو إلى دراسة مقترح حول صندوق للتعليم وتشجيع الوقف التعليمي بين الدول العربية ولعل الحقيقة أيضا قد يكون من المناسب دعوة الجهات المانحة كالبنك الإسلامي وربما المؤسسات والمنظمات الغير ربحية للحقيقة التحول إلى مبادرة ومشاريع خطة تنفيذية لها مؤشرات مزمنة وتمول الحقيقة هذه المبادرة الجانب الآخر الذي يعني نسعى إليه ويجب الحقيقة أن تركز عليه هذه المبادرة هي قضية الحرص على تدريب المعلمين أثناء الخدمة على هذا النوع من هذه التقنية لأنه فاقد الشيء لا يعطيه وبالتالي من الأهمية في مكان أن يكون هؤلاء يتلقون الحقيقة فرص جيدة في تنمية مهاراتهم في تنمية قدراتهم في كيفية الحقيقة التعامل كيفية يصار رسالة التعليم التدريس كيفية إعطاء المهام كيفية أداء الاختبارات من خلال هذه المنصات وبطريقة مختلفة ما نريد أن نقدمه طريقة التدريس في هذه المنصات يجب أن تختلف عن الطريقة التقليدية كذلك تعزيز التدريب أثناء الخدمة فالحقيقة البرامج التي تقدم ورأينا الحقيقة أنه هناك كان ربما بعض الفجوات أثناء استخدام هذه التقنية أثناء جائحة كورونا وبالتالي أعتقد أنه من الأهمية كذلك الحرص على تدريب أهم تدريب المعلمين أثناء الخدمة بلا شك الحقيقة كلنا يعني شركاء وندعم هذه المبادرة وأنا جدا سعيد بأن أشارك المنظمة العربية والحقيقة نحن هدفنا دائما والقواتم المشتركة بيننا كثيرة فأكرر شكري وتقديري لمعالي الدكتور محمد ولد الأعمر ولك دكتور ولكل الحقيقة أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الحضور الذين شاركوا في هذه الجلسة متمنيا إن شاء الله لهذه المبادرة كل نجاح وكل توفيق بإذن الله إن شاء الله شكرا لكم جميعا السلام عليكم دول الخليج على هذه الكلمة القيمة وكذلك على التوصيات الهامة والاقتراحات ال جيدة والتي سنعمل إن شاء الله سويا على تنفيذها الأكس وتربيطها يعني علاقات كبيرة مع مكتب تربية الخليج وشراكة دائمة ومستمرة وسنعمل سويا إن شاء الله هناك يعني الأمضاء على المبادرة ودعم المبادرة يعني ندعو كافة يعني الشركاء لأمضاء على 
مساند هذه المبادرة والأمضاء يعني ليس فيه التزام مالي بقدر ما هو التزام للعمل سويا على تحقيق أهداف هذه المبادرة إذا يسعدني الآن أن أدعو معالي الأستاذ الدكتور مصطفى محمد محمود وزير التربية والتكوين المهني بجمهورية جيبوتي لإلقاء كلمته فليتفضل يعني احنا مازال عنا عشر دقائق ومازال عنا العديد من المتدخلين دقيقتين معالي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان شاء الله باذنكم ان شاء الله اريد ان اتكلم باللغه الفرنسيه جو فودغي دون ان بريمي تون فريمون ريميرسي اليسكو اي سون بارتينير الميلينيوم بور لورغانيزاسيون دو سيت ايفينمون سي ساجي بيان سور دان ايفينمون كي اي très importante surtout en ce moment où nous traversons euh, une période de crise euh, euh, dans, dans le monde et notamment en matière d'éducation. Je voudrais aussi euh, profiter de cette occasion euh, pour vraiment remercier Alesco qui a soutenu le ministère de l'éducation nationale euh, à l'époque euh, de, euh, de la pandémie du Covid. Comme vous le savez très bien, euh, le Covid a touché euh, Djibouti comme tous les autres pays. Nous avons fermé euh, les, les écoles pendant un mois et demi et pendant ces un mois et demi, euh, grâce à, à, à Alesco qui a, a mobilisé euh, son partenaire Classra, euh, qui nous a accompagnés pour qu'il euh, puisse être effectif euh, l'enseignement des, des, des élèves à travers les, 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 à travers les ce qu'on appelle les, les classes euh, les, les classrooms. Et c'est directement depuis les, les, les classrooms que les enseignants pouvaient transmettre les messages et les enseignements aux élèves. Et, et, et donc, vraiment, euh, le résultat est extraordinaire. Contrairement à ce que nous avions euh, pu croire euh, ou penser que la pandémie allait faire baisser le, le niveau euh, de, de, de la réussite des élèves. Mais euh, Madame l'inspectrice générale, qui me prend en photo là-bas, euh, connaît très bien la, la, la situation, Madame, Madame Mouna, les résultats ont été excellents. Parce que, justement, nous avons utilisé cet outil, qui est l'outil numérique, qui est bien sûr classera, les élèves ont suivi, les parents ont soutenu également leurs élèves à l'utilisation de ces outils. C'est vrai que cela a été vrai à Djiboutiville, mais dans les régions, c'était moindre, donc on était obligé également d'utiliser d'autres formats. Aussi, je voulais remercier l'organisation Alesco pour l'accompagnement qu'ils ont, ont fait dans la formation de nos enseignants. Ils ont formé également nos enseignants à l'utilisation de cet outil numérique, mais également à, à cette formation de formateurs qui eux-mêmes euh, euh, forment également les, les enseignants pour transmettre de la meilleure manière en utilisant l'outil informatique. Donc à Djibouti, euh, nous avons cette chance, hein, contrairement à d'autres pays, il y a à peu près huit câbles qui traversent Djibouti, des télécommunications. Et nous avons euh, à Djibouti un débit au niveau Internet qui est, qui est très fort. Donc euh, nous profitons et en nous, faisant profiter, nous, nous faisons profiter nos élèves à, cette, à cet outil numérique qui est indispensable. Juste pour finir, je vais, je vais, nous avons entrepris un projet, un projet où nous allons, Inch'Allah, transformer toutes nos salles de classe euh, en Smart Classroom. Nous allons donc à peu près chaque année, 250 salles de classe vont être transformées de, de, de classe ordinaire en classe numérique avec un tableau intelligent. Les, les élèves auront des mini, des mini laptops et des, et des laptops. Et d'ailleurs, Alesco nous a fait un don de 4000 4 tablettes cette année. Nous l'avons reçu et ils sont inchallah effectifs euh, cette année. Donc, ce projet, c'est un projet qui va continuer sur 4 ans où toutes les salles de classe, parce que Djibouti, c'est un petit pays. Et il faut se dire la vérité, avec une population de moins de 1 million d'habitants, on peut toucher à peu près tous ces pays. Mais aussi, ce qu'il faut dire que ce projet de transformation numérique et à travers les enseignements apprentissage permet également indirectement de, de relever les compétences aussi bien des élèves, mais les compétences, les compétences des enseignants, mais également la création de petites et moyennes entreprises en matière d'entrepreneuriat. Et c'est justement, euh, c'est pour ça que nous sommes très proches de ce que euh, propose et des modèles que propose bien sûr Millennium et, et son, bien sûr, le partenaire Alesco. Merci encore. Je sais que
الذين تعلموا بال بالسكولا الفرنسي على عشان كذا عربي حقي ليش تمام لكن اسكوز مي اي ام فيري فيري سوري بت ذا بروبليم از ذا بروبليم ان شاء الله مي نو افون ترانسفورمي مينون نو افون ان بروغرام ان شاء الله او لي جينيراسيون فيتور يورا لانسينيمون دو لا لانغ اراب باسكو لاراب ايتي انسيني كوم جوست لانغ مي ايغالمون لي انسينيمون سي فيرون ان لانغ اراب دو لا بروميير اني جوست كوم كلاس دي تيرمينال نو زي ترافايو يا لا سكو نو اكومباني بور سا ميرسي ان شاء الله شكرا شكرا جزيلا معالي الوزير في الحقيقه معالي الوزير اشار انه جيبوتي بلد صغير ممكن صغير يعني بعدد السكان وبالجغرافيا ولكن هو عدد هو بلد كبير بالانجازات والانجازات التي تفضل بذكرها حقيقه كبيره تفضل معالي الوزير بذكر شركائنا في مبادره أليكس للتعليم الالكتروني ومناسبه لكي احييهم احيي مؤسسه كلاسيرا للتعليم الالكتروني والتي مكنت بفضل شراكه مع أليكس والعديد من الدول من منصه للتعليم الالكتروني كذلك مؤسسه كلاسين الصينيه وكذلك شركائنا ميلينيوم انتل وجي بي لاهداء وتمكين بعض الدول من اجهزه حواسيب احنا في الحقيقه يعني وصلنا للنهايه ولكن احنا بدانا اخذنا القاعه متاخرين ب 5 و10 دقائق سناخذ 5 و10 دقائق عندنا ثلاثه مداخلات او اربعه سنبدا بالسيد اسماعيل فرجيه المدير التنفيذي لمؤسسه محمد السادس لحمايه البيئه من المغرب استاذ اسماعيل فرجيه لو سمحت في دقيقتين لانه هناك ثلاث مداخلات بعدك تفضل the organizers of this event for inviting us in taking part in this uh, interesting event which addresses the core of the challenges to transform education and indeed having an infrastructure for education is the most important thing. Uh, it, this, this commitment actually helps us and boosts us as other stakeholders uh, such as the Mohammed Zek Foundation for Environmental Protection that for 20 years have been engaged in educating for sustainable development and actually trying to achieve what we have, uh, the, the, the work of digital inclusion and making, uh, and making individuals uh, reach uh, the digital aspect of education because the main challenge is to, to stay in this era is to be digitally included. Uh, and through our different programs uh, and through our academic branch, the Hassan II International Center for, for Environmental Training, we try to operationalize this through different programs, our eco schools programs, our uh, global schools programs, uh, where we try to uh, give access to young children in the rural areas to internet and actually to, uh, to educate themselves through uh, online learning. And we are also reaching out to the regional level by building online courses and our first work on, on climate literacy, where we try to achieve and give this access to online courses through, uh, to everyone in, uh, um, in the world, uh, such as the word that was said by the UNESCO, where we try to have this open source data and knowledge that we try to achieve so individuals could connect and actually uh, uh, learn about, uh, about climate education uh, as a whole. Uh, for a final word, uh, again, as thinking this commitment and, and supporting it and witnessing the engagement of, uh, of countries uh, to do it, there's one point that I need to state, uh, which makes me very happy because I'm the only youth representative in this panel, so I'm very glad about it. And the second thing, which is a response to Mr. Uh, Minister of Education of Palestine, uh, if you have a problem with the business model, include youth in the process and you will definitely get a response. <laughs> Thank you. شكرا شكرا جزيلا السيد اسماعيل فرجيه المدير التنفيذي لمؤسسه جلاله الملك محمد السادس لحمايه البيئه والعمل الكبير التي تقوم به هذه المؤسسه من استخدام المنصات الالكترونيه ونشر التعليم وخاصه التوعيه بحمايه البيئه. ما زال عندنا مداخلتين يسعدني ان ادعو سعاده الدكتور احلام العرفاوي رئيسه المنظمه الدوليه للحوكمه المحليه ثم سعاده الدكتوره منى العروسي مديره بمنظمه الفرنكوفونيه يعني المداخلتين الاخيرتين دكتوره احلام في دقيقتين 
شكرا أصحاب المعالي والسعادة حضرات السيدات والسادة الضيوف حضرات السيدات والسادة الحضور طبعا مداخلتي ستكون باللغة العربية بطلب من صديقي الدكتور محمد الجمني في البداية يسعدني أن أتوجه إلى منظمة الأليكسو بأحر عبارات الشكر والتقدير على هذه الدعوة وعلى هذه المبادرة وكيفة الشركاء في مبادرة التضامن الرقمي في الحقيقة كل ما يقال قد قيل بخصوص حاجة المجتمع الدولي اليوم إلى مبادرة مثل هذه تضمن الحق في التعليم ولكن اليوم سأتكلم بصفة رئيسة المنظمة الدولية للحوكمة المحلية وهي شريك منذ أربع سنوات مع منظمة العربية للتربية والثقافة والعلوم وكانت لنا عدة برامج تدريبية معا في عدة دول وهذا شرف للمنظمة وأيضا كمراقبة دولية لحقوق الإنسان ورئيسة منظمة المراقبين الدوليين لحقوق الإنسان بأمريكا وأيضا كمستشارة لحقوق الإنسان بالمعهد الامريكي للدبلوماسيه وحقوق الانسان ويشرفني ان استقبل اليوم وارحب بضيفنا السيد مانويل الذي هو رئيس المعهد الامريكي للدبلوماسيه وحقوق الانسان ومقره واشنطن والذي التحق بنا اليوم لدعم هذه المبادره ايضا مرحبا بك يو ار ويلكم اذا في البدايه الحقيقه ساتكلم اليوم عن دور المجتمع المدني واهم الدور واهم الدور المهم للمجتمع المدني في دعم هذه المبادره اثبتت جائحه كوفيد التي مرت بنا 2020 و2021 ان الحكومات بمفردها لا يمكن ان تقدم الاضافه خاصه في اداره الازمات وانه سيظل دائما لديها محدوديه اما محدوديه ماليه او محدوديه أو أيضا محدودية في الموارد البشرية وأثبتت جائحة كوفيد أن الهدف 17 من أهداف التنمية المستدامة عالمنا 2030 هو فعلا كما تم التنصيص عليه في أهداف التنمية المستدامة عالمنا 2030 جاء ليلخص كل الأهداف السابقة الستة عشر هدفا حيث نص صراحة على أنه لا يمكن تحقيق أي هدف من أهداف التنمية المستدامة إلا بشراكة حقيقية بين الحكومات وبين الخ وبين منظمات المجتمع المدني ومن هنا كنت أتمنى أن أرى اليوم حضور لبعض الشركات الخاصة على غرار مايكروسوفت على غرار اللي هما شركاء معنا في المنظمة لأنه لا ي... لأن محتاجين جدا إلى هذا الدعم فالمجتمع المدني اليوم دوره هو سيكون إما دعم لوجستي في توفير هذه الـ الـ الآليات سواء لتابلات أو الحواسيب في خاصة في الدول العربية وفي الدول التي تحتاج لأنه فعلا كما تحدث السيد توفيق كنا في حاجة أثبتت جائحة كوفيد أنه هناك طبقات غنية وطبقات فقيرة ليست فقيرة بمعنى الفقر وإنما فقيرة من حيث التكنولوجيا من حيث القدرة على توفير هذه المستلزمات كذلك من حيث كل أشار إلى ضرورة توفير الأنترنت وضرورة توفير الحواسيب ولكن لم أسمع أحدا تحدث عن التدريب والتكوين لأنه بالإمكان أن نوفر الحواسيب بالإمكان أن نوفر الأنترنت ولكن هل يمكننا فعلا اليوم هل أنه يوجد في كل الوزارات وفي كل الدول أناس وكفاءات قادرة على أن تشتغل اليوم بهذه التكنولوجيا الحديثة ومن هنا أريد أن أشير إلى أنه لا لا مفر من أن تكون هناك أيضا في هذه في إطارة مبادرة التضامن الرقمي ضرورة التركيز على التدريب والتكوين سواء للوزارات أو للتلاميذ أو للشركاء اللي هم مساهمين ونحن كمنظمة دولية الحوكمة المحلية شركاء حقيقيين مع منظمة الأليكسو وأيضا مع عدة دول ومع حكومات على غرار الدولة التونسية بلد الأم والتي أفتخر أن أكون منها وعلى غرار أيضا المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية التي نفتخر جدا بشراكتنا معها والذين استقبلونا استقبال رائع وكان لنا معهم عمل جيد وتحياتي للسيد لملك الأردن وللملكة رانيا أيضا ستكون حاضرة إن شاء الله على يوم الاثنين لأنهم قدموا لنا كل الدعم أيضا لليمن أيضا لسلطنة عمان خلال تواجد السلطان قابوس الله يرحمه إن شاء الله فنحن نبارك هذه المبادرة ونمد أيدينا وسنمضي بأسماء هذه الثلاث منظمات على هذه المبادرة شكرا
سعادة الدكتورة أحلام عرفاوي رئيسة المنظمة الدولية للحوكمة المحلية شكرا على هذه الكلمة القيمة والمقترحات الهامة التي تفضلت بها وسنعمل بإذن الله على تحقيقها سويا معكم ومع كافة الشركاء أخيرا وليس آخرا أدعو سعادة الدكتورة منى العروسي مديرة بمنظمة الفرنكوفونية لإلقاء كلمتها في أقصر وقت ممكن الأوبتيميزاسيون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Je travaille dans une institution de l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie. Je vais faire comme notre cher ami du Djibouti avec qui on collabore énormément au niveau de l'IFEF. Donc je vais parler en français. Comme elle a dit la collègue tout à l'heure, tout ce qui devrait être dit a été dit. Moi je vais juste parler pas d'Internet mais du numérique. Pour moi le numérique ce n'est plus un confort, c'est une nécessité. Et la Covid a montré que plus qu'une complémentarité, le, le numérique, parce qu'on doit faire une différence entre Internet et le numérique, est une nécessité. Et ce que nous faisons à l'IFEF, c'est qu'on travaille sur ce qu'on appelle le numérique solidaire. Et je m'explique. Plusieurs pays de l'Afrique subsaharienne ne sont pas connectés. Euh, si les chiffres sont de 15% dans certains pays, en Afrique, on a très peu d'élèves qui sont connectés et très peu de femmes qui sont connectées. Et donc, on n'est pas obligé d'avoir une connexion à Internet pour faire du numérique. Nous offrons des solutions à base de microserveurs déconnectés pour donner la possibilité à tous ces jeunes-là d'accéder à une tonne de quantité de, de ressources pédagogiques, de bonnes pratiques, d'exercices. Et ça, ça nous permet d'avoir une connexion, une, une relation avec les ressources pédagogiques libres, comme il a été dit par M. Tofir Ghezlasi tout à l'heure, donc d'avoir des « open educational resources without Internet ». Et une autre solution aussi qui a, qui a été donnée et qui a été mise en place par euh, l'IFEF en période de Covid, c'est d'avoir un accès en offline asynchrone à des ressources, avec des ressources que l'enseignant télécharge sur son téléphone portable et d'avoir accès à ces ressources-là. Donc c'est juste pour conclure. Euh, je suis technique, Mohamed, c'était mon professeur. Hein. <rire> Donc euh, je suis dans le technique, c'est des solutions qui existent et qui, et qui peuvent donner et donner la possibilité à tous les élèves d'être connectés. Donc voilà, et c'est euh, enfin, juste pour terminer. Félicitations pour cette initiative et que j'espère que tout le monde y adhère. Merci. كلمة واحدة مع أسف ممكن هناك من يريد الكلمة ولكن الوقت لا يسمح في هذا العالم في كل يوم يزداد 490 ألف مولود يعني تقريبا في كل ثانية خمس أو ستة أطفال يولدون في كل ثانية والأقدار وحدها هي التي تحدد لكل طفل هل ذاك الطفل سينشأ في بيئة غنية وعندما يكبر يجد البيئة التكنولوجية والحواسيب والأنترنت أو ينشأ في بيئة فقيرة ويحرم من الفرص التعليمية لذلك لا بد من التضامن الرقمي لا بد أن الدول الغنية تساعد الدول الفقيرة من حيث البنى التحتية من حيث الاتصالات من حيث تزويدها بالكهرباء وتزويدها بالحواسيب حتى لا يتخلف أحد عن الركب وشكرا جزيلا لكم جميعا طبعا أود أن أشكر المترجم شكرا جزيلا
Y ahí hablas. Hola.
Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, es un placer enorme eh, estar aquí retransmitiendo esta sesión desde la sede de Naciones Unidas, donde, como todos sabemos, estos días, eh, estoy hablando sobre todo para los que están conectados, es creo que una de las únicas o la única sesión en la que vamos a tener streaming. Por eso, por eso estoy dando un poquito el contexto para la gente que se está conectando virtualmente con nosotros. Como sabéis, en estos momentos estamos en la sede de Naciones Unidas desde el Transforming Education Summit. Este panel también, excepcionalmente, va a ser en español, salvo por una participación, la de Noam, que va a ser en inglés. Todas las demás se van a dar en español. Vamos a tener interpretación simultánea, así que, por favor, a los que estáis conectados, eh, deberíais tener una instrucción eh, para conectaros con la, con la traducción, con la interpretación y aquí en línea los que estén aquí y quieran traducción simultánea tienen simplemente que ponerse el, 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 el headphone. Eh, pasando ya al, al, al contenido, eh, es un momento histórico, lo hemos escuchado hoy durante todo el día, lo vamos a seguir escuchando estos días. Eh, el mundo, la región en particular, América Latina, y el Caribe está atravesando una crisis sin precedentes. Eh, en el 2020, eh, la región vivió la recesión económica más importante de los últimos 200 años. Fue la región también que más tiempo mantuvo cerradas eh, las escuelas. Los estudios de pérdidas de aprendizaje que existen a nivel global, estamos hablando de 35 estudios, 35 de, 32 de los 35 documentan pérdidas de aprendizajes y de esos las mayores pérdidas de aprendizaje se han documentado en la región entre un año y dos años eh, de, de, de pérdidas para, para nuestros estudiantes, en particular la evidencia viene de Brasil y México. Eh, dicho esto, las malas noticias, también las crisis son eh, grandes oportunidades, oportunidades para repensar, para crear soluciones nuevas, para romper con la inercia y también para hacer las cosas de un modo diferente. El choque que hemos enfrentado eh, durante la pandemia tiene causas estructurales, también lo, también lo sabemos, sistemas educativos de baja calidad, inequitativos y por eso justamente poco resilientes. Dentro de esas oportunidades que, 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 estamos, que estamos viendo, entramos en un, un proceso acelerado de digitalización y se están implementando soluciones extremadamente innovadoras que hoy justamente podrían ser parte de, de, esa, de esa solución que resuelva no solo los problemas coyunturales del choque transitorio, sino también los problemas estructurales. Bueno, justamente para discutir una de esas soluciones, estamos hoy aquí, las tutorías remotas, Hoy nos acompaña, tengo conmigo el lujo de contar con un panel increíble, tanto aquí en la sede de Naciones Unidas como conectado eh, remotamente, siete expertos y autoridades educativas que nos van a acompañar, eh, dos en formato híbrido y cinco aquí conmigo en la sala. Eh, voy a dar la palabra y voy a ir introduciendo a cada panelista según, según vaya interviniendo. Voy a partir por presentarles y por eh, ceder eh, este, este espacio a Pablo Ceballos Estarelas, es el director regional del IP UNESCO, la Oficina para América Latina y el Caribe, y está conectado remoto. Adelante, Pablo. Bueno, estos son los problemas del directo y del híbrido. Nos damos cuenta de lo que viven los estudiantes y nuestros docentes todos los días, lo que han sufrido durante la pandemia cuando, cuando vivimos cosas, situaciones como esta. ¿Puedes, Pablo? Si no, si, si queréis, por, por un tema de tiempo, es verdad que podemos empezar con... 
con la presentación de Noam. Adelante, Noam. No, okay, now you can hear me. Okay. I don't need to translate myself. Um, yeah, great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's a great opportunity to be here on such a, a wonderful panel. And uh, what I'm hoping you know, we can really discuss today is we've been hearing a lot about the education crisis. And here we have some really exciting solutions with some evidence and some scalability. So I think there is uh, an exciting agenda uh, today. Uh, so I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Youth Impact, which is an organization that is scaling up evidence uh, in health and education, uh, and then also with a hat of doing some research uh, with the University of Oxford on these interventions. So happy to jump to the next slide. If it will cooperate. Okay, well, that's a very nice logo. <laughs> Well, I, can, I actually know what I want to say, so I can keep going while we figure out the slides. So one thing, I, as we all know, um, actually, we'll take this out for a second. Um, one thing we all know, oh, okay, it's coming from the computer, okay. Um, one thing we all know is that COVID was a historic crisis. Over a billion children were out of school at the height of the pandemic. I think this is something we all know, and, and as mentioned, the learning losses were very large. Uh, and so one question was, how do you reach students when they're out of school? And governments and organizations turn to many approaches, and some of them and many of them involve some form of technology, and often these were uh, sometimes high-tech, you know, internet-based technology, and in other cases they were lower tech, like radio, TV, and in some cases even just using a simple mobile phone, which we don't always think about as a technology, but is actually you know, one of the oldest, most accessible technologies of all. And so that's gonna be a theme, is, is using some of these low tech approaches, and I think we're seeing here the value of low tech in particular, even as we're, we're here together. Uh, and so one of the goals was really staying connected with students during this time where it was very hard to connect with them. So I'm gonna share a little bit about some of my experience from a kind of global context and then connect the dots to, to some of the work happening in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, from some of the first evidence during the pandemic on uh, remote learning. So that's some context. Uh, and I'm actually gonna just skip through these because I already talked about this. So what was the intervention that I'm gonna refer to? It was actually very simple. Uh, there was a mobile phone-based text message once a week. And then the other component of it was a 20-minute phone call once a week. So it was a very simple, cheap, uh, scalable intervention. This was tested in a randomized control trial, which is considered some of the uh, most reliable evidence. Uh, and we also assessed students to make sure that all of the instruction was targeted to their level. So the children who couldn't do addition were taught addition. The children who couldn't do subtraction were taught subtraction. Uh, so what is the evidence? I'm gonna cut to the chase. So this is actually, oh, if you can go back one slide here. So this is a, a few of the countries in the research that I was directly involved in, in in the first instance. Five studies, actually it's six, five additional beyond the original study. 20,000 students, 500 educators. Just to give you the sense of the scope. So this wasn't a small thing in one place. Actually, this was across many contexts, many students, and really tested at, at a, quite a scale. Happy to go to the next one. So I'm gonna to cut to the chase and tell you what we're finding across all of these studies. Uh, and so the first evidence from Botswana made a big splash because it was some of the world's first evidence. It was published in Nature Human Behavior. And now this is from the five follow-on studies. Uh, and so the, the actual, the paper will be released soon. It's not yet released, so you're one of the first to, to see this actually. And here's what we're seeing. The bottom line is it actually worked in every country. And on average, it delivered the equivalent of over a year of high quality instruction per $100. That is extremely cost effective. It's one of the most cost effective ed education approaches that I've actually ever been involved in or, or seen. The other thing that you can see here that I'll, I'll sort of express is we also tested it when delivered by NGOs and when delivered by governments. And it worked just as well, in fact, slightly better when delivered by governments, which we don't always see. So this can really work across countries and within government systems. 
This is another figure here, uh, and I won't dig into the data, but I'm very happy to if anyone wants to chat about it after. I'll just tell you the bottom line. Uh, one thing we saw is that this both recovered the learning loss, which we heard about, but it actually did something even more remarkable. It actually improved education outcomes over prior pre-COVID learning, actually, to the point where it delivered more learning than a full year of education. And this was 20 minutes once a week for eight weeks. So in three hours, children learned more than sometimes they learn in an entire year. So this is pretty striking. And I think the main takeaway here is, on the one hand, it's very hard to improve learning. And in many situations, learning is not where it needs to be. On the other hand, it's very possible, actually, to improve learning. This is something we can do, and we can do at scale. So how do we really bridge the gap? So a couple of policy implications, and I'll, I'll close. So one is around cost effectiveness. This is, of course, critical for, for policy. Uh, another is really bringing rigorous evidence at a time of uncertainty, especially around scalable approaches. Another is I want to talk about tech for a second. We've been referring to this as remote tutoring, uh, but often there's large tech budgets in government, as, as we know, but they're used on giving out tablets or computers. One other way of thinking about utilizing those uh, line items is using technology that people already have access to, like a mobile phone, and they're using, uh, and then actually delivering good pedagogy through that. So that's not a use of ICT line items that's typically seen, but it could be possible. Another point is on targeting instruction. This is something that's been shown to work in many settings. This is another way to do this to children's levels. And we were just talking actually about curriculum and aligning curriculum to, to students' levels. This is another way of doing that. Uh, another is ar around tutoring. Tutoring is one of the single most effective approaches in education. And this is a low cost, cheap way of doing tutoring. And I think that's been a, a main thrust of some of the, the work that we've seen with with IDB and governments in Latin America. Uh, and then just the final point here on uh, school disruption, I think this has really opened our eyes to the fact that it's uh, not that uncommon, actually. So actually, there was just big floods in, in Pakistan that disrupted schooling for tens of thousands of students. Rainy seasons disrupt school. Teacher strikes disrupt school. So we need to think about building resilient education systems even beyond the pandemic. So I'll just wrap up. Um, and, uh, and parent engagement, of course, this is critical. The COVID shock was a real uh, eye-opener on how we can engage caregivers and parents, and often these approaches were calling households and parents directly and engaging them in the process. Uh, so I'll just wrap up. I can go through these quickly. Um, there's a real movement building around this, so a lot of institutions have put this kind of approach in reports, and now really one of the uh, key aspects is how do we operationalize it at scale? We sort of have a sense that this can work. There's a coalition building. Uh, and the IDB, very excited to be here with, with uh, governments uh, and ministries, and the IDB has really been collaborating and pushing this forward. And I, we're going to hear today from, from a few efforts, actually, with, which have shown to be really effective. And it's very exciting what this effort is doing. So uh, thank you, everyone, and very excited for the conversation uh, that's going to happen today. Thank you so very much, no one. I actually, with a, with lo voy a me cambio al español. Bueno, con el problema técnico que tuvimos al principio, no tuve la ocasión de introducir a, a Noam Mes Fellow a la universidad en la Universidad de, de Oxford y además es el cofundador de Young Impact. Eh, que hemos visto justamente. Las, las experiencias que han estado implementando en diferentes países del mundo. Muchísimas gracias, Noam, por, por compartirnos el trabajo que, que habéis hecho y en, el, en los espacios en los que también estamos colaborando. Quiero destacar muy rápidamente algunas ideas. El, esa, esa, el, el impacto que ha tenido la intervención, no solamente en la recuperación de aprendizajes perdidos durante la pandemia, sino también en, en solucionar problemas de aprendizaje, de aprendizaje que ya se habían manifestado anteriormente a la pandemia. Con lo cual, esa combinación de resolución de problemas estructurales y coyunturales que había mencionado al principio. El otro tema que me parece extremadamente importante es, y, y que no, no ha mencionado Noam, pero creo que sí vale la pena eh, destacarlo aquí, es que estas intervenciones tienen una combinación de habilidades. Hay, como todos sabemos, una cierta tensión eh, 
que para mí es un falso dilema, entre enfatizar desde los sistemas educativos las habilidades fundacionales versus las habilidades socioemocionales del siglo XXI, etcétera, etcétera. Esta intervención justamente creo que una de los, las razones por las que es tan efectiva es porque combina apoyo en habilidades cognitivas, en desarrollo socioemocional y además en función ejecutiva, es decir, ayuda a los estudiantes a organizar el tiempo, a organizar la tarea, etc. Creo que eso es otro tema también extremadamente importante de las intervenciones. La flexibilidad eh, combinada con, con el uso de, de tecnología, eh, flexibilidad porque es una intervención que se puede hacer en persona, en híbrido o en remoto, y, y finalmente lo que destacaba Noam del rol de los hogares eh, que es tan importante como sabemos en la educación de niños y jóvenes. Y con eso voy a pasar la palabra, a ver si esta vez funciona, a Pablo Ceballos Estarelas. Pablo, no sé si te puedes… Ah, me pusieron la de Felipe, pero… Eh, sí, eh, Fe, Pablo está en remoto… Eh, este es, el, este es el Q para, el, para los que están, para todos ustedes, este es el Q que le tengo que dar a control para que sepa que tiene que conectar a Pablo. Así que Pablo, adelante, a ver si esta vez tenemos más suerte. Creo que estás muteado. No te escuchamos. Sí. Pablo, creo que estás muteado. Ahora se ha quitado, sí, pero seguimos. Eh, Pablo, ¿puedes hablar para ver si te escuchamos? No. Bueno. Vamos entonces a dar palabra, la palabra. Lamentablemente creo que vamos a tener que volver a pasar a, a Felipe para no perder demasiado tiempo. Está hablando, pero no... Es que nosotros no, no te escuchamos, Pablo. Bueno, vamos a pasar a, si, si os parece, pasamos, Pablo, pasamos a la presentación de Felipe mientras eh, tratamos de solucionar el problema técnico. Eh, Felipe es eh, Visiting Fellow de la Universidad de Harvard y nos va a hablar… Ah, ¿ahora estamos escuchando? No puedo creer… Eso no ah, te, ¿Te escuchamos? ¿Pablo? ¿Puedes oírme ahora? ¿Estás ahí? ¡Sí! sí ¡Bravo! Uh. Ok. Bueno, eh, les decía que vamos a hablar de la, de la crisis de, de aprendizaje eh, más allá de la pandemia. Eh, ¿Puedo seguir? Sí, adelante, Pablo, adelante. Te cambiamos la presentación, pero adelante, continúa. No, no sé si puedo seguir o si... No sí, sé si me está puedes viendo. seguir, Pablo, puedes seguir. ¿Qué podemos hacer? ¿Seguimos? Ok. Sí. Que no hago nada, entonces es un poco difícil. Eh, les decía que, la, que, que esta cumbre sobre la transformación de la educación es una gran oportunidad que tenemos a nivel global para movilizar uh, los sistemas educativos del mundo y lograr que se conviertan en sistemas generadores de justicia educativa e igualdad de oportunidades para todas las personas. Eh, como todos sabemos, todos los países de la, del mundo se comprometieron a avanzar hacia el ODS-4, más tardar el año 2030, para Bueno, continúo. Eh, decía que 
que para, para conseguir este objetivo, las dos condiciones básicas y complementarias son la democratización en el acceso a la escuela y la apropiación de los aprendizajes necesarios por parte de los estudiantes. En, la, en, el, en, el, en los últimos 20 años, los países de América Latina y el Caribe han realizado esfuerzos significativos en ambos sentidos. Desde comienzos de este siglo XXI se observa en muchos países de la región un debate normativo sumamente rico, del que surgen consensos muy potentes a la hora de definir los derechos de las personas a la educación y las obligaciones de los estados a garantizarla, y que se expresaron en nuevas leyes de educación en muchos países de la región. En todas estas leyes de educación se observa una tendencia a redefinir el sentido último de la política educativa, que ya no se trataría solo de garantizar la escolarización, es decir, el acceso y la permanencia en la escuela, sino también de conseguir la apropiación de los conocimientos estipulados como necesarios en cada sociedad, partiendo de un enfoque de la educación como derecho y de una concepción de la educación cada vez más integral o humanista, es decir, que va, que va más allá de concepciones reduccionistas, como aquellas que conciben la educación exclusivamente como adquisición de destrezas para el trabajo. En este sentido, hay dos cuestiones clave que cabe destacar sobre el horizonte que se abrió a partir de esos nuevos marcos normativos. Por una parte, la tendencia a declarar como obligatorio el nivel secundario en toda su extensión, posicionando al, al Estado como garante, no solo del acceso, sino también de la permanencia y la finalización del nivel medio. Eh, esto dio lugar a, un, a una notable expansión de cobertura en los sistemas educativos de América Latina y el Caribe en las dos últimas décadas, que se expresa en el aumento de las tasas de escolarización, eh, en particular en los niveles preescolar y secundaria. Eh, y también en el aumento de tasas de graduación en la educación media superior. Estas políticas de expansión de la cobertura dieron lugar a una, a una inclusión cada vez mayor en el sistema escolar de, de muchos sectores sociales que habían estado históricamente excluidos, eh, como personas de nivel socioeconómico bajo, personas de zonas rurales, pueblos indígenas, afros. Al mismo tiempo, la incorporación progresiva de criterios de calidad en el discurso educativo y en algunos casos también en las leyes de educación, empujó las metas educativas más allá del simple acceso a la escolarización, señalando como un aspecto irrenunciable que, en su paso por las instituciones educativas, los estudiantes adquieran también todos los saberes que ese sistema propone, se propone enseñarles. En este punto me quisiera concentrar porque es donde se presentan los mayores desafíos. Un recuento de las reformas de los sistemas educativos en la región en las últimas dos décadas muestra que, en mayor o menor medida, se consolidaron ciertas líneas de acción que se fueron estableciendo a manera de consenso sobre qué podemos hacer para incidir positivamente en los aprendizajes estudiantiles. Líneas que, en cierta forma, se convirtieron en recomendaciones canónicas acerca de lo que todo sistema educativo debería hacer para mejorar. Entre ellas, quisiera citar estas cuatro que ven ustedes eh, en, en, la, en, la, en, en la lámina, porque fueron las que más presentes estuvieron y siguen estando presentes en la región. Eh, actualizar los currículos, mejorar las capacidades docentes, incorporar la tecnología a las escuelas y establecer sistemas de evaluación de los aprendizajes. Casi todos los países de la región en las últimas dos décadas avanzaron con mayor o menor velocidad en la aplicación de estas recomendaciones canónicas y de otras cuyo común denominador era que todas apuntaban explícitamente hacia una mejora de la calidad de la educación, entendida como mejora de los aprendizajes estudiantiles medidos de pruebas estandarizadas. Y sin embargo, y esto es importante, más de 20 años después de haber aparentemente aplicado estas y otras recomendaciones, a pesar de los importantes esfuerzos realizados y de todo el dinero invertido, cuando comparamos los sistemas educativos latinoamericanos y caribeños con los del resto del mundo, nuestra región sigue mostrando una calidad insuficiente en términos de aprendizajes estudiantiles. Por eso decimos que existe una crisis de aprendizajes en América Latina y el Caribe. Y en la medida que esto sea así, podemos concluir que el pleno derecho a la educación todavía no se ha cumplido en América Latina y el Caribe. En otras palabras, los significativos avances en términos de inclusión que se realizaron en, en nuestra región no encuentran el mismo correlato cuando analizamos la evolución de los logros de aprendizaje. Vamos a la siguiente lámina. Eh, la, ¿Por qué decimos que la crisis de aprendizaje existente ocurre más allá 
de, es decir, independientemente de la pandemia de COVID-19. Porque en nuestra región la crisis de aprendizaje ya se había evidenciado en, mil, en 2018 y 2019, es decir, antes de la pandemia de COVID-19. Hay que admitir, eso sí, que esta crisis de aprendizaje se manifiesta en las dos áreas curriculares sobre las que los países han venido evaluando continuamente, que son lengua y matemáticas. Pero creo que es razonable colegir que su alcance es mucho mayor en el sentido de que abarca también otros ámbitos de aprendizaje, no solo conocimientos académicos como ciencias naturales y sociales, sino también otros saberes prácticos. No me quiero detener en eso para seguir. Eh, como sabemos, en 2019 se aplicaron las pruebas del Estudio Regional Comparativo y Explicativo eh, de la UNESCO, el ERCE, eh, en tercero y sexto grado de primaria. Y en 2008, perdón, en 2018 se aplicaron las pruebas del Programa Internacional para la Evaluación de Estudiantes, PISA, de la OSD. A estudiantes, en este caso, de 15 años de edad, es decir, en su mayoría a nivel secundario. Los resultados del ERCE 2019 muestran que la mayoría de los estudiantes de la región no aprende lo necesario en los primeros años de sus trayectorias educativas. Aproximadamente la mitad de los estudiantes no logran alcanzar los niveles mínimos de competencia esperados. En estos grados se enfocan principalmente en el desarrollo de la alfabetización inicial y la adquisición de operaciones matemáticas básicas. En el caso de, de la secundaria, según la medición efectuada por PISA en 2018, la mitad de los estudiantes de los países de nuestra región que participaron en esta prueba no alcanzaron el umbral mínimo de competencia lectora. Y en el área de matemática la situación es todavía más crítica, ya que 6 de cada 10 estudiantes tienen dificultades importantes para lograr dominar aspectos básicos de la comprensión numérica. Al igual que en las pruebas de la UNESCO, la comparación entre las ediciones 2018 y 2012 de PISA muestra un estancamiento de la mejora en los logros de aprendizaje en ambas áreas de estudio. Sin embargo, y en línea de lo que mencionaba hace un momento en relación a las reformas avanzadas en las últimas décadas, los países de América Latina y el Caribe mostraron importantes avances hasta antes de la pandemia en materia de expansión de la cobertura y del acceso educativo y llegaron a alcanzar tasas casi universales de cobertura en enseñanza primaria que es obligatoria en todos los países. Pero Pablo, paradójicamente... Pablo, te mismos... queda un minuto. Pablo, te queda un minuto. Okay, okay. Ok, no hay ningún problema. Gracias. Eh, el, voy a tratar de, de, de concluir, eh, en ese caso, eh, si me permiten, eh, llevando al, 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 planteando el siguiente problema. Eh, todos somos conscientes, en definitiva, que los países de la región vienen aplicando por aproximadamente 20 años, más o menos, variaciones de las mismas políticas. Entonces, la, 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 la pregunta que nos deberíamos hacer, y yo creo que es muy importante hacerla en el contexto de esta cumbre, es ¿qué podemos hacer para no seguir repitiendo estos problemas? Eh, en otras palabras, ¿por qué las políticas implementadas no tuvieron el, 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 impacto, el impacto esperado? Eh, la, la, yo creo que frente a esto nuestros países se enfrentan a, una, a un dilema que es muy difícil. Y con esto voy terminando. Podemos seguir haciendo lo que veníamos haciendo hasta antes de la pandemia, sabiendo que por este camino apenas conseguiremos mejoras de cobertura escolar y que no pudimos conseguir mejoras significativas en los aprendizajes, o podemos dejar de hacer lo que veníamos haciendo e intentar nuevas estrategias. Esto, es, esto último es lo que se está proponiendo en la cumbre que esta no sea una declaración más, sino que realmente nos demos cuenta de que lo que está pasando en la región es muy grave y que realmente debemos cambiar de rumbo. La pregunta, por supuesto, es hacia dónde y cómo lograrlo. ¿Cómo podemos pasar de dichos a hechos? Si miramos hacia atrás y notamos que todas, que todas las, las políticas que, que apuntaban al mejoramiento de la calidad resultaron insuficientes, deberíamos preguntarnos seriamente por qué nos equivocamos. Entonces, si hemos venido aplicando estas, estas, estas recomendaciones canónicas, eh, no es que las recomendaciones en sí mismas, mejorar los, los, los currículos, mejorar la docencia, incorporar tecnología y evaluar los sistemas, estén mal como recomendaciones. Probablemente el problema vaya más allá de eso y tenga que ver con, con, con por lo menos dos factores. Eh, uno, el hecho de que, de, que, de que los países posiblemente no tuvieron... Eh, digamos, decisión política para llevar a fondo 
las reformas o, por, por ejemplo, no quisieron poner o no pudieron poner la financiación necesaria. Una segunda hipótesis, que es la que vamos a explorar en el próximo foro regional de política educativa de la UNESCO, es el problema del, de, la, de la brecha de implementación. Es decir, en qué medida los, las, eh, las políticas que se diseñaron de una manera espléndida eh, tuvieron problemas al ejecutarse, es decir, al pasar del, de nuevo de lo dicho a lo hecho. El, la, entonces, eh, la, no quisiera decir más y simplemente aprovechar la ocasión para invitarlos a la próxima edición de este foro regional que se va a desarrollar virtualmente del 4 al 6 de octubre y cuyo tema principal va a ser precisamente cómo abordar la crisis de los aprendizajes en América Latina y el Caribe. Eh, la, la, el foro de este año va a tratar de poner la llaga, como decía, en el problema de cómo superar la crisis de aprendizajes de la región, identificando los errores del pasado e intentando aprender de ellos. Eh, eh, quiero decir, y esto es importante, que este foro constituirá el primer espacio público en el que se intentará hacer seguimiento, en este caso en la región de América Latina y el Caribe, de las conclusiones alcanzadas en, en esta cumbre sobre la transformación de la educación y para dar un puntapié inicial al proceso de su adaptación a la región de América Latina y el Caribe. Así que dentro de exactamente 17 días estaremos abonda, abordando a, con profundidad este, este tema eh, y... y y siempre con el propósito de generar recomendaciones de política educativa que permitan sumar a esta construcción que estamos haciendo en conjunto en la cumbre. Porque si hay algo que me queda claro es que el camino para reimaginar el futuro de la educación en nuestros países vamos a tener que hacerlo juntos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Pablo. Quedamos todos invitados a, dentro de 17 días a esa eh, cumbre que está, o sea, esos talleres que está organizando UNESCO sobre un tema eh, tan central como, como la recuperación y las estrategias eh, de reformas, esa combinación de reformas más estructurales con, con, con programas y políticas eh, de, de corto plazo. Eh, le voy a pasar ahora la palabra a Felipe Evia, que ya lo he introducido, así que no lo voy a volver a repetir porque además andamos un poco de cor cortos de tiempo. Adelante, Felipe. Sí, muchas gracias. Sí, en efecto, el, digamos, punto número uno, tenemos un problema serio de aprendizajes que venía con la pandemia y que después de la pandemia se incrementó. Punto número dos, para enfrentar justo en el día de esta, de esta eh, cumbre que estamos hablando sobre posibles soluciones, una de las posibles soluciones que está mostrando resultados muy importantes en, América, en, en el mundo en general y en América Latina en particular, son tutorías remotas. Noam eh, nos, nos, nos indicó cuáles son las principales características de estas tutorías remotas. No, nosotros les queremos contar, hicimos, y ya Pablo lo, lo va a comentar con más detalle, hicimos eh, diferentes pilotos en diferentes zonas en América Latina y eh, encontramos un resultado muy grande y muy importante, que es que estas tutorías remotas aceleran los aprendizajes fundamentales en matemáticas. ¿no? Pero encontramos otra cosa, y es la que yo les quería platicar con, en, en el minuto o en los dos minutos que tengo, que es que encontramos también que estas tutorías fueron muy importantes e impactaron positivamente en los tutores, no solo en los niños, sino en las personas que llevaron a cabo las tutorías. Y ahí encontramos entonces que estas tutorías en efecto inspiran y motivan a los docentes activos en formación para poder realizar mejor su acción docente. ¿Y, ¿Y dónde está el secreto? ¿Por qué funciona el secreto? Y funciona específicamente porque nosotros creemos que este programa de tutorías, eh, de tutorías remotas junta dos elementos o dos eh, áreas o dos eh, eh, políticas muy exitosas en términos de, eh, de estrategia eh, pedagógica. ¿no? Una es que junta todo lo que nosotros sabemos sobre relación tutora, ¿no? que es fundamental el poder establecer esta relación de cercanía, de empatía, de ser el otro significativo, de cuidado que requerimos para que cada niño pueda aprender y pueda aprender significativamente. Y junta esta, estas tutorías el otro, eh, la, la otra estrategia exitosa que es enseñar el nivel adecuado, teaching at the right level, que seguramente ya han escuchado más, que no voy a hablar en ella. Eh, y esa, esa combinación es la que logra hacer esto. ¿Qué es lo importante de esto? Y es la recomendación que nosotros damos, que es que a través del de ejercicio de que los tutores se hagan tutores y comiencen a dar tutorías uno a uno por teléfono a cada niño, van generando una sensación de efectividad sobre su trabajo. 
los tutores que nosotros trabajamos, más del 95% consideran que lo hizo muy bien y que lo hizo bien, que los niños aprendieron gracias a lo que hizo y que consiguió motivar y que los niños aprendieron de ellos. ¿no? Y eso entonces lo deja mucho, eh, mucho más motivado para seguir aprendiendo. Por lo tanto, y con esto termino, la recomendación que nosotros damos, si nosotros estamos pensando en escalar eh, eh, relación tutora o en escalar este tipo de proyectos que funcionan, que tienen resultados, es también incorporar las tutorías en los procesos de formación inicial y en los procesos de formación docente. Que los que están estudiando, aquellos estudiantes que están estudiando para ser docentes o los docentes que ya están, en, ya están en trabajo y que quieren seguir trabajando, que puedan acceder a capacitarse para ser tutores y que tengan este, esta experiencia tutora y que puedan entonces entender la importancia que tiene la relación significativa entre tutor y tutorado. Gracias por el tiempo. Muchísimas gracias, Felipe. Te vamos a dar el premio, además. La, 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 capacidad, la capacidad que has tenido de condensar toda esa información eh, en, en tan poco tiempo. Destaco algunas de las ideas que has levantado. El impacto en los tutores, y no quiero ser un spoiler, pero sé que Pablo nos tiene reservado una sorpresa con relación a eso, a, a la relación tan increíble que han, que han desarrollado los tutores y los estudiantes. También eh, quería destacar la importancia de lo que decías, ¿no? de la motivación, de la capacidad que tiene para, para levantar la motivación intrínseca de los estudiantes que es tan importante en, en los procesos de, de aprendizaje y algo que vamos a escuchar también de algunas de las experiencias, por ejemplo en el caso de Argentina y es cómo eh, estos, estas intervenciones se pueden unir a procesos de fortalecimiento de la formación de ese pipeline de docentes que van a ingresar a la carrera eh, de, forma, de forma también eh, significativa y exitosa. Así que con esto le paso la palabra a, Zoy, a, a Pablo Zoido, que es especialista de educación del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo y que además ha sido el que ha estado coordinando desde nuestro lado toda esta iniciativa a nivel regional. Adelante, Pablo. Con, eh, las voces de todos los chicos, de todos los cuidadores, de todos los tutores que están detrás de, de este esfuerzo y que han puesto de todo su entusiasmo. Aquí tienen eh, un par eh, de testimonios de una tutora que nos comenta no solamente lo exitoso que ha sido el programa para, a, para las familias, eh, para los niños, sino también para ella, como bien comentaba Felipe, y para los padres, eh, no solamente los chicos se han dado cuenta de que son capaces de eh, hacer matemáticas, los padres también se han dado cuenta de lo que son capaces de hacer su, sus propios hijos. Y en muchos casos, como nos dice la mamá de abajo, incluso han aprendido algunos eh, participando también en estas tutorías porque estamos llegando a poblaciones muy vulnerables. Entonces, funciona a nivel global, lo hemos probado en nuestra región, también funciona, tenemos todos los números, tenemos todos los testimonios, y, uh, y estamos con muchísimas ganas de compartírselo a ustedes, pero lo que más, más nos interesa es realmente oír eh, de las personas que han estado liderando este esfuerzo, eh, de los ministros que tenemos en nuestro panel, así que yo voy a dar paso a nuestro panel y, uh, y seguro que van a surgir eh, muchísimas ideas que también podamos discutir eh, al final. Gracias, Mercedes. Muchas gracias, Pablo. Lo siento, Felipe, pero el premio se lo ha llevado Pablo. Bueno, y ahora sí vamos efectivamente a dar la palabra a los ministros, a los hacedores de políticas, a las autoridades de, de la región que han estado, algunos de los que han estado implementando estos programas porque en este momento estamos trabajando con 12 países de la región. Y voy a partir por eh, Mauricio Pineda, que es el ministro de Educación de El Salvador y que nos acompaña en persona hoy aquí. Eh, Mauricio, ministro. El Salvador ha sido el primer país eh, de, la, de América Latina que ha implementado estos programas, las tutorías remotas. Eh, ¿Cuál fue su principal objetivo cuando decidiste o decidió implementar este programa? Eh, ¿Con qué se queda? ¿Qué ha aprendido? ¿Y qué más le gustaría aprender de su piloto o de los pilotos que, que estamos implementando en otros países? Ya está rojito, ahora sí. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, gracias por la invitación eh, para venir y, y compartir con ustedes esto que para nosotros ha sido muy revelador en El Salvador. Nuestros estudiantes han venido cambiando la forma de aprender. Por lo tanto, nos obliga a nosotros a cambiar ahora la forma de enseñar. 
Y una, uno de los ejemplos más claros es este tema de las tutorías. ¿verdad? Eh, es sorprendente. Ustedes digamos, conocen la experiencia de El Salvador y si no, en dos segundos se las cuento. Eh, hemos entregado equipos tecnológicos a todos los estudiantes y a todos los docentes de nuestro país. Tablets y laptops. Pero es inter, in, in, eh, impresionante la, la habilidad con la que nuestros niños, sin importar la edad, tienen para, para adaptarse al uso de un equipo tecnológico. ¿Verdad? Estamos de acuerdo en que la transformación de un sistema educativo no se basa en la tecnología únicamente, sino la tecnología es un acelerador y un habilitador para que los aprendizajes sucedan, pero hay todo un, un proceso de transformación integral. ¿no? Eh, pero para nosotros esto fue increíble ¿no? y, y, y la motivación principal fue esa, llegar a ellos de una manera, a nuestros estudiantes sabiendo de lo que habíamos pasado, de una, de una pandemia que nos cambió la, la vida de cómo la conocíamos, llegar a ellos de una manera diferente, de una manera atractiva, de una manera que les permitiera a ellos quizá no aprender eh, jugando, sino a través de un dispositivo que les da, digamos, una, un, un entorno diferente a tener conocimientos. Si esto le cambia la perspectiva al estudiante, esto le cambia digamos, la rigidez con la que estamos acostumbrados a que la clase se dicte en un aula y los mete en, un, en, en una sintonía diferente, ¿no? Es, es como estar, digamos, conversando con tu, con tu mejor amigo. Y, y en esa experiencia, eh, que, que de, 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 más, de, 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 de más está decirlo, ha sido tremendamente positiva para nosotros, tuvimos una mezcla muy interesante entre docentes que eran experimentados, algunos que ya estaban retirados de la docencia, estudiantes eh, digamos, que están por eh, graduarse en, en alguna de las carreras de la docencia y, y, y ha permitido digamos, esta, esta riqueza ¿verdad? que eh, nos lleva digamos, a, a tener experiencias sumamente positivas. Y acá tengo una historia ¿no? de, de, de una niña, Verónica se llama, que, que su tutora, cuando termina el proceso, porque este vínculo va más allá de lo educativo, sino que se, se convierte digamos, en una relación mucho más fuerte, mucho más potente, y termina la tutora y se moviliza unos muchos kilómetros con las barreras, digamos, geográficas que pueda tener nuestro país y llega a conocer a, a la niña, a la tutora, a la, a la, tu, a la que estaba siendo tutoreada eh, y, 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 y conoce además a su mamá. ¿no? Pablo lo mencionaba, eh, incluso ¿verdad? algunos de los padres de familia de los niños que estaban en este proceso, se les ha transmitido también el conocimiento. O sea, estas son comunidades muy vulnerables en donde muchos de nuestros, de, de, de los papás de los niños, ¿verdad? no han pasado, digamos, ni siquiera los primeros tres años de primaria. Y entender que esta es una herramienta o un proceso que les ha llegado también a ellos, a nosotros la verdad que nos abre, nos abre muchas luces, ¿no? Precisamente por eso, nosotros hemos iniciado un proceso de reforma eh, en, el, en el sistema educativo y esto centra al alumno eh, como el, el actor principal del quehacer del, del, estudiante, del, 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 del sistema educativo y pasamos de los conceptos, digamos, de autoría a un proceso, digamos, mucho más centrado en el quehacer, en el, en el quehacer en el aula. Y el aula entendida como el espacio en donde se dan los aprendizajes, no las cuatro paredes. ¿no? Y el, el, un ejemplo de ello es esto que estamos viendo aquí. Eh, y decía esto porque antes de ser estudiantes y maestros somos seres humanos. ¿no? Y el proceso que estamos en este momento eh, siendo liderado por la primera dama de la República... Eh, precisamente nos enfoca en eso, ¿verdad? en que el, el sentimiento, el amor debe estar siempre presente para que los aprendizajes sean eh, efectivos. ¿no? Eh, y la dimensión afectiva es central para transformar el sistema educativo. ¿verdad? No podemos centrarnos simple y sencillamente en los procesos educativos sin comprender que del otro lado tenemos un ser humano y que la educación debe ser vista siempre como... Eh, como un derecho inalienable para los seres humanos, sin importar cuáles son las condiciones. ¿no? Entonces, eh, en nuestras prácticas eh, pedagógicas cotidianas es esencial que nosotros tengamos eso siempre presente. La, la afectividad 
y la educación vista desde la perspectiva del de derecho, el derecho a la educación, pero no solamente a la educación cuando entras al sistema educativo, sino a los demás derechos que están inherentes al ser humano cuando ya está dentro del sistema educativo. Por eso decía yo al inicio, la tecnología es, la tecnología es un acelerador, pero no puede ser considerada como el único elemento, digamos, para poder enseñar a nuestros estudiantes. Creemos que esto ha sido parte del éxito del programa, ¿verdad? Que, 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 que se mezcla la tecnología con el aspecto afectivo y ahora nosotros con una transformación que va muchísimo más allá, donde eh, están involucrados la eh, tecnificación y la profesionalización de los docentes, el tema de la provisión de la tecnología, la conectividad, eh, la, la, la infraestructura física, etcétera, para que todo esto sea, sea combinado. Además, el programa ha beneficiado de forma significativa a los, a los estudiantes de mayor vulnerabilidad, ya lo decía yo, ¿no? En El Salvador hay un promedio de dos eh, aparatos por persona, de dos teléfonos celulares por persona en promedio, ¿no? Entonces, esto eh, no, nos, nos dio la posibilidad de poder llegar a ellos de esta, de esta manera, mucho más eh, significativa y mucho más eficiente, ¿no? Eh, los tutores han realizado un trabajo increíble y han logrado empoderar a los alumnos, hacerlos vivir una experiencia académica para muchos por primera vez, ¿verdad? O sea, llegar de esa manera, como digo, de una manera completamente disruptiva, completamente diferente, ¿no? No el aula eh, donde están sentados frente a un pizarrón 45 minutos mirando los ejercicios eh, o, o, o las lecciones que el docente le pueda estar brindando, sino un espacio abierto, un espacio en donde también la afectividad ha podido ser transmitida a través de un dispositivo electrónico. Los estudiantes, padres y tutores eh, nos han solicitado a nosotros, en el caso de El Salvador, poder continuar con esta práctica. Y una de las cosas que conversábamos con Pablo es precisamente en este proceso de transformación del sistema educativo, en donde nosotros vamos a cambiar la currícula vamos a hacer una... Bueno, muchas veces digamos, cometemos el error de decir que lo que vamos a hacer es cambiar, como lo acabo de hacer yo, pero realmente lo que vamos a hacer es transformar, porque a nuestro estudiante no lo podemos cambiar. Tenemos que conservarlo como es y nosotros tratar de llegar con una educación transformada que permita que los conocimientos sean más efectivos. ¿no? Entonces, ese es el proceso en el que estamos. Eh, muy contentos con la experiencia y esperando poder escalarla en este proceso de transformación del sistema educativo que nosotros ya iniciamos y que eh, eh, iniciativas como esta le pueden ser de mucho beneficio. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Ministro, por el, por el entusiasmo, por el apetito eh, transformador y, y también eh, quisiera rescatar eh, algunas ideas que que ha mencionado. Lo primero es la tecnología como acelerador. Eh, me ha gustado mucho también la, lo bien que ha descrito cómo hemos logrado, cómo se ha logrado combinar, o sea, eh, llegar a una combinación de tutores con, con backgrounds completamente diferentes, desde docentes retirados, aquellos que están iniciando, que todavía no han ingresado a la profesión docente, que creo que es un uso de ese talento, de ese capital, eh, eh, extremadamente, extremadamente positivo. Eh, me ha gustado mucho también lo que ha dicho de, de la, sobre el afecto y sobre esos vínculos que se generan entre el docente, el adulto y el, y el niño y el, y el joven que van más allá de, de lo educativo. Y, y por último quiero enfatizar lo que mencionaba sobre las inequidades. Es una herramienta extremadamente efectiva para cerrar esas brechas de aprendizaje que se han acumulado entre estudiantes de más altos ingresos y más bajos ingresos. Estábamos viendo el otro día con el equipo justo unos datos de México que muestran cómo la, a través de las tutorías logramos llevar a los estudiantes que estaban más rezagados al nivel del resto de los estudiantes realmente en, en, en muy pocos meses, en algunos casos en ocho semanas. Así que muchas gracias por compartir la experiencia del Salvador. Ya voy a, ahora vamos a pasar en remoto a conectar a José Tomás, director general de escuelas de la provincia de Mendoza, en Argentina. Adelante, José Tomás. ¿Qué tal, Mercedes? Muchísimas gracias. ¿Se escucha bien? Esperemos que... Fenomenal. Que así sea. Bueno, entonces agradezco muchísimo la invitación. Voy a, 
a intentar, la primera parte no, no, no la pudimos seguir del todo, pero, pero coincido con todo lo que se ha dicho y voy a tratar de no ser redundante en, en, lo, en los aspectos que se han señalado. Quiero contar brevemente nuestra experiencia de las tutorías y, y, y dónde nosotros vemos la gran importancia que estas tienen. Eh, nosotros consideramos que para garantizar el derecho a la educación y para, y para mejorar la educación, no solo incorporar a, la, a los estudiantes, sino que, que realmente los chicos aprendan, es fundamental el seguimiento de las trayectorias reales de los estudiantes, ¿no? O sea, poder complementar, ayudar, eh, acompañar a cada, a cada chico, a cada chica en lo que necesita. Eh, y en ese punto, la, este tipo de, de tutorías, particularmente telefónicas, que son muy contraculturales, muy innovadoras, tal vez ese es uno de los retos que tenemos para, para masificarlo, ¿no? Este, lograr que asimilados por el sistema, pero ha demostrado muy buenos resultados en términos de, 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 de lograr aprendizajes rápidos eh, en chicos que venían por distintos motivos eh, un poco relegados, y, y de esa forma poder retomar sus trayectorias educativas, mejorarlas. Esto genera, como bien decía este, Pineda recién, eh, un, un, todo un tema de motivación y, y, y de afectividad entre, entre el estudiante, su tutor, la familia, que son partícipes de ese aprendizaje, pero sobre todo sobre la autoestima también al volver a la escuela y, y, y sentirse mejor que, que, que como estaba antes. Nosotros vemos en esto una potencialidad... Eh, importante en todo, en, entonces particularmente en lo que tiene que ver con, con el seguimiento de trayectorias reales y con el apoyo a las trayectorias débiles. En este punto eh, eh, tiene una relación de costo-eficiencia muy interesante también y sobre todo para las provincias como la nuestra que tiene una territorialidad muy importante en, en, en términos de distancia, poder llegar a mucha distancia y, y, y en poco tiempo, eh, eso también es otra de las fortalezas que tiene particularmente este, este tipo de, 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 de dispositivos. ¿no? Creo que los retos vienen en, en términos de formación. Hoy la formación inicial docente eh, no piensa en tutoría o en los formatos de aprendizaje con tutoría. Para eso, como también escuché que señalaba recién, ha sido muy motivador y muy gratificante eh, para los docentes que se formaron, que eran docentes del último año o, o recién recibidos de, de, de la carrera de, de maestra o, o del profesorado. Eh, fue muy motivador para ellos eh, eh, adquirir más aprendizajes, este, jerarquizar, digamos, de alguna forma su, su carrera y, y, y ver otra forma de, de acompañar a los chicos a través de, de llamados telefónicos. Eh, creo que mm, este tipo de investigaciones que se han llevado adelante en, en otros lugares y que en Mendoza eh, hemos hecho el primer piloto tienen un gran potencial eh, como, como remedial ¿no? para, para los chicos que, 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 le, que tienen por distintos motivos aquellas trayectorias débiles, eh, digamos, este, más profundas. Eh, y, y en ese sentido eh, agradecemos y acompañamos ¿no? Esta, est estos impulsos que vienen eh, eh, para, para desarrollar este tipo de cosas en, en, en distintos lugares en el mundo. Eh, sin lugar a duda, en Mendoza lo vamos a a fortalecer, tenemos distintas eh, líneas de acción para el, para el trabajo, pero una de, la, de las patas fundamentales, eh, y con esto cierro, es que para esto hace falta tener nominalidad en los estudiantes, para poder eh, lograr que, que la tutoría vaya directamente a quienes lo necesiten, eh, y, y para eso son muy importantes los sistemas nominales, los sistemas de alerta temprana, este, los sistemas que nos permiten distintas formas de seguimiento y acompañamiento de, de los estudiantes. Eh, bueno, muchísimas gracias por, 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 por la invitación y por, por poder participar en este tipo de, de actividades. Muchísimas gracias, José. Y eh, aquí quisiera destacar, este, el tema que estás, que estás trayendo a la mesa es extremadamente importante. La conexión entre esas brechas de aprendizaje con las trayectorias educativas de los estudiantes. Y cómo de alguna manera es fundamental... Eh, pensar las intervenciones de forma conjunta, de forma sistémica. Es decir, eh, tú hablabas de las, de las trayectorias educativas. Uh, estamos apoyando y, y los países de la región están implementando eh, sistemas de protección de trayectorias, de trayectorias educativas, entre los cuales hay, por ejemplo, sistemas de alerta temprana para la detección de estudiantes que están en riesgo de abandono o que están, eh, están enfrentando problemas eh, serios desde el punto de vista de su permanencia en el sistema educativo. Eh, esos sistemas de trayectorias 
no servirían de nada si nosotros somos capaces de identificar un estudiante, pero luego no somos capaces de actuar una vez que hemos identificado al estudiante en riesgo. Con lo cual, creo que esa conexión, ese vínculo entre un tipo de intervenciones y otras que estabas haciendo es, es clave. Eh, y por último, y también lo mencionaste, el vínculo con algo mucho más estructural que tiene que ver con la digitalización de los sistemas de gestión e información de datos educativos. Me parece que si no podemos tener un sistema de protección de trayectorias de identificación de estudiantes en riesgo si no tenemos información, datos nominalizados de estudiantes eh, y sistemas de gestión, por tanto, si eh, sistemas de gestión e información de, eh, educativa, pero tampoco podemos tener lo uno y lo otro si no tenemos luego intervenciones que nos permitan proteger y mantener a esos estudiantes en el sistema educativo. Así que muchísimas gracias, súper relevante eh, la intervención. Y ahora le voy a pasar la palabra a Yulisa Hernández, eh, que es la viceministra de Educación de la República Dominicana. Bienvenida, Yulisa, un gusto, un gusto tenerte aquí. Eh, tiene, tiene barra, ¿eh? Tiene barra. Adelante, gracias. Yulisa. Cuéntanos bueno, la experiencia de, de República Dominicana. Un placer y de verdad que una gran oportunidad. El mundo se ocupó de recuperar la salud en la pandemia, luego las economías. Yo creo que es el turno de la educación. Definitivamente es una gran oportunidad la que se nos está ofreciendo. Yo, no, yo creo que eh, no voy a abundar sobre lo que se ha dicho. Yo creo que esto eh, perso eh, le da, humaniza el currículum. Eso es lo primero, humaniza el currículum. O sea, el tutorial, lo que vemos como tutorial en Internet eh, no retroalimenta. Una, tuto, una tutoría es una retroalimentación permanente. Y definitivamente hay una gran ganancia en que el docente pueda tener este nivel de cercanía, que no solamente le permite eh, personalizar el contenido, que está impartiendo, sino también identificar esas potencialidades que el niño, que la niña, que el estudiante pueda tener, que en aula se pierden, lastimosamente en aula se pierden. Entonces, totalmente de acuerdo, la experiencia dominicana, eh, tanto en su primera versión como en la segunda, eh, numéricamente no es tan significativa, apostamos a que eso pueda ser, eh, tenemos la, la posibilidad de hacerlo, yo creo que hay mucha oportunidad de mejora Creo que, y lo estuvimos conversando en El Salvador, los sistemas educativos eh, que parecen grandes mamut, difíciles de mover para tomar decisiones, insisten en reproducir mecanismos y modelos que no, no tienen resultados. Y yo creo que la pandemia demostró que realmente no era tan complicado hacerlo. Entonces, poder eh, tener todas estas innovaciones pedagógicas, en el caso de mi país, eh, tenemos dos millones de equipos entregados a igual cantidad de niños, pero recién tenemos 300 mil niños de clase media que han venido del sector privado al sector público. Entonces, ahí tenemos un desafío. Eh, la semana pasada el gobierno dominicano anunció el bono estudiantil para poder ampliar la cobertura. Aquí hay otro desafío también, que es cobertura versus calidad. Y en los países de nuestra, de nuestra región, los países de renta media tenemos ese desafío, o sea, en la medida que tenemos que ampliar cobertura, se compromete la calidad. Nuestra eh, nación, nuestro país, también tiene una oportunidad de cara a un concurso de oposición docente que se realizó en pandemia para 20.000 plazas en ese momento. Eh, cuando se hizo actualización de plaza en pandemia, llegaron a 26.000. Tenemos 25.000 docentes nuevos, en donde en su gran mayoría son docentes muy jóvenes y que están más conscientes de la oportunidad que ofrece la tecnología, pero eh, de la matrícula que existía hubo una eh, cobertura total eh, en formación para la virtualidad y, y yo creo que pensando en cómo la pandemia eh, visibilizó todas estas debilidades, se pueden convertir definitivamente en grandes oportunidades. Creo que el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo que apuesta a, a estrategias de este tipo, pues, eh, va a tener mucho trabajo con nosotros de cara a, a intentar implementar esto. Y, y yo creo, y voy a hablar eh, en un segundo de algo que como madre me tocó. Yo tengo mi hija, eh, Micaela tiene siete años y tiene Asperger. Y Micaela cuando le daban la clase por Zoom se estresaba muchísimo porque la maestra no la podía atender a ella. Entonces yo puedo hablar, no solamente como funcionaria de mi país, sino como madre. Cuando ellos... Eh, 
tuve una, una maestra sombra en mi casa eh, porque la niña lo necesitaba, pero definitivamente en un mundo que cada día más se deshumaniza, se, yo creo que definitivamente hay que apostarle a no solamente eh, graduar estudiantes, sino formar ciudadanos. Y, y, y esta es la clave, me parece que esta es la clave. Muchísimas gracias por la oportunidad. Muchísimas gracias, Julisa. Y eh, como, como he hecho con los demás, voy a rescatar algunos puntos que, que realmente me han, me han llamado la atención de la intervención. Eh, destaco mucho eh, cómo has planteado este tipo de intervenciones desde una óptica de humanización de la educación. Eh, de, no solo de poner al centro al estudiante, sino de humanizar el, el, el acto educativo, que me parece que es eh, tan central. Humanizarlo además en un contexto de digitalización progresiva del, de, de, la, de las herramientas que estamos utilizando en aula. Me parece, me parece que darle, eh, introducir ese toque humano es, es clave en el contexto de la digitalización. Eh, y, pero también otro tema que, que mencionabas es esa progresiva, la, la importancia de llevar intervenciones personalizadas e individualizadas frente a una educación de masas que es la, que hemos, es la lógica en la que hemos venido funcionando en el, en el siglo XX, cambiar a, hacia una educación en la, que, en la que la relación humana, pero también eh, individualizada, personalizada, es, es fundamental y eso además permite, lo que, lo que decías al final que, que me encantó, permite acoger o educar desde la diferencia y para la diferencia y la diversidad. Así que muchísimas gracias por... por... Por, por los puntos que has levantado. Eh, bueno, me voy a saltar. Mire, la idea era dejar un poco de espacio para, para eh, que, que la gente que está en sala pueda, pueda hacer preguntas, pero antes, y les voy a pedir a los panelistas, ya veo que hay manos levantadas, les voy a pedir a los panelistas, por favor, que en un minuto, y me estoy saltando el protocolo de la, de, que habíamos acordado, pero... Eh, hemos hablado de todos los beneficios que tienen este tipo de intervenciones, las tutorías, etcétera, y ahora yo les voy a pedir a los panelistas, antes de pasaros la palabra, que hagan un ejercicio de honestidad. Is this, is this too good to be true? Porque yo todo lo que he escuchado aquí es bueno, y ahora quiero que en un minuto cada uno me diga algo, algo, o que no está bien, o que deberíamos hacer, o que deberíamos mejorar, o que no está incorporado en este tipo de intervenciones y que definitivamente este tipo de intervenciones no va a poder resolver. Así que en un minuto os voy a pasar la palabra, no sé quién quiere empezar. Pues comienzo. Vale. Ministro de Salvador, Mauricio. El que pega primero pega mejor. Ajá. Um, a ver, digamos que la herramienta es muy buena, eh, como decía antes, combina esto de, de, de personalizar, llegar al estudiante de una manera afectiva, que se sienta que es el, el centro de todo lo que está pasando. Yo, el, el único, y, y si podemos escalarlo, digamos, sería perfecta. Porque mi duda está en eso, digamos, en las limitantes que tenemos. Por ejemplo, en El Salvador, tratar de llegar a todos los estudiantes a través de esta modalidad pues algún problema vamos a tener por el tema de la conectividad, ¿no? O sea, la geografía nuestra no nos permite, por ejemplo, en toda la franja norte del país, que haya conectividad de teléfono. No hay, en esa zona no hay. Eh, quizá vamos a tener que hacer asocio con Honduras o con Guatemala, que son las telefónicas que entran en, eso, en esas franjas. Entonces, para mí es muy buena. Eh, la experiencia que hemos adquirido eh, humaniza la educación, ¿verdad? No mira a la tecnología como el centro, sino como un medio para llegar. Y el estudiante se siente y, y crea ese vínculo eh, con, su, con el tutor precisamente porque es una atención personalizada. Y eso tiene, digamos, una ventaja comparativa. Cuando nosotros querramos escalar esto, habrá que definir, digamos, hacia dónde lo queremos llevar. Para mí ese es el reto. Gracias. Gracias, Mauricio. Eh... Me, me, sí, me asumo totalmente la intervención de, del colega de El Salvador y pienso que hay, que hay que ganarse como aliados a los docentes, que son los hacedores de este tema. Y para eso probablemente eh, tener el gremio, tener los, eh, los, los colectivos docentes 
porque tenemos que hacer que el docente se enamore de esto y no lo vea como una tarea más en mi ya complicada agenda. Eh, eso yo creo que puede marcar eh, perfectamente la diferencia. Y, y en mi país estamos prohibiendo los pilotos, yo se lo he dicho a los organismos de cooperación, porque se quedan siendo pilotos. Nosotros lo des, el desafío que queremos es un piloto con, que venga acompañado de su plan de, eh, de masificación. Ese es el único pueblo que tenemos a partir de ahora. Muchas gracias, Yulisa, viceministra. Eh, pues no sé quién quiere ahora. Eh, sí. No, creo que primero le vamos a pasar la, la palabra a José Tomás. Adelante. Que es que lo tenemos gracias. en remoto, en remoto, para los de control. Gracias, Adelante. Eh, dos grandes desafíos. Primero, para que sea precisa la intervención de una tutoría telefónica, hay, hay que tener clara la, la necesidad de. de de, de tutoría que tiene el estudiante. Y para eso vuelvo a, a cómo cerré y lo que señalaste vos, eh, hay, hay que potenciar la nominalidad y los sistemas de alerta, de alerta temprana para llegar en ese llamado de 20 minutos con precisión a la necesidad pedagógica del, del chico. Ese es un desafío, porque en un piloto, como bien decía la, la, la ministra, es fácil cuando lo querés este, eh, eh, llegar al 100% de la población, tiene que ser muy preciso. Y segundo, eh, y en este sentido, este la relación tutor-docente de aula, ¿no? que, que cuando esto sea masivo ahí tiene que haber una, una, una relación de trabajo en equipo y no una atención, que es lo que a veces genera cuando, cuando, cuando parecen que las cosas van por el costado del, de la escuela tradicional. ¿no? Esto es muy contracultural para la escuela, entonces me parece que ahí hay que focalizarse en, en la formación del tutor y la relación de ese tutor eh, con, con la maestra de aula y con, y, 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 y con la escuela. A veces son dos cosas... Que, que hay que ir trabajando, pero que, que el tiempo las va a ir limando y sobre todo estas cosas eso se resuelven cuando hay buenos resultados académicos para los chicos. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Y ahora le paso la palabra a Felipe, a Pablo, a Noam. Adelante, un minuto. Noam, adelante. Please go ahead. I'm always happy to say something. Um, no, I, I think, you know, certainly I think the scale challenge is... is a big one, and it'll be really exciting to see uh, how the next steps look as, as the approaches get taken up and, and scaled. I will say in two studies I was involved in, one was done by NGO, one was done with government, and it worked just as well with the government, but it wasn't yet national scale. So I think it'll be really interesting what happens there. Um, and then, you know, one other thing, and even as the, the ministers were speaking, Uh, you know, I think things that were said were things like learning can happen anywhere. That's a very radical concept, or um, it's not just about graduating, it's about becoming a, a citizen or humanizing education. So I think this emerged as a response during COVID, but I actually think there's a lot here, and I'm really curious to see what will be absorbed into the system that's actually not COVID related, but sort of uh, gonna, gonna actually make us think about education differently in 10 years and 20 years. So maybe that, that's uncertainty rather than a challenge, but I'm very intrigued. Uh, and you know, there's analogies, you know, you think about things like mobile money, which has taken off, but mobile education has not yet taken off. What could that do for, for education systems? So I'm very intrigued to see what the future holds. Thank you so much, Noan. And uh, Felipe, Pablo, Felipe. Sí, yo veo, digo, en términos de implementación, que además nos tocó a nosotros y desarrollar la implementación, yo creo que el principal desafío tiene que ver eh, con llegar a los niños, realmente con que los niños respondan el teléfono y tengan la tutoría efectiva. ¿no? Y eso tiene que ver con, eh, con dos características de América Latina. ¿no? Una tiene que ver con la baja confianza que tenemos interpersonal, entonces que te llame por teléfono un, ex, un extraño que tú no conoces, que preguntando por tu hijo, y que la escuela a veces no te diga para qué es. Eso genera muchísimo ruido y, eh, de hecho, de, de, de miles potenciales de niños que podemos llegar, llegamos a menos de los que queríamos por ese problema de desconfianza. Y también muy relacionado con eso, la plataforma telefónica tiene una súper ventaja, eh, que es que permite llegar a lugares donde la conectividad eh, vía internet no existe, ¿no? que en las zonas rurales y en las zonas urbanas de nuestros países es fundamental. Uno no puede pensar en una tutoría eh, por internet en zonas que el 4%, el 10% tiene internet, digamos, no, no nos sirven. Estas de teléfono sí nos sirven mucho. 
Pero el problema del teléfono, de nuevo, tiene que ver con que en América Latina el teléfono está muy ligado a temas de, de inseguridad. ¿no? De donde yo vengo, en México, eh, la propaganda gubernamental constante es no respondas teléfonos de extraños. ¿no? Cualquier teléfono en extraño es un riesgo potencial. Entonces, eso con nuestra inseguridad y nuestra, eh, digamos, desconfianza en la, histórica, genera que eh, un reto muy difícil para lograr esto. Por eso que la salida es o con la escuela o con la escuela. No se puede hacer fuera de la escuela esto a escala. Cambio. Muchísimas gracias, Felipe. Pablo. No, no tengo nada más que agregar. Me pareció súper interesante la presentación. El otro Pablo. Pablo. <risa> Eh, ok, gracias Pablo. ¿Y el otro Pablo? El hecho de, de la escalabilidad, ¿verdad? Es cierto todo lo que se ha dicho hoy, realmente el reto está en integrarlo mucho mejor con lo que ocurre dentro de la escuela, eso no va a ser fácil. Eh, en transformar la formación docente para poder integrar todo, todo este trabajo, eh, y yo quiero añadir un elemento más que todavía no se ha mencionado, que es trabajar eh, de forma intencional en este vínculo que es tan fuerte y que, de hecho, nosotros no lo hemos trabajado para nada en las implementaciones. Lo hemos visto, sabemos que funciona, lo hemos visto en acción, pero no lo hemos aprovechado para hacer muchísimas más cosas que ahora mismo sí que tenemos la, la ocasión de hacer. Y, ministro, le, le garantizo que tenemos un plan. Tenemos un plan cómo escalarlo y llevarlo adelante y esperamos que podamos trabajar juntos. Gracias, Pablo. Eh, veo tres, cuatro manos levantadas. Voy a ir así por orden de, de mesa, así que le paso la palabra. Adelante. Bueno, primero que todo, gracias. Eh, voy a hablar en, en español y no en Spanglish, eh, aunque debería. Pero primero que todo, eh, causa inmensa curiosidad ver eh, la combinación de gobierno con emprendimiento eh, social, cosa que a través de la ONU casi siempre están divorciados. O sea, cuando se presentan con, eh, concursos o de gobiernos, eh, hay muchos retos de los emprendedores en tener acceso al dinero que dan los gobiernos por, eh, por razones eh, disímiles, ¿no? eh, que los gobiernos no tienen. Y lo que refería usted, ministra, de que durante la pandemia movilizar todo un sistema mamut para hacer la, la enseñanza efectiva se probó que, que era viable. Ahora, yo eh, aplaudo todas las intervenciones, pero yo creo que hay algo que es eh, necesario tener en cuenta. La educación primaria no es la educación de todo, a todos los niveles. O sea, cuando se hacen trabajos de implementación hay que pensar en trabajos de implementación a nivel primario, secundario y terciario. Porque no todo el tiempo los niños están aprendiendo matemáticas. No todos los tiempos el, el niño o el estudiante está eh, desarrollando geografía. Entonces, cuando estamos hablando de intervención educativa, también tenemos que tener en cuenta las emociones de los estudiantes, como algún panelista informó, o sea, del otro lado hay seres humanos y sobre todo los niños son muy sensibles a eh, el desencanto eh, eh, afectivo. Entonces, mi pregunta es, y tiene que ver con el hecho de cobertura versus calidad, o sea, ¿de qué manera ustedes pueden eh, establecer estrategias de implementación afectivas y no necesariamente efectivas? Es un juego de palabras. La afección versus la efectividad. Entonces, de esta manera, yo creo que es bueno tener en cuenta de que no todos los estudiantes tienen acceso a Internet y es un, una mentira creernos que eh, la cobertura de, por Internet va a solucionar todos los problemas que estamos teniendo en cuanto a retos educacionales. Nosotros lo hemos hecho y hemos tenido que volver al principio de hacerlo en persona porque la conectividad, sobre todo en regiones como en el Caribe, eh, en regiones rurales e indígenas, no existe. Y el sector privado, por desgracia, no tiene conocimiento real de cuáles son las prioridades de implementación de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Entonces, mi pregunta va al panel. ¿Cómo podemos establecer políticas de eh, intervención educativa que sean afectivas, que tengan en cuenta al ser humano y que no sean efectivas, que tengan en cuenta simplemente una ideología, un partido 
un, una circunstancia, eh, digamos, sociopolítica. Gracias. ¿Algún panelista que quiera responder a la pregunta? Ah, sí, dale, sí. Dale. Sí, si, si podéis decir el nombre antes de, de hablar. tener en cuenta que no siempre se están implementando en lugares, digamos, donde todo es de, de un solo color. O sea, cuando vas al Caribe, estás lidiando con afro-latinos, con una población que, que no, normalmente tiene, no tiene acceso a posibilidades. Entonces, por eso intento de que intentemos diversificar un poco los análisis en cuanto a implementación, en cuanto a sector rural, eh, afrodescendiente y... Eh, de juventud, porque educación, Muchas no solamente gracias. educación primaria ni matemática. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Adelante. Perfecto. Muchas gracias. María Fernanda Cámara Morales, soy de México joven activista y ante todo feminista y pues justamente ese es el tema que quiero poner sobre la mesa. Según el portal de las Naciones Unidas, el 42% de las adolescentes y las niñas en América Latina y el Caribe faltan a clases en periodo de menstruación. Es impresionante considerar que nuestras niñas y nuestras adolescentes no van a la escuela por algo tan sencillo y tan humano, tan natural como es la menstruación. En mi país se han impulsado una diversidad infinita de iniciativas gubernamentales para generar una menstruación digna, viéndose la menstruación digna como eliminar el IVA de los productos de higiene menstrual. Cuando eso no es ni de lejos pensar en menstruación digna, porque pensar en menstruación digna es que las niñas y las adolescentes tengan agua en sus primarias, en sus secundarias, cuando están en periodo menstrual. Yo crecí en una comunidad rural al sur de México, fui a la escuela primaria donde no había agua y cuando tú tenías la menstruación, lo que tenías que hacer era faltar a clases. Y si tus papás tenían la posibilidad, llevar pues, digamos lo que ahora estamos tan acostumbrados, tu pues, latita de, para poder lavarte las manos, no aparte. Aunado a eso, los productos de higiene menstrual son 2.5 veces más caro en las comunidades rurales que en las ciudades, generando que son las mujeres, las niñas y las personas menstruantes que viven en estas zonas quienes tengan los accesos más limitados a productos de higiene menstrual. Considerando que en las escuelas no hay acceso a estos productos y que este 42% de niñas y adolescentes faltan a clase por una condición que es puramente de género, porque al final del día menstruar es una cuestión de género, estamos hablando de que no se está atendiendo la educación desde una perspectiva de género, que sea además una perspectiva de género feminista. Poner este tema sobre la mesa para mí es fundamental, para que podamos empezar a hablar de cómo vamos a solucionar el acceso a productos de higiene menstrual que faciliten una educación con perspectiva de género en América Latina y el Caribe. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, muy relevante. Eh, adelante. Soy fundador de Aidos Global, es una organización social que desarrolla también un programa de tutorías en América Latina, en seis países de la región. En, además de acompañamiento telefónico, nosotros nos ocupamos de la inserción digital. Entonces, llegamos al analógico por teléfono y luego empezamos a trabajar en grupos de WhatsApp hasta que tenemos una plataforma LMS. Eh, la conflictiva que estamos encontrando en la escala de este tipo de, de programas pasa por un lado, como bien indica el ministro, por un tema de hardware y, y de conectividad, pero por otro lado es la escala de los salarios. O sea, nosotros con 50 tutoras hemos llegado a unas 16.000 mujeres. Es un programa de, de género específicamente que estamos trabajando. Y lo que nos encontramos es que nos gustaría crecer más el programa, pero que efectivamente hay un cap que es el límite que no puede para los tutores. 
con las problemáticas que venimos escuchando nosotros de financiamiento educativo, ¿cómo creen que podríamos escalar las tutorías sin a su vez escalar el gasto en, en el presupuesto educativo? Por ahí iría la pregunta. Excelente. Claro. <risa> eh, seguimos así. Por, eh, por, por allí ya no queda nadie más, ¿verdad? Entonces pasamos a este lado. Adelante. insightful presentation and inputs. Um, today I'm representing the Global Youth Review, which is an online international literary and arts platform. And this session really extensively discussed the role of technology in fostering a meaningful learning. And I'd really like to expand upon the international relevance uh, of this topic. And I really strongly feel as though countries overseas Uh, with a strong technological infrastructure have a moral and economic imperative to initiate really enriching partnerships um, with its international allies that may be lesser developed uh, in terms of technology, especially as they have the upper hand uh, in terms of technological and economic development. And I also believe that we have to also encourage uh, the use of innovation uh, and technology in education, for example, uh, through uh, the metaverse and virtual reality, uh, especially for underprivileged youth. And this definitely creates a space in which international allies, uh, which may be more technologically developed um, than their counterparts, um, can definitely aid in leading these cross-national partnerships and bolstering digital education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Mi nombre es Rosario Díaz Garavito, yo soy eh, fundadora de una organización que se llama Millennials Movement, pero también soy parte del directorio de asesores jóvenes de la iniciativa Educación y Derechos Humanos del Alto Comisionado con Sailatec y Educación eh, sobre todas las cosas, Education Above All. Y yo tengo dos preguntas. Eh, antes del COVID en el 2017, el 36% de las, de las personas eh, o estudiantes no entendían lo que leían. Esto sin contar que estábamos en una educación con herramientas digitales. Entonces, dentro de, de las eh, iniciativas que se han presentado, una de mis preguntas era cómo es que se está dando la evaluación en términos de eh, no solo la impartición del conocimiento a través de estas herramientas, pero también de eh, la de, el, el proceso de educación mismo de las personas para eh, reconocer la herramienta, poder entender lo que está eh, aprendiendo y aplicarlo a su vida para tener un desarrollo integral y también contribuir con su comunidad. Y mi otra pregunta u otra duda que salta es, considerando los niveles de violencia de nuestra región, somos la región más violenta del mundo. De, de hecho, siete de los diez países más violentos del mundo están en América Latina y el Caribe. ¿Cómo es que la violencia se toma o cómo es que este factor se toma cuando aplicamos herramientas digitales para promover políticas educativas y cómo es que sus gobiernos las están tomando para responder a las problemáticas en la, en la esfera o en el sector educación, incluso fuera de estas iniciativas tecnológicas? Entonces, esas serían mis dos preguntas. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Adelante. Sí, no, no, tiene que estar rojo. No, ad adelante, porque es que se nos está acabando el tiempo, no importa. Mi nombre es María Laura, yo soy colombiana, pero vivo aquí en Nueva York hace algunos años. Y aparte del de, eh, activismo internacional eh, referente a la educación, mi trabajo de día es ser tutora personalizada de niños no divergentes. Eh, principalmente niños con déficit de atención, en inglés sería ADHD. Entonces, mi pregunta nació del de la primera, el primer panelista, no, si no estoy mal, y va dirigida a cómo esas soluciones vía mensaje de texto o vía una llamada de 20 minutos se ajustan a las necesidades de estos niños que generalmente se benefician muchísimo de una atención personalizada y en vivo, ¿también se puede ajustar o, o cómo podría eso funcionar? Muchas gracias. Adelante. Eh... Muy buenas tardes. Eh, 
tardes a todos. Yo soy Felipe Gómez Gallo, soy de Colombia, soy representante colombiano ante la UNESCO SDG for Youth Network y soy presidente de la Plataforma Estudiantil para el Desarrollo de la Educación en Ingeniería. La pregunta que tengo para hoy es, ¿dónde están los niños, niñas y jóvenes en los procesos de toma de decisión de educación en nuestros ministerios alrededor de Latinoamérica y el Caribe? ¿Por qué no tenemos viceministros de juventudes en cada uno de los ministerios de educación para que ellos sean quienes sean los voceros de qué es lo que le está pasando a nuestros niños, niñas y jóvenes en los procesos de educativos en Latinoamérica y el Caribe? ¿Qué hace falta para que podamos movilizar esfuerzos para que esto suceda? Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. And the last question. Adelante. Bueno, ok. Hola a todos. Um, mi nombre es Cassia Cruz. Soy de Trinidad y Tobago. Um, y soy un estudiante en la Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, voy a hablar en inglés porque es mi idioma um, nativo. Y, and I don't want to offend anybody. No, no, no. <laughs> With poor grammar. So I'll just talk in English. Um, I find the intervention to be incredibly exciting. I'm excited to read the paper once it comes out, but I do have a couple of questions about the specifics. So how were these tutors selected? Because you mentioned that there was a wide range, right? Experienced teachers, retired teachers, um, students who are now finishing university. So I'd like to know how they were selected, what the matching process was like, if there was specific criteria to match these tutors with the students, and also what the content of those 20 minute conversations were kind of harping on what um, some of what the second to last speaker asked, but I'm really excited to read more about it when the paper comes out. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Y muchísimas gracias a todos. Las malas noticias. Son las 4 y 18 de la tarde. Tenemos que terminar. Mira, os enseño lo que me han dado, <laughs> por si acaso, para mantener el tiempo. Entonces, eh, os voy a pedir que ahora, después de este panel, podáis hablar directamente con los panelistas para resolver las preguntas que habéis planteado, todas extremadamente relevantes y que completan además la, la discusión de hoy. Y simplemente cerrar este panel con una reflexión. Una de las cosas que nos dijeron las familias y los niños cuando fuimos a campo a implementar estas intervenciones es que era too good to be true. Y el problema es que ¿Cuál es el estándar del servicio educativo que nosotros estamos ofreciendo para que cuando venimos con una intervención un poco más innovadora y de un poco más de calidad, nuestros clientes fundamentales, que son como decía el compañero, nuestros clientes, los niños y los jóvenes nos pregunten, esto es demasiado bueno para ser cierto, no puede ser verdad, desconfíen y se vayan. Quiero cerrar con ese mensaje. No es un mensaje de pesimismo, es un mensaje de optimismo para que realmente empecemos a pensar en políticas que cambien el tipo de servicios educativos que les ofrecemos a nuestros jóvenes para que realmente tengan oportunidades para desarrollarse y brillar en el siglo XXI. Muchas gracias a todos.
Ladies and gentlemen, oh lovely, yes. We will start in a few moments. We are still waiting for ADG Stefania Giannini to be with us, but we are starting in a few moments. Thanks to all the panelists already that are here. I'm excited also to welcome His Excellency, the Minister of Education of Belize. It's very good to have you here. Um, but bear with us, we are still waiting for ADG Stefania Giannini and I hope she will be with us in a couple of seconds. Welcome to everybody. Do take your seats. We will start in a few seconds, hopefully. Come in, come in, take a seat. We are starting shortly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in matters of time, as we are all pressed and we know we have a lot of content to cover, let me already start, although ADG Stefania Giannini shall be with us any moment, let me start to welcome you. Welcome you on behalf of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, run by the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, but also welcome you on behalf of our co-organizers of today's session on significant initiatives of transforming education. We are exploring the global citizenship perspective here and we have been co-organizing this thanks to the initiative of the Republic of Korea and to the Republic of Finland. Do come in and find a seat, there is still plenty of space available and indeed um, we will have the, the Italian minister with us, he's landing at the airport, ah, he's here, Patrizio Bianchi, wonderful, we will have him with us. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Do take a seat. One. <laughs> Welcome. So it is our honor to have distinguished speakers as much as renowned experts in the field of global citizenship. What we want to present to you today are really significant initiatives that can turn the table, can inspire us and can be scaled. Today we are interested in commitments, we are interested in action, and we are interested in countries that are walking the talk. And we have stellar examples here in Italy and Belize and of course the Republic of Korea also represented. Um, we are entering this discussion with welcoming remarks by our ministers, keynotes. And we will also be fortunate that at the end of the session, Finland will join us, the state secretary will join us, and she will sit right here, and I hope she will be in time for concluding remarks. And in between, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a panel by global citizen experts, and I will introduce them in a bit. But let me turn the floor immediately as uh, ADG Stefania Giannini is not yet with us. She was supposed to be the first speaker, but let me turn the floor immediately to His Excellency Ban Ki-moon himself, who left us a video message for this session. And I hope that 
technical elements function. Bear with me. Dear panelists and guests, I'm pleased to be a part of this uh, timely event during the week of World Environment Day, which advocates for multilateralism and collective decision making for climate action. The worsening climate crisis is impacting every aspect of our lives, is further increasing the threat of violent conflict health issues, and food insecurity. The world is stuck in a tangle of alarming, severe crises that demand urgent action. All these global issues have consequences far beyond their immediate impacts, most particularly when it comes to food production. We are losing much of the development we have gained through the past decades. Action is needed, and it is needed now. This is why I welcome the UK government's agriculture breakthrough, which will unlock further collaboration for food systems and investment in agricultural research and innovation while championing climate adaptive solutions. Better efficiency and resilience in food systems are fundamental in achieving social, economic, nutritional, and environmental goals. The right investment in research and innovation, smallholders, farmers, especially women, indigenous peoples, and youth can be part of the solution to many of the challenges we face today. In this regard, global champions like the worldwide research group CGIAR need to receive more funding for the acceleration of adaptation in... Ladies and gentlemen, techniques is seemingly a tricky thing and unfortunately, the video statement that was supposed to play did not play. So I do hope that you bear with me and eventually during the event we will manage to get the right words of SG Bam to hear them at this session. Let me turn the floor immediately to His Excellency, the Minister of Education of Italy, His Excellency Patrizio Bianchi, um, for his statement on global citizenship education, Italy's effort in education, and for his keynote remarks regarding this transformative education summit that we're all at today. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you to everybody, and thank you for this opportunity to speak together about this kind of issue. What is impressing me? in all the preparatory activities that we did, for instance, in, in Paris with uh, Stefania Giannini, is that we are working in our own country, more or less, on the same issues. Which is the issue? We are discovering, after pandemic, after the war, after globalization, how central is education in transforming societies. We know we are in a very strange moment of our collective life. After so many years, years of uh, globalization, we had the idea many years ago, 30 years ago, that it was enough to liberalize the economy in order to generate a real collective global community. And we discovered that it is not enough. We need more. We need that the people can speak the same sort of languages. Language, that means uh, the content. We are discovering that in this period of time is not enough to provide information. Let me say that I ask myself, 
many times. Is it real importance called in period of internet, of Wikipedia, where it's possible to have all the information in any moment? When I was young, oh, I call it a cousin. Ciao. <laughs> Professoressa Giannini. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we have a very long experience as rectors together. <laughs> and uh, is there a real role for the school in period of Wikipedia where it is possible to have all the information at the same time at present? When I was young many years ago, and you have to say no, many years ago, <laughs> I wake up in the morning, I have a, a word, and I say, okay, I have to ask to my teacher. Now immediately we go on Wikipedia, you discover the thing. Well, in this time, school education is more and more important because we are free of information and we are rediscovering that school is human experience. And the key concept of this discussion of today that we are testing in our, in, a, in our country is that this concept of transformative education that is the pillar of our discussion of today. What does it mean, transformative? It means that, that education today is not only, and this is important, the way to permit to the person to improve their position, to improve the knowledge. But now education is also transformative because education has the duty to transform society, to building up the community. And it's clear that at this time, where we are discovering that economy is not enough to create a global community, school is the main driver of the new possibility to create a global community going beyond the war, going beyond the crisis, going beyond the pandemic. For this reason, it's so crucial the word inclusion. You will ask me what we have done about inclusion. Let me say that uh, it's many, many years, starting from the, from the 70s, that in Italy we have very clear that we need a school based on inclusion, disadvantaged people. And uh, to create the idea that uh, equality is not simply a result or natural condition, but is the result of our investment. School is the place where we have the moral duty to create equality, equality and the opportunity. And of course, after that, there are many different pathways. We are investing massively now. Let me say thanks to the European community, to the European Union, to Europe, with this extraordinary program on uh, resilience, extraordinary world, not just resistance, but resilience, the capacity to adjust ourselves in order to innovate, but all together. And I feel that this is probably the main concept that we have today, because the third word is integration. Integration is not just to accept somebody that is coming. No, this is it's, it's difficult, but it's not enough. The concept of integration is based on the concept of complementarity. That is the idea that when somebody is coming, the real problem is that I have to adjust myself. Is to find, to look together the basic idea of uh, efficiency, of collective efficiency since the Enlightenment. That is not just specialization, but specialization and complementarity. My capacity to identify my own pathway but my pathway is given by the, my capacity to adjust myself, not to be complementary with you, with you, with you. I feel that this is extremely important nowadays. This is what we have discussed in Paris. This is the, the, the first yeah. working group that we have done in Paris. Uh, inclusion, integration, resilience. And 
this for this concept, precious concept of transformative education. And let me say that I'm very happy that before the General Assembly, we are here to discuss about that. Because I feel that in this moment, uh, we have to give this sense of hope also to the Prime Minister, to the Head of State. School is not just an infrastructure. The school is not just something that is you, something that is part of the environment. No, school is the key of transformation of our society. Let me say also the last word on this idea that you put on the table of civic education. In the past, we have a, a course of civic education in my country, one hour a week, because you cannot uh, say more than one hour a week. After that, it disappeared. Now we restore this idea, but it's not just uh, a hour a week. It's a fundamental part of our program. And we introduced the idea that uh, environment, sustainability is crucial. But it's crucial, why? Because it is a public good. Environment is a public good. It's something that I have because Stefania has. But it's a global public good. And this is the innovation. Because we are used to consider the public goods at national level. My environment is not at national level. The uh, couple, the idea of public good at global level is challenging also our story of identification at national level is a key, is a powerful key to go beyond our experience and to discover that school is the key, the real key, the only possible key for a transformation of society and to work for peace. School, hope for peace. Thank you. Thank you. Eat school, the place for hope, the place for peace, the place for inclusion, the place for integration, the place for resilience. Very important things that you have given us on the way. Dear ADG Stefania Giannini, you made it. Um, thank you so much for the honor of being here today, sharing with us your thoughts on global citizenship education before I give the floor to our minister from Belize who will share from his perspective and his country's point of view on what can be done. Before that, dear ADG Stefania Giannini, please your remarks on global citizenship education as the second side of the coin of SDG 4.7, together with ESD, Education for Sustainable Development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor. Can you hear me? Yeah? A great pleasure to join this session, so important, so crucial for the common task we have, uh, transforming education to transform society, just to put in a nutshell, <laughs> a very complex uh, discussion. Not easy to come uh, immediately after my dear friend <laughs> and colleague uh, Patrizio Bianchi for his inspiring uh, and, uh, as usual, engaged words. Let me briefly reflect from UNESCO perspective, that is my current position, as you know, but just also building a little bit on other steps of my career where in a country which made inclusion many decades ago, the very, very, you know, red line of many policies in education and elsewhere, uh, just to see where we are now, where we can go together, and which is also the added value of this uh, intensive three days uh, in New York at the UN, which is not so obvious, you're right, that the General Assembly of the UN uh, is going to start with a discussion on education, for education, putting at the leaders' level on Monday, we'll see, this uh, top, top priority. So, a few words uh, put in my hat. You reminded me, Patricia, to our, our common experience at university level, where we are rector together. 
and uh, you are an economist, I'm a linguist. So transformation is a notion which reminds all of us to the Greek, ancient Greek word, metamorphosis, which means uh, reshaping, changing the shape and the context of what we are dealing with. And reshaping education today means, uh, of course, first starting from the challenges we have, challenges which are not necessarily within education systems. I call them by name, work, intolerance, discrimination, inequalities, environment and the planet under threat, and uh, exclusion. I mean, a, a real word, the key word to understand the, the, some part of the heritage of the last century, the negative side, of course, is exclusion. Too many people still feel to be out of the system. And of course, we cannot say that education is the, you know, whatever the, the question, education is the answer. I don't feel so comfortable. Otherwise, we lose the focus. We lose the real way to, to address concretely with actions and also solutions. This is the solutions day, by the way, at the test. But of course, we can say that as education is the only way to do the best of ourselves first, and to give uh, children, learners, whatever, whatever the age, the real tools to find their own way to understand the, real, the reality and to make uh, uh, you know, their commitment in life uh, for uh, a better society, which means uh, a new, in current times, trouble current, current times, uh, to find a new rebalanced relationship with nature, the planet, with others, and also with technology which is very much part of the equation now. So if education is very much at the core of this reshaping exercise we are doing, I think we have also to focus within our UN agenda, a common shared uh, action plan to change the world, SDG4 is the core of this uh, common action plan, we have to rethink a little bit if the notion of global citizenship and education for sustainable development are still updated to the task we have. For sure, on one side, and thanks to Ban Ki-moon Center and other partners here around the, the table, uh, our category two center uh, in Seoul uh, and uh, our dear friends, uh, uh, we share you know, in other contexts, the same discussion. Of course, we can say yes, for sure. Affirming, reaffirming the importance uh, to include uh, education for sustainable development as it's been designed in, in uh, 4.7. It, it means uh, knowledge, awareness, uh, and, uh, and uh, attitudes to, to be uh, good citizens it's still very much important. Of course, we can say that the notion of uh, being citizens, not only at local level, in your own community, in your town, in your nation, in your country, but also having in mind that the big challenges today must be for sure to be understood, to be framed beyond the territories and also the sense of belonging to your community. This is still very much important. However, maybe this, the, the same notion of global citizenship is to be reframed, is to be updated. Now, the dimension we have is the planet. And I think that what we are thinking with some friends also in this room today is to, to propose a more visionary notion of citizenship. And it comes to 
a radical change of the way we are learning and teaching. It's not simply a nice subject to add, like uh, civic education uh, years ago in uh, some European countries, including Italy. It's really very much about, for instance, uh, building on cooperation, solidarity, and team working in the classroom. It's about incentivize the teachers in their job, in their work, to, to work together and to have a, a partnership and a cooperation as the very first part of their uh, job description, so to say, and their objectives. It's very much about uh, having, uh, as we say, also many times in these days, uh, a whole of school uh, uh, holistic approach to 4.7 and not uh, simply a new subject or a few hours more in the classroom. So I think that if we put together all these different perspectives, uh, if, we, if we take also as international organizations the responsibility to make the system accountable in the coming months and years about this not easy part of 2030 agenda, because it's not about uh, a quantitative dimension and quantitative measure, but it's about uh, evaluating the impact of a new model of a real transformation will be very much close to make uh, education the most powerful tool to create the citizens that this world actually dramatically need for the current times and the future. And this is what we can do together. And I thank you very much, UNESCO for sure, as you know, is the organization which is uh, keen to develop among the other issues, especially this very transformative one. Thank you. ESCO and the tireless work that has been conducted over the years on global citizenship education, on education for sustainable development, that brought us here to talk about the transformations. I'm taking away the belonging, the vision, the transformation, the accountability, the holistic approach that you were uh, advocating. Thank you for your words. And definitely our, our negotiations, our discussions need to continue to put these things into practice. And one country that managed that incredibly well is with us today um, in the form of His Excellency, Minister Fonseca, who is the Minister of Education of Belize. And handing over to you for your remarks, please. Thank you. It is my distinct honor and pleasure uh, to join you this afternoon for this important discussion on transformative education, a global citizenship education perspective. Allow me to place on record my sincere gratitude to the mission of Korea, uh, UNICEF, UNESCO, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon and the Ban Ki-moon Center for hosting this event and providing me with this opportunity to share with you, on behalf of Belize, my country, uh, some of the work that we are doing and the experiences we have had as we seek to transform education in our country. The vision statement as set out in the Belize Education Sector Plan 2021-2025 states that the Belize education system will be inclusive of high quality, accessible, equitable, technologically driven, and capable of fostering the development of good, productive citizens. The system will be accountable and effective in providing the support necessary to allow students, regardless of individual or family characteristics, to achieve their full personal and academic potential and to contribute positively to national development. We meet today after two of the most difficult and challenging years in our global education system. For us in Belize, and I dare say for all small developing countries, it has been two years of lost learning, two years of sacrifice and hardship, 
two years of uncertainty, two years in which access, equity, inclusion, and quality were all limited and hard-fought gains were reversed. The magnitude of this crisis cannot be overstated. In Belize, we understood that this required a response grounded in a strong sense of purpose and urgency. Small incremental moves would not suffice. This was a time and opportunity for bold, transformative change. We recognized, of course, that if we were to have any chance of success, our efforts would have to be based on comprehensive, meaningful engagement and consultations with all the members of our education community. And so the work began. The ministry's efforts in those first months were characterized by the understanding that, as I'm sure all of you can appreciate, a one-size-fits-all option would not work. Flexibility had to be key. The impact of the pandemic on everyone's mental health and wellness could not be ignored. Consultations happened through surveys and forms geared at teachers to determine their feelings of readiness, at school communities to determine their needs in multiple areas, from electronic devices to cleaning supplies, and at the school itself to monitor and log the suspected and reported incidents of COVID. The GIS data hub on the ministry's website tracked school openings for the public and provided a real-time mapping of school situations during a time when constant change was normal. While these various things were happening on the ground, several parallel activities were taking place within the ministry. First, in keeping with the commitment from Plan Belize, the ministry launched the Teacher Learning Institute as a virtual hub on August 1, 2021. The TLI was designed to provide structured, comprehensive, air-round professional development programs based on identified needs of teachers and school leaders. The sessions on the TLI are relevant, providing support for teachers in how to teach using technology, as well as in what to teach so teachers can stay current with pedagogy. In August of 2021, the ministry introduced the Belize Education Sector Plan, which takes into account the knowledge and information gleaned from previous years and marries that with the goals and vision of our overall national development plan, Plan Belize to allow us to identify key strategic areas that the ministry could focus on with the ultimate goal of making education work for Belize. By focusing attention on reforming the system of education, transforming teaching and learning, prioritizing underserved sectors, and maximizing human capital, the ministry sought to address challenges and support meaningful change at every level of the system. Even before the launch of the BES plan, focused work had started on curriculum reform. And the Curriculum Reform Steering Committee was formed with representatives from education stakeholders, principals, teachers, students, union representatives from primary to tertiary level were included and an extensive consultation process began. With the unwavering support of UNICEF, 14 months and 30 consultations later, the steering committee produced a national curriculum framework, a document which recognizes the reality of curriculum overload, supports the reduction of learning outcomes, and emphasizes the value of competency-based education. The national curriculum reform framework based on International Bureau of Education and UNESCO standards 
to guide the development of the national curriculum at the pre-primary, primary and secondary levels of education with a focus on student competency was launched in July of 2022. Following the development of the framework will be the development of competency-based unit plans and assessments utilizing authentic student-centered pedagogies such as inquiry, discovery, cooperation, experiential problem and project-based learning. Very importantly, in keeping with the objectives of the competency-based curriculum is the Think Equal program, which will begin to be used in every infant one classroom across the country of Belize in October of 2022. Think Equal, as I think you may all know, is a comprehensive, holistic program designed to equip preschool children with the foundation they need for positive lives. The focus on social and emotional learning is a natural complement to the national curriculum framework with its targeted efforts to teach values and psychosocial skills and competencies which will engender empathy, self-esteem, and respect for the dignity, value, and equality of others. Already being implemented in 20 other countries, this nationwide rollout in Belize will be truly revolutionary and impactful for our young, youngest students. Belize joins the call on governments, policymakers, and school communities to adopt the Think Equal program. In Belize, we're not just talking about the lofty, bold vision laid out in Mission 4.7. We are walking the walk and implementing that vision, education for sustainable development, global citizenship education, environmental education, peace and human rights education. These are all fundamental components of our new national curriculum framework. The work of the ministry continued in other areas too. Uh, to answer without listening, that, that is folly and shame, is a proverb that we subscribe to. Because, and so the consultations and dialogue continued. It was clear that if Belize is to learn from the lessons of the, the recent past, we would have to adjust not only what we teach, but how we teach. We would have to consider the practical uses of the internet in schools and determine how to ensure that all schools could have adequate access to the internet and all students could have access to devices. The ministry successful, successfully renegotiated an agreement to upgrade and expand internet infrastructure in schools countrywide. Schools that already had internet access, but only in limited areas, will now be able to enjoy internet access in all classrooms and common areas. The GIS mapping that fast-tracked schools reopening in the midst of the pandemic is now being used to support a, a very important project we call Connect Ed which will support the agreement that we have now signed with GIGA to work towards ensuring that all schools across Belize will be able to connect to the internet. This awareness of the critical role technology and access to technology must play in education has continued to color the ministry's work. Through a loan from the International Development Bank, the ministry has embarked on the development and construction of a STEAM lab school, the first of its kind, in the Caribbean and Central America. Belize has been chosen to participate in the Code Caribbean project, which will introduce coding into primary schools. We have signed an agreement with NASA and the US government to join the GLOBE program, which will soon begin to run in primary and secondary schools countrywide. The ministry has now begun with the support of the UNDP to work on a comprehensive national science and technology strategy. Meanwhile, multiple partners have moved to assist with providing electronic devices to students across the country. 
and we have launched the first ever national school portal, um, which is we call the 501 Academy, which exists as a learning platform to provide quality online open educational resources, which will facilitate both remote learning and the appropriate implementation of the national curriculum. The 501 Academy has helped us over the summer to, to embark on a very important initiative, uh, Let's Catch Up Summer Program, an eight week uh, summer program, which um, focused on foundational literacy and numeracy for students, particularly at the ages of five to nine, taught by master teachers, live streamed into classrooms across the country for students and teachers who were present for face-to-face -face interactions and into homes everywhere for those who were able to access through YouTube or Facebook or to, or to tune into the radio. Supported by UNICEF, IOM, and, and our own local uh, broadband providers, this program bridged the need to provide lessons in reading and math for our youngest students. One of the in exciting initiatives from the 501 Hub is what we call the Inclusive Corner, and this is special education. The Inclusive Corner is reflective of the massive energy that the ministry has devoted to special education in the past year. The pioneering work of the special education unit ranges from conducting parent and teacher trainings to collaborating with therapy adventures out of Chicago to provide long-term therapy opportunities uh, to building capacity within the special education unit. The reality is that we have learned that it's important to build capacity from the inside out. And the ministry has recognized that just like with varied learning needs, students at all levels are impacted by realities outside their control. So programs like Think Equal, the National Healthy Start Feeding Program, Connect Ed, the Education Upliftment Project, Together We Rise, are all designed to support students in ways that are more than academic. Um, and over the past year, we have used, we have worked refining the curriculum, training teachers, education officers, adjusting processes um, to make them more relevant and accessible. Um, and this social emotional work of recognizing the needs of school communities, I'm ending here, and then finding the resources to support these needs, whether tangible or intangible, has required the ministry to be creative. The experiences of the past 18 months, which I have been honored to share with you uh, over my time, um, has made the goal of making education work for Belize go prove established that that goes way beyond academics, beyond the doubt that we are transforming and reforming our education system, uh, which, of course, global citizenship education is all about. So thank you very much. I wish more countries could be as enthusiastic as Belize. Thanks for all your passion that you put into it and your great efforts. Another country that is almost equally passionate in a different way is the Republic of Korea. And it's my pleasure to give the floor to Utak Chang, the official representative of the Republic of Korea. Please keep your statement yeah. Yeah. to the agreed time. Thank you. Yeah. His Excellency Minister, uh, Madam uh, ADG for Education UNESCO, it is my great pleasure to be here at the side event of Transforming Education Summit on the Global Citizens of Education. Uh, I would like to sincerely thank the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens uh, for organizing uh, this wonderful uh, meeting. As a collective uh, global community, the commitments of governments around the world has uh, highly contributed to the development of global citizens of education. One major uh, achievement was inclusion of global citizens of education in SDG through SDG target 4.7 in 2015. The task of ensuring the global citizens of education is embedded in education system around the world by 2030 is now at stake. 
I am confident that the discussion in this room will serve to take our efforts to the next step. The Republic of Korea has a truly inseparable relationship with global citizens of education. Since 2012, the Republic of Korea has contributed to inclusion of global citizens of education into SDG. After the adoption of SDG 4.7, the Republic of Korea has a highly involved in introducing global citizens of education globally. While there are accomplishments to take credit for, we have to also address the rise of new challenges across the world, which ask us to rethink the role of global citizens of education. Rising economic uh, inequalities, increased uh, migration of peoples, and intercultural conflicts are only some of these challenges. At the same time, the rise of nationalist ideas and the populism uh, poses a threat to global peace. As uh, underlined in the publication, GCD and the rise of national perspectives by UNESCO and APSEU, there is a need to address root causes of these challenges and support the process by promoting the universal uh, vision of global citizens of education. Building networks and partnerships at global and the regional level provide an opportunity for diverse stakeholders to share their experiences on global citizens of education. The Republic of Korea is uh, leading the initiative to promote dialogue on GCD with a wide array of actors through particularly Asia and Pacific as well as Africa and Arab states, Latin America and the Caribbean, North America and Europe. I hope that UN will be an avenue to explore opportunity for possible global collaboration for global citizens of education. In this context, the Republic of Korea would like to propose to revitalize, vitalize, revitalize the friend group, friends group of global citizens of education uh, in UN or outside of UN. Uh, considering the momentum of global and regional dynamics, I believe that Friends Group of Global Citizens of Education will provide a platform to discuss action to strengthen global citizens of education further and explore areas of a possible collaboration. For this, I am sincerely looking forward to the discussion that will take place in this room. Once again, I sincerely appreciate the cooperation and partner countries and organizations, and I hope that these gatherings will be another milestone that marks our commitment in promoting education for global citizenship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Utak Chang, a champion of GCD for years and years, and of course, a very important representative of the Republic of Korea. In matters of time, we are running short, and I have fascinating people to introduce to you. So the next uh, item on my agenda is the panel, and I'm very, very keen to let you know that we have stellar people like Leslie Adwin, the founder of Think Equal, which we have heard about already in the, in the speech. We have Lim Yun Muk, he is the director of UNESCO APSEU, also referred to already a center that is very much carrying the torch of GCED. We have Professor William Godelli, who is a renowned expert on global citizenship education and just published a book or not so long ago and will tell us more about that. Professor at Lay University. Um, Rili Lapalainen, a founder of Bridge 47, a very important European initiative on global citizenship, a whole network, he will tell us more about that. And last but by no means least, Linda Nakabaile, who is a program associate in the Raising Teenager Uganda effort. And she is a girls' rights and education advocate, and we will learn more about that. I have one question to the overall panel that we'll discuss now. And this one question I would ask each of you to answer within Snappy one to two minutes. It's tricky, but 
what is the one thing that you want the audience to leave with to know about your efforts on global citizenship education? What is your elevator pitch? And I would like to give the floor first to Leslie. Is this on? Okay. The most critical thing from the point of view of the Think Equal movement and program is that we need to include social justice as a concept when we talk about social and emotional learning. And it's not enough to be focused on a few competencies and skills that begin with the letter C, for example. It just does not cut it anymore. We are in a critical situation where our children, one in six of them, have diagnosable mental health disorders, where violence and discrimination are at pandemic proportions. And we absolutely now have to bring to the table in a concrete, tangible way, the missing dimension to education, which is social and emotional learning for well-being and social justice. We have to do this in the earliest years. This isn't rocket science, it's neuroscience. Quite simply, before the age of six, we have to put the foundation in if we are to co-create in a partnership of learning with our children, pro-social attitudes and behaviors, and diminish anti-social attitudes and behaviors. The visionary example of Belize, and I'm thrilled to say there is enormous progress from other countries too, but Belize, God bless you, Minister Fonseca, and I'm not even religious, so. <laughs> Honestly, this is what we need, this kind of bold um, assertion that we will plunge in. We will go for this with concrete tools to express our curricular frameworks. Because there's a massive disconnect in the early years. We treat our early years practitioners as babysitters. We don't respect them, we underpay them, we undervalue them, and they are the gateway to sustainable development. And so we have to give them the tools in their hands and not just theories and not just speeches or pedagogies. As Minister, Honorable Minister Fonseca has said, we have to walk the walk now, tangibly. One minute, two minutes, I could go on for hours. Thank you. <laughs> Leslie, thanks for your power. The early years, we have heard your message. So everyone in this room and outside listening to us who needs to do more on that, turn to Think Equal. The next one on my list of speakers for his elevator pitch is Lim Yun Muk. And I would like to ask you, Director, APSIU, UNESCO APSIU in Korea has done a lot what is your elevator pitch? Thank you, Monica. Um, um, Excellencies, uh, Ministers of Education and ADG UNESCO has just left. But yeah, uh, many colleagues and friends, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, well, uh, APCIU, um, FCU is a UNESCO center based in Seoul, Korea. Uh, our prime mission is to promote global citizenship education in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. And we, uh, we have been con uh, doing various uh, capacity building programs over the last more than 20 years. And I am very pleased to see some of our alumni here, uh, Victoria. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> So, but um, here I like I want to share with you a um, story of uh, transforming education through uh, reforming national curriculum, just like uh, our Minister Belize has uh, shared with us. Um, we have just finished uh, our project to integrate GCE, global citizenship education 
into the national curriculum of Kenya. We have worked with the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, KICD. I have brought some materials with me and uh, fortunately the key person in this institute, KICD, was uh, uh, our alumni and she was very keen on uh, following up on uh, activities to promote GCED in Kenya and uh, so we have partnered with this institute uh, KICD and we have developed these materials. Not only that, uh, we, we are very successful in integrating GCED in the national curriculum of Kenya and they have um, uh, conducted this uh, uh, trial on some areas and uh, there were very successful cases. Uh, for instance, um, I, uh, I can share with you uh, in some schools, uh, girls, students uh, were saying that after receiving this global citizenship education, I no longer think there is a distinction between what man can do and what woman can do. So now I think I can do anything which I wish to do. So this is a marvelous experience. This is the power of GCED. So that's my story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Lim. We now know if there is a country out there like Kenya who is interested to integrate GCED into their national policy, you have a source to turn to. Bill, Bill Godelli, author of several books, uh, one of them on global citizenship, we want to hear your vantage point of what do you consider to be the most important message that the audience should walk away with you? Thank you, Monica, and thank you all for gathering tonight. Uh, I'm happy to do that. I'm representing Lehigh University, which sits in the northeast corner of Pennsylvania. And one of the things I'm most proud about is our Global Social Impact Fellowships. So these are undergraduate students working with faculty in all corners of the world on social problems in solidarity with the local community to address those problems. I'll give you some examples. In the Philippines, we're working with women to recycle plastics and engage in the development of high-value products out of those plastics. Again, done in community, in solidarity with the women on site. Uh, these are undergraduates. So some of these young people are 19 years old who are leading this work. They're truly leading the work. I'm in charge of one of the projects, and I'm not in charge at all. They're running the show. In Sierra Leone, we're working with school partners to diagnose autism spectrum disorder and to intervene in approaches to address drawing out communication. Um, also in Sierra Leone, doing food insecurity and mushroom uh, cultivation um, in low nutrition areas. In Kazakhstan, working on environmental education through a game app uh, through, delivered through the Ministry of Education, coupled with studies in air pollution in Almaty. I could go on and on. There are 45 projects that are on our website, but I would recommend those as places where what are we ultimately doing? We're giving students the experience of working in solidarity, in community, and in relationship around the world so they can have a journey outside of themselves to understand the world from an outside perspective, but ultimately for a journey within. And to go back to the, the work that I published in 2016 that Monica was very kind to cite, the idea here is that Global citizenship education, in its essence to me, is both the journey within and a journey outside, and a willingness to change oneself to be the change in the world that you hope to be. So this is a short preview of what we're doing at the undergraduate level. Happy to share more about that. But in essence, it's global learning in solidarity, in community, to address social problems. Thanks. Bill, thank you very much. As a university professor, kudos to you that you kept it to the two minutes. Wow, <laughs> brilliant. The next one on my list who will give surely an amazing elevator pitch is Rili Lapalainen, the founder of Bridge 47, very active in the region of Europe and beyond. Rili, over to you, GCD. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, and very much thank you for the invitation and really pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, what I would like to bring here is that there's uh, 24 hours per day, each of us being the active citizens. 
And I, I think that's really is the point that we shouldn't really forget that the people are having other lives out of schools, out of the working place. They really have many, many roles. And that's exactly where we definitely need to really promote that one. So exactly the formal education, informal education, non-formal ed education, lifelong learning, all of these are fundamentally important tools so that all of us, we can take our responsibilities in the societies and really remembering that I am because we are. So we definitely need to work together. We are nothing alone, but we need to really find the ways how we can really collaborate. So the Bridge 47 is, is the global network. We have the, our colleagues all over the world and the main point is really defining the ways how we can really make the space and recognition, support, value, or all of this for the global citizenship education, including the whole 4.7, because there are many other educations. You name it like the peace education, human rights education, education for sustainable development, doesn't matter. All of those are needed. And I think that we definitely need to join the forces. And, and that's why it's really, really important one that we collaborate with the governments, we collaborate with civil society, academics, local authorities, whoever, but also hold the governments accountable because the STD 4.7, it's agreed in this building, and then we need to make it sure that it's implemented. We just have too short time, 2030s next door, and I think we need to definitely speed up. And that's why the transforming education summit is so important that we definitely need to use this opportunity. It's one in a lifetime when we have this summit and we have to take best out of that and really implement the transforming education. Thank you very much. Thank you, really. So I hope I'm right to summarize that people can turn to Bridge 47 if they want to involve in a partnership that involves formal and informal learning and has best practice to share. Wonderful. Linda, over to you from your perspective as a girls advocate and one who is very much into education for girls. What is your story? What does it contribute to GCED? Please share. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm the only youth on this panel, so I'm excited. <laughs> and I'm no expert, but I'm just a young person from Uganda that is just trying to make this world a little better for all of us, which is global citizenship education. But I'll just share how global citizenship education can promote gender equality. It is very, very important. I come from a community where girls, for example, during COVID-19 were not learning. And I went ahead and formed clubs in the community uh, of girls that were pregnant and victims of um, child marriages and those that communities had excluded. And I was able to empower them with leadership skills, with civic um, education. I empowered them with knowledge about their rights. And that built the agency to demand for the right to education. I was able to work with parents because they're key stakeholders in this. I was able to work with um, school leadership and the district leadership to ensure that these girls are supported to get back to school. And when they got back to school, uh, these clubs continued running uh, in terms of empowering them with more. Is it working? <laughs> <laughs> I speak so first. Um, to empower them with knowledge and skills to be able to demand for the right to education, not only for themselves, but for others. Some of the girls that got pregnant were able to give birth, return to school, and demand for the right to education for themselves and their peers that are out of school. And now that is being selfless, that is caring, that is empathy. They want to create change in the community and the global world, and then understanding that child marriage or is not only limited to Uganda, but it's a global challenge. So I've been able to, um, through these clubs, empower these young people to become global citizens. And the fact that I've raised a movement of young people in Uganda that are doing tremendously in demanding their right to education, in calling out leaders to take action, for me, is the purpose of global citizenship education. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Linda, for the incredible work that you're doing for so many young ladies. Dear panel, I have the next challenge for you, and I'm keen to listen to anyone who wants to react. My question would be, we are here to gather commitments. We do want to know what's happening after the test, because just talking is just not good enough. So I'm wondering, what are your concrete commitments for after 
the Transformative Education Summit 2022. What do you want to move on with? What can you commit to? Who wants to start? Any volunteers? Yes, please, Linda, go. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. For me, one of my commitments is to hold my government accountable. <laughs> the government of Uganda, the making commitments on the 19th. Yes. And I think as a youth, I mean, we cannot talk about global citizenship education without emphasizing the role youth, youth or young people play. So there is no way I'm going to sit there and just let my, my president do nothing about this. So I'm going to hold him accountable and also hold the ministers of education here accountable because it's a global, <laughs> yes, and hold them accountable to take action on the commitments you've made today. And the other thing is to widen the scope of um, the, the work I'm doing. So I intend to partner and collaborate with organizations and the ministers of education in Uganda to ensure that we have more girls out of school as well, getting back to school through these clubs, building their agency, building their capacity to be able to demand for their right to education, and not only education, the right to sexual reproductive health rights and information, the right to health, the right to make decisions for themselves on issues that directly affect them. So those are some of the things I intend to do. Hold government accountable, hold myself accountable, because I have a role to play, and hold you ministers accountable, yes. I think those are some of the things that I intend to do. Excellent, Linda. Really is the next, please, really. Everybody accountable or not that, because definitely we as a global citizens, we have to be accountable vis-a-vis. -vis. So in, in that way, it's everybody's business, but definitely, of course, there are some kind of structures in the societies, in the governments, and the governments are really in, in, in the, absolutely those who are making the decisions as well, including that how we are monitoring the Transforming Education Summit. What are the results coming here? What is the monitoring system? So definitely that's, that's one uh, indicator what we are going to follow so we, we can commit ourselves on that. Secondly, I, I think that it comes back to the national realities where what are the curriculums, what are the laws, what are the budget, all, all of these tools really matters that how we really have the resources to implement what we have believed and put to the table and agreed in, in this house. So that's ex extremely important one. And, and definitely then I think that we need to really unite the, the different st st uh, stakeholders. We need to work much more together because no one, we can't really find the individual solutions. So we need the knowledge from the different actors in the societies. And that's what I'm, I'm really encouraging for the partnership much more. Thank you. More partnership, like even Utak Chang said, group of friends on GCED, interesting efforts that are going on here. Bill, over to you. Rooms like this for now over 30 years talking about these issues, as many of you have. And I'm really happy, Linda, that you're here because you all need to pick up the baton and we've not left it in great shape. So this is the next step. But I would say to your accountability point that I recognized in my career that I was separating this from everything else I was doing. And the more that I found mergers between what I was doing in my regular life as dean, as vice provost, as professor, and the work that I cared deeply and passionately about global citizenship education, that's where the sweet spot is. And so I think we need to bring that kind of discourse, what's happening in this room, into all walks of our life and not see it as a segmented discourse that we have separately with folks that we all know are going to nod their heads when they hear these things. So that, to me, has been my call in the past five years. Um, in particular, we're working with the College of Health. They're developing a global health uh, curriculum for their students that's very experientially oriented. Really excited to see that take come off. Uh, we're also working with um, other units within the university to position around the SDGs uh, because there's so much there in terms of building a collaborative curriculum and that really becomes can become the basis of a curriculum for a university. So again, trying to merge these two worlds has been my call and I think going forward uh, will continue to be. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. Leslie, are you ready? Think equals commitment is a modest one. To reach every child in every classroom in every country in the world by 2030. 
and we're on course. We're currently in 22 countries. You've heard the glittering example of Belize, Honorable Minister Fonseca, Diane Castillo Mejia, who is the CEO of the Education Ministry of Belize, also here, um, and Secretary of State for Belize, um, Honorable Minister Zabani, who, who will uh, be here tomorrow. Um, look, they understand, this is what accountability is. They understand that today, you, if you take seriously as a policymaker your duty of care to your youngest, most vulnerable citizens, you cannot deem it to be compulsory for your children to learn numeracy and literacy, and it'd be optional for them to learn how to value another human being or how to take care of people and planet. This cannot be optional. Now, we also have North Macedonia, funded by the World Bank and with our partners, UNICEF, rolling this program out concretely to every single four to five-year-old child as part of the national curriculum in the entire country. We have the Cape, Eastern Cape Province in South Africa, rolling this out now to 4,100 classrooms. This is a program that's been designed to replicate and scale. That's how we'll get there by 2030. We have Monterrey, the second biggest city in Mexico, where the mayor is so enlightened that he is funding and giving this program to every single child in the entire city on three levels, three to six-year-olds. Uh, we have such examples of provinces and cities. We also have two countries who are desperate to start now. Gambia, one of the poorest countries in Africa, and Ukraine. And the governments have committed to this. All we lack is the funding. Who here is going to be accountable and come and help us fund these countries? Let me give you one glittering example of the best human being I know. Jennifer Gross is sitting right in front of me, diagonally opposite, Jen, has single-handedly funded the country of Belize. This is where optimism lies for Agenda 2030, for Mission 4.7, and I must mention them under the, the leadership, I think equal is on the education task force. Uh, of, of co-chairs Ban Ki-moon and the Ban Ki-moon Center, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, His Holiness Pope Francis, and um, Madame Audrey Azoulay, Director General of, of UNESCO. And, and I thank them for their leadership with all of my heart. Um, I think you can sort of um, uh, get the idea that this is now the entire purpose of my life with every breath I take. <laughs> well, Leslie. Thank you to Leslie, thank you to Jennifer. We need more Jennifers in this world. Um, dear Director Lim, what is the commitment that you can make? Yes, um, well, um, I totally agree with uh, what uh, the other colleagues have just said. Um, and I think it is very important for us here, all of us here, to do something which we can do in our communities, in our schools, in our, um, in our societies, in our, in our countries. So uh, in my case, the Asia Pacific Center of Education for International Understanding, quite long name. Um, for us, um, we, we will do something which we can do after this Transforming Education Summit Meeting, which is all about transforming education. Well, um, to transform our education, we need a lot of, we need to do a lot of things uh, from education policy, curriculum, teacher development, assessment, everything. But for us, we will concentrate on teachers who are, the, who are the key to transforming education. 
Well, uh, um, in my uh, last intervention, I mentioned the our capacity building programs, and we usually invite educators and teachers and policymakers and youth to South Korea, and we provide them with capacity building opportunities. But um, after this meeting, we will um, try to establish capacity building centers in 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 some country in in our partner countries starting with uh, east asian countries and we will uh, step by step uh, expand to other regions so that they can provide capacity building opportunities in their countries in accordance with their needs local needs and context that is our commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed, we need more commitments, like what we have just heard from our distinguished panelists and, of course, our distinguished speakers, the ministers. It is our pleasure to have been joined now by the Republic of Finland and the representative, the State Secretary, Sumu Wori. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, who is stepping in for Her Excellency Lee Anderson, the Minister of Education, who can't be with us today, but she is surely with us in spirit. So over to you for your closing remarks. Thank you very much, Chair. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor actually to give these closing remarks in this session uh, on transformative education. And I wish to thank the Republic of Korea, Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, and UNESCO for co-organizing this very important event with Finland. And I have to say, this is my last session today, and I just came from uh, the, my previous session, which was about how teachers can influence the teaching and, le and learning and, and, and planning education systems. And it was very moving as we actually were discussing the global scale of how we can do this influencing, or how teachers can influence their work from Kakuma refugee camp to uh, welfare state like Finland. So there was a quite wide, of, wide spectrum of in which kind of t uh, conditions teachers are doing their work uh, in, in this contemporary day and age. So uh, this is, it was a perfect uh, event to co come to this one to, from. And um, uh, I'd like to maybe state that we are living in unprecedented times uh, with multiple global crises, uh, as we know. And our generation is being tested for its determination to make wise decision and, and capability to act. And, and with uh, the Transforming Education Summit, education and training is finally receiving the highest level of attention it deserves globally. Uh, we need to build a global movement for pushing uh, the SDG4 agenda forward. In the 2030 agenda, there is not a single goal without a requirement for knowledge, skills and competence. Uh, education and training as the foundation for science, technology and innovation underpins the entire 2030 agenda. Uh, and education must come first, uh, as we simply need skilled and competent people in all walks of life to build more sustainable and resilient societies. Education is so much more than a fundamental human right in itself. At the same time, uh, the world is witnessing the highest number of violent conflicts since 1945, and we have the highest refugee population on record. We see human rights tramp, uh, trampled, including the rights of women and girls, uh, which is a focus in our work also in Human Rights Council as a, as a member um, of this term, um, and, and also, of course, uh, those of minorities. Hate speech, mis- and disinformation are spreading, um, and due to the pandemic, uh, decades of progress is being wiped away before our eyes. Extreme poverty is on the rise, and the global food and energy security are severely impacted by the horrific way uh, by Russia against Ukraine. The climate crisis has not been called off, quite the contrary. Uh, let's face it, we have, to, uh, we have no alternative but to succeed in the transition to green economy. And that needs education as well. That is why the global learning crisis hinders the prosperity uh, of entire nations. Countries can only be uh, as strong as the human, human capital, if we use this kind of terms, and capital, when talking about humans. Human capital and um, learn, uh, cap cap capacity to, to influence the environment. 
Despite all of this, uh, Finland strongly believes in the power of the SDG4 to bring uh, us uh, on track. And education, training, research and innovation are critical in the comprehensive sustainability transition and for the development of inclusive and resilient societies. Educated minds are the best and more, most sustainable asset uh, any nation can have. And in one of the previous sessions I had today, I was reminding everyone that Finland has uh, not always been this uh, high technology, uh, high tech, uh, high education level society that we are today. But it, it's because we have uh, deliberately made um, a system that has put high value and investments in education and, and children. It is paying us back. So it's not just giving money away for something. It's it's actually the whole reason behind the, the kind of society we are today. The necessary uh, green and digital trans transitions we are talking about today are dramatically shaping the skills and competencies needed in life and work. The way we live, work and travel, as well as um, uh, produce and consume, must and they will change inevit inevitably, uh, whether we want it or not. New professions are emerging while others disappear. And all countries share the same challenge. Uh, uh, how do we ensure that everyone in society uh, acquires the skills for a sustainable future? From Nordic welfare societies to refugee camps, which uh, we were discussing in the last season. Dear friends, uh, lessons from Finland might be uh, summarized around three factors. First, broad-based competencies, uh, such as critical thinking and multiliteracy, are, are pivotal when solving global challenges. And in Finland, these are emphasized in cross-disciplinary manner uh, in our national curricula uh, at all levels of education. Since the capacity to always uh, learn new things will be the key, learning to learn is also one of the transversal competencies in Finland, starting with early years and early education. Secondly, teachers are the key pillar in quality education and transformative learning. They must be supported to try new pedagogical methods and responding to the wicked problems of our times, it actually requires phenomenon-based learning. Teachers need to collaborate broadly across disciplines, all, and schools must engage with the surrounding community. Learning environments extend beyond the classroom, and all this requires new competencies by teachers. In Finland, we have launched a project on sustainability education which invites the entire basic and upper secondary education to integrate sustainability into schools' operating culture. And thirdly, collaborative approach in educational policymaking. Uh, the key to ensuring that education is relevant and responsive, we must foster collaboration at all levels. It is important that we have sufficient mechanisms for consulting and engaging all stakeholders, and any successful reform requires commitment of relevant actors. Finally, uh, in Finland, we want to ensure that all citizens are equipped with future skills from all walks of life. We are investing heavily in continuous learning, science and innovation, uh, and aim at raising the educational level of society as a whole, as this is the key in boosting equity, well-being and green growth. All this supports our aims in Finland to achieve a carbon neutrality by 2035 and, and become the hopefully the first fossil-free welfare society. To conclude, it is very uh, important, it's pivotal that we continue sharing experiences globally. We need to strengthen our call for uh, improved capacities on transformative learning at all levels of education. And uh, UNESCO's revised recommendation on SDG 4.7 I, I will guide our joint effort. Thank you very much for giving me this chance to address you. Thanks a lot, State Secretary Sumovori. A pleasure to have you with us. It will be difficult to wrap up this session. A lot has been said, but still I'm going to try to draw up a couple of conclusions of what the panel contributed, what our high-level speakers contributed. I'm taking away some of the things, and I hope they will be summarized in a conclusion paper that, of course, will go to all of you and will manifest something like an appeal of at least the Ban Ki-moon Center to the outside world and hopefully of many of you too. What I'm taking with me is that indeed there was a call for a global movement that is bigger than what we witness right now for 4.7. There are many efforts, 
Mission 4.7, one of them, Bridge 47, another one of them. Of course, all of the efforts from Think Equal to the great work of UNESCO APCU to the great work in the nation states. Combined, these efforts are a movement, but we are not yet coordinated. And I think there is merit in getting even better coordination. Another conclusion is that yes, we do need to monitor. We do need to hold governments accountable. And here we have got, of course, bearers of the torch of governments who are doing incredible work and are really leading the way. But there are other governments that are interested and are not yet funded, and even those need to be supported. We heard about Gambia, we heard about the case of Kenya that is already in the best way possible involved in that. We need more. And Leslie, kudos to you and good luck for rolling your lifelong learning and particularly pre-school efforts out in more countries until 2030. Another conclusion that I take away is we need to strengthen the capacities to teach global citizenship education for from an early age to lifelong learning. And that's easier said than done because it's up to governments to provide the training but also to the informal sector to give this opportunity to teachers to educators and of course sometimes the material is lacking so we need to develop further material or even translate it into the local languages there is lots of work to be done there we do also have to make educational institutions laboratories for peaceful societies they need to be like a petri dish for peaceful societies it starts very early and indeed the kids of today will lead the future and hence Educational institutions need to be our petri dish. Se uh, thirdly, or even fourthly in the meantime, um, we have to tap into the engagement of youth and communities who are advancing the SDGs. We need to draw the attention to their incredible work and also involve them around the table. Youth, like uh, Linda being an example here, are doing a lot, often not recognized, often not heard, and often underfunded. And to do more in that regard is absolutely essential. And then one thing that I want to leave the audience with is also, we haven't spoken about it today a lot, but please put your efforts down to actively support the implementation of the revised UNESCO recommendations. They are concerning the Education for International Understanding, Cooperation and Peace Education and are relating to human rights and fundamental freedoms. And to actively support this revised recommendation will tie us together, hopefully even more so, in our undertakings in 4.7. What remains to be said is a big thank you to all of the co-organizers Finland, the Republic of Korea, and our friends from UNESCO, and to ask you for one last thing, because nothing in this world is actually now valuable if you don't have a good picture. So I'm asking you all to stand up with your sign of the SDGs, and if you don't have a sign of the SDGs in front of you, then stand up nevertheless, and someone will take a picture of us making our pledge for GCED in the future. <laughs>